Aloha, good afternoon, and welcome to the 17th Annual Glen Grant Memorial. Up until this point, we've always done a, a Glen Grant Memorial ghost tour. And because of the, uh, the situation that leaves all of us to be at home with one another and uh, practice social distancing and making uh, sure you have a mask on, we have opted to do 100 ghost stories in the tradition of Hyakumonogatari Kaidan Kai. And this was something that Glenn Grant talked about often on his tours and in his, his writings and uh, lectures. And so, here we go. Good luck to all of you. And uh, when we get to the very last ghost story, I know I, I asked some of you to uh, light your own candle. And when that last ghost story is finished, then we will all blow out that last candle all at once. Number one, a little boy remembered his father's sage advice while sitting in his classroom at Moanalua Elementary. Don't be afraid of monsters, his father always told him. They're not real. While remembering this advice from his father, nervously, the little boy sitting at his desk looks up across the classroom at his teacher for some sort of comfort, for her to look at him and he to see her, realizing that it was all fairy tales and not real. Monsters did not, did not exist. And so as he looked at her from across the classroom, she looking down at her work on her desk, looking through some papers. She looks up, looks around the classroom first and makes eye contact with the little boy. And at that moment, her eyes shift from human to reptilian and back. Story number two, first-hand account from a security guard who told me that he was assigned to an old asylum as part of his work. And his supervisor warned him that the doors to all the old cells opened by themselves. It was on an automatic timer and it would happen about two o'clock in the morning. As he was receiving his instructions from his supervisor, some static came over the cell phone. And he only got bits and pieces of what the supervisor was saying. And it sounded something like your relief for the next shift will come at two in the morning. But that security guard told me he misunderstood. What his supervisor was actually saying is they, they, them, those people, those patients will be released at two in the morning. Don't be there when that happens. I'm sorry, the security guard said that, who, who? There, there's nobody here, the place is empty. Two o'clock in the morning, they will be released. Don't be there when that happens. Security guard said, look at me, look at my physical condition, my state of mind. I didn't get all that information. By the time I understood what was going on, it was too late, much too late. By the way, that security guard was a ghost. Story number three is a personal story and it's a true story.
think about 2014 or the latter part of 2015. My phone rings at 1.30 in the morning. My wife isn't happy about getting a phone call at 1.30 in the morning. And she's using colorful expletives to ask me who the blankety blank is calling you at 1.30 in the morning. I wasn't happy about it too. And so I rolled over, grabbed the phone and looked at it. Then I rolled it over to my wife and showed her the phone. She was a bit bleary eyed and it took her a couple of seconds to focus. So I showed her the phone, she clearly saw that it was her phone that was calling me at 1.30 in the morning. She rolled over, looked at her phone, grabbed it, and then showed it to me. And as we both looked at her phone, we saw that it was off. Who was calling at 1.30 in the morning? From my wife's phone. That wasn't working. Story number four, my wife and I get calls to go to unusual places for strange and unique circumstances. And so we were called to a particular place that's well known in downtown Honolulu. And as you drive by it on Baratania during Chris Christmas, it's, it's very well decorated with lovely Christmas lights. You can't miss it. We were there in broad daylight. And we were shown several places on the property that everyone swears has intense spiritual activity. Finally, we were taken down to the basement. And at the bottom of the steps, the people who worked there stayed. They didn't follow us. I was on one end of the basement. My wife was on the other. And later on, she showed me an unusual photograph. What makes it unusual is that the picture is of her on her phone like this in the dark basement. And as you know, if you're on your phone like this in any dark room, the light from the screen illuminates your face, which is what her phone was doing to her in that photograph, illuminating her face. What was strange about that photograph is that while my wife was on her phone in the dark basement with the light illuminating her face, a picture was taken of her on her phone from across the basement, from her phone. Chew on that one. Story number five, I was fast asleep one night. My sports underwear waistband folded under my protruding belly. I felt my wife reach over and readjust it. And then she walked into our room, having just come from the kitchen. Who was that? Story number six, there was a, a Lao that was staying here back in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. 
And part of their stay was myself taking them on a ghost tour of Waianae. And of all places, they were staying at the Makaha Sheraton. And there was protocol, there were chants, and there were introductions. And there was also a, a clarification before the Waianae ghost tour started. For some reason, I started to talk about choking ghosts. Two of the girls in the halal were crying really bad, face red, everything. And I asked what was wrong. And the kumu had the girls who were crying tell me. They were sisters. The older girl said for as long as she can remember, she's always been pressed into her bed while she was sleeping, no matter where it was, stayovers, camp, you name it. But she would always feel the fingers coming up her chest like this, press her into the bed, and then the weight of something sitting on her chest, and the fingers slowly wrapping themselves around the back of her neck like this, and then the thumbs pressing down on her Adam's apple. It went on like that all the time. So a couple of nights before that why and I ghost her on the weekend, the same thing happened. The dark shadow materialized right through the door of their room, walked up to the foot of her bed, crawled into it, and just as it was about to choke her, she was worried for her sister who was sleeping in the same room, the bed right across from her. She worried, praying, hoping that the sister wouldn't wake up and witness this horrible thing. And as all of those thoughts were going through her head, the second shadow appeared, manifested right through the door of that hotel room. And she thought to herself, oh my God, now there's two of them that are going to choke me. Tonight, I'm probably going to die. But the sh second shadow didn't bother with her. It crawled into the bed with the younger sister and began to choke her. Now, is that because they were staying at the Makana Sheraton or because they had a history of being choked by ghosts? And by the fact that they were staying at the Makah Sheraton, did that amplify the experience? The only way to answer that question is to get someone to let you go into that abandoned hotel and let you stay in that room so you can find out for yourself. Story number seven. It was 1978. I was staying at the Waipahu West Apartments. It's um, that road where you take the left at Sunny's Ukulele and the place that used to be the old diners drive-in. It's very end of that road. You take that right turn. The West Waipahu Apartments are right there. 1978. I believe I was a sophomore in high school and it was summer. What's funny about this experience is my room was in the back of that old apartment facing out to the parking lot. Very late at night, I heard the sound of a ukulele plucking, someone playing, very melodic. And the voice that accompanied that ukulele was very sweet. And I honestly forget the Hawaiian song that was being sung. And so I walked out of my bedroom through our small living room, opened the front door, looked out the the screen door and in that large courtyard was a plumeria tree and seated beneath it was a Hawaiian woman about middle age. She wore an oversized mu'u'u, her hair was tied up in a bun and she had a natural smile and big, big beautiful eyes. And she sat there just strumming and singing. I'm not sure if she even knew that I was looking at her and then she was gone. I thought nothing of it. I thought maybe I was dreaming. But a couple of days later, the building manager 
showed up with a few guys who had some digging equipment and they uprooted that entire plumeria tree and the work was going on and it was loud and sort of distracting and I, I couldn't watch my daytime program because you know it was summer and then we hear screams and it's a funny thing when you hear a grown man scream out of fear it's a sound you never forget I never forgot it which is what made me jump out of bed run out the front door and look at the building manager and his workers just struck dumb with fear, literally holding on to one another. Within the roots of that plumeria tree, as they uprooted it and brought it out of the ground, were skeletal remains of a female. The old faded mu'umu was still on its bones and in its one hand clutching the neck of an ukulele. The funny thing about this story is the reason they were uprooting the plumeria tree is they were going to put up a, a huge jungle gym for the kids who lived in that complex to have somewhere to play. Did you know from 1978 to the following summer of 1979, every time kids played on that jungle gym, at least one of them got hurt, sprained ankle, fell off the top, broken arm, scratches, gouges, bruises. When I was thinking about this story, I went on Google Maps and I was surprised to find that the old Waipahu West apartments are still there. And it looks like that place has stood still in time. Nothing about it has changed. And I'm wondering if the ghost of that old Hawaiian woman is still there, playing her ukulele late at night in that courtyard. Story number nine is a true story. We were doing a ghost tour down in the old Paradise Park. And the meeting place was uh, one of the halal rooms, which they have. And what made it unusual was two things. I know for a fact, having walked uh, through that park during the day to figure out the route, that it's a very active place, spiritually. Many things there. Epa, Kupu Eu, Night Marchers, Mo'owahine, you name it, festooned with spirits. So much so that I bought a couple of boxes of black rubber gloves, the kind the tattooists use. And to everyone on the tour, I had them wear it. And my explanation was because of what's down there in that park, because of what still exists and because of what's still happening. I wanna take precautions. We're all humans, we all make mistakes and I don't want anyone to accidentally touch something with your bare flesh of your hands. I don't wanna take the chance that something will transfer itself onto you and attach itself. Literally sit on your shoulders. Everyone agreed. It was an interesting tour. And some interesting photographs came out of that tour. When we got back to the lobby, the owner was in a panic. She looked frazzled and shaken up. And she asked us, did all of you just get back? And I said, yeah, just now. And she said, are you sure? And I said, yeah. She was saying this in, in front of myself and the group. She said she was sitting in her office and happened to glance up at the camera facing down into the lobby. And she said on that camera, she saw all of us, every single one who went on the tour, including myself, standing there in the lobby. And she thought to herself, oh, that's unusual. It's only been 20, 30 minutes. Can the tour already be finished? She, and so she came out of her office, walked into the lobby, and it was empty. At that time, I and my group 
we're still down in the park. Who were those people? Story number eight, something was wrong with my reflection in the mirror. I've heard stories like this countless times. Stories about people looking into a mirror and seeing strange things happen behind their reflection or seeing their own reflection do something unexpected. Mirrors are supposed to be the window to the other world. What kind of world that is, we're not sure. But what we do know is that sometimes mirrors also show us the truth. And so a man who lives in a house in a neighborhood that's so badly haunted that I used to get calls about that place all the time. The man was shocked when I told him, where you live all the way up Malka leads to a place called Kaliwa, Sacred Falls, the home of Kamapua, which is probably why you're having all these activities, these strange things going on. But then I said, please, don't let me interrupt. Tell me your story. And he said, one night before he went to bed, he's standing in front of his mirror he's brushing his teeth and he says as he's brushing his teeth like this up and down he notices his reflection is brushing side to side and he stops and then starts to brush like this and the reflection is still brushing side to side he said instead of screaming bloody murder and becoming mortified with fear i became angry And he said he reached forward like this and flicked his reflection in the mirror and said, stop it. Stop it right now. And put his face right up against the mirror and said, stop it right now. He said his own reflection reached out and then slapped him across the face. Hand coming out of the mirror. Because after that, he decided to move out of the house and rent it out. Did you disclose to the people who rented your house uh, about what was going on, about your experiences? And he said, I know it's bad, but I haven't. I'm too afraid. the house, if you're asking yourself where it might be, is up Malka. Story number nine, you guys remember growing up, small kid time, and you remember your parents telling you, no touch, put that down, stop touching, leave it alone, oh, hard head you, you guys remember that? I remember going to the store, or sometimes even walking through a park, kneeling down, picking up a, a stick, some pebbles, even a blade of grass. My parents would freak out. No touch, leave that alone. Why? I always thought to myself, why no can touch? Why no can pick them up? Why no can play with them? Why no can wear them?
certain Hawaiian families are, are funny about lending out their own personal items. Hairbrush, toothbrush, shirt, shorts, slippers, most especially underwear. I'll share with you that I was homeless for a little while because of certain uh, personal financial circumstances. I was okay because I was still able to do tours and still be, um, what's the word, solvent. I remember having to go to the bathrooms at Alamona Beach Park to shower early in the morning. And I'd go early just to be the only one there because I didn't want to share the shower with anybody else. It got crowded if you went later. I remember one morning go going early, taking a shower. And I was already dry, dried off and dressed up and uh, walking out of the shower. And there were two other Hawaiian men, probably about my age or a little bit older. One was sitting down, hunched over, his friend standing over him and rubbing his back and saying, what's the matter? What's the matter, you okay or what? The guy sitting down on the bench was throwing up blood. It was a horrible stench and a frightening thing to, to see. His friend is saying, well, what happened, bro? You, you go eat something wrong? What, food poisoning, something, bro? You overdosing? And finally, when the guy was able to re, uh, regain his composure. He said, no, no, it's not that. Bro, you're not gonna believe. But ever since we go to kind, goodwill and we go take the clothes out of that, that bin. The only kind of clothes I'm gonna go take was, was on the well. The one I get on now. Bro, but ever since I went well, I'm sick all the time. Draw blood all the time, bro. I guess they were too involved in what was going on to notice me. But as they were talking, trying to figure this out, I got a good look at the homeless guy's underwear, the waistband. I couldn't see everything that was printed on it. But what I was able to see with the words, medical facility. I wonder who wore that pair of Palevati last. Check your pants. Think. Are the undergarments I'm wearing now, are they mine? Did I buy them you? Did I borrow? Living in Waipahu, I'm sorry, story number 10. Living in Waipahu during my early teenage years was a memorable time. Big fat mango on the tree, uh, something called star fruit, guava. A lot of that was so plentiful that as a kid, I never bothered walking up the store to um, Navarrete store to get candies or snacks because I had everything I needed in my yard. I was also doing karate at the time. So a lot of times I would practice in the backyard and my neighbor, Mr. Tanaka, a very old Japanese man who had been there from the beginning of the plantation era, possibly that's how old he looked, looked um, really enjoyed watching me practice karate. He got a kick out of it and we sort of became good friends. 
his English really wasn't that good. So every time we saw each other, he would have something for me to eat. Uh, a fruit that grow was grown in his own yard. It looked like a smaller guava, but it was like sort of like this and fuzzy. I guess it was some kind of Japanese peach, but it was, it was delicious. He was a great guy. Unfortunately, because Mr. Tanaka was in the extremities of old age, he passed away. And the only reason I found that out is because one morning I was out in the front yard watering my mother's roses, which she grew and sold. And a Japanese man in Mr. Tanaka's yard came up to the fence and he said, oh, can you let your parents know that uh, my dad died? I said, your dad? He said, yeah, yeah, Mr. Tanaka. I said, oh, no. What happened? His son said he was just old, lived a long time. And he went. And I actually, I felt bad for Mr. Tanaka because I was no longer going to have my friend. A short time after that, because my room, the window was facing Mr. Tanaka's house, I would wake up late at night because I would hear kids in his empty house running around, screaming, laughing. And I'd look out my window and look at Mr. Tanaka's house and it was dark. There were no lights. But every time I heard the sound and I'd look out the window, nothing, completely empty. A couple of days later, I see Mr. Tanaka's son and I asked him, um, are you guys living in the house now? He said, no, we're actually uh, trying to figure out how to sell it, why? I said, well, I always hear kids in the house, like running around and screaming and playing. Are those your kids? He said, no. I mean, I get kids, but that's not my kids. Nobody lived in his house since my father died. Oh, okay. He said, why? You seen kids inside a house? I said, well, at night, I hear kids running around and screaming and laughing. But I said, a couple of times during the day in Mr. Tanaka's garage, I see a small girl just standing inside. She kind of looked like, you know, shy. She didn't like talk. And the son said, well, sit over there, Mr. Tanaka's garage. Over there, like where? Like by the entrance? I said, yeah, kind of like in the corner on the inside. He said, oh. He said, go, go, go tell your parents that, um, you know, uh, you're going to come over. I, I'm going to show you something. So I asked my mom, because she was the only one that was home. And I walked around, went into the driveway. Mr. Tanaka's son took me into the garage. And we get into the entrance of the garage and in the garage are all Mr. Tanaka's tools and everything, his old car. Right as we get into the entrance of the garage, he points this way into the corner. He said, you see that? I said, oh, what is that one? One pot for a plant or something? It kind of looks like a drum. He said, no. He said, me, I'm a bad Japanese person. And I forget the Japanese name for it. He said, a lot of times in certain prefectures in Japan, when you get too many kids, too much mouths to feed, they do something called thinning. Thinning, what is that? It's when you get too much mouths to feed, you know more enough food. And rather than somebody starve, You get rid of one. I never heard of that practice being brought to Hawaii until what happened to my sister, my baby sister. She buried right over there in Akon. It's been so long, I forgot about her. Thanks, sir. Shortly after that, my family and I moved out. 
I haven't thought about that place for years until I was doing a Google search for the address, an old house, it's gone. It's a two-story something house now. But Mr. Tanaka's old house is still there. And I wonder if the family who lives in that house now has seen that little girl. It's 1925, it's South Kona. A young Japanese man has come across many stories from many people on Hawaii Island. And the stories happen to be all the same. They're all about Pele. They're intriguing, they're mystical. And he's wondering to himself if these Pele stories are an extension of American folklore, integrated and married into Hawaiian ghost stories in the islands. It's the early afternoon. As he's driving his old car through South Kona, on the side of a road, he sees an old Hawaiian woman in a long white dress, faded, and she's got a hat on her head. And he says, it sort of looks like a hat that the old flappers would wear. But how unusual for this weather in South Kona. And see, he pulls over to the side of the road and waits for her to walk up and says, Aloha, where are you going? And the old Hawaiian woman says, I'm heading to see my family in Kaua. Do you happen to be going that way? The young Japanese man says, oh, yes, of course. I can take you. Please jump in. He said nothing unusual happened. They had a lively conversation about life, how things used to be in the old days. And he was surprised that she knew so much detail about the time periods as to when the volcano would erupt. And he said, do you mind when we get to your destination, saying those things again so I can write them down. She said, of course, thank you for showing interest. A lot of young people don't care about these things. And he said, well, I do. And the old woman looked at him and says, really, please tell me what your work is. And he begins to tell her, well, when you think about it, I'm a collector of Pele stories. Oh, the woman says, very interesting. By the time that part of the conversation has taken place, the woman glances out the window and says, oh, we're already here. I'm so sorry. And he says, here? It's in the middle of nowhere. Where could your house be? She said, it's close. But I have a Pele story for and he says, really? She says, yes, a very quick one. And without saying another word, that young Japanese man claims that old Hawaiian woman took off her hat, smiled at him. Now she turned around to open the door to the car and was getting out. She began to slowly fade into the sunlight. It's the first story I've ever heard of someone giving Pele a ride and having Pele tell them or show them her own story. I think after I'm long gone, I might do that too.
1946, there is an alleged story about Pele visiting the island of Kauai at an old place called the Ko'olam store. The owner claims that an old Hawaiian woman walked into the store, just looked around, and then seemed to disappear. Another story surfaces that a man is driving a car, same year, 1946, toward the Ko'olam store and picks up a Hawaiian woman who's dressed in the clothing that everybody wears during that time period. The conversation is innocuous, just innocuous, sorry. Just small talk and everyday matter. And then as they're getting closer to the store, the subject of Pele comes up and the woman says, I know these stories and begins to tell the driver detailed accounts of Pele's life and her travels and says, a lot of people don't realize that Pele's story, although it may begin in Kahiki, its real beginnings happen when she comes to Hawaii. The first place she lands is in Kauai. Oh, I didn't know that, the driver said. She says, yes, it's absolutely true. And by that point, they're pulling up to the old Kolau store. The Hawaiian woman says, thank you so much for the ride. And as she's getting out of the vehicle, the driver says, wait, wait, wait. Are you some sort of college professor or, or, or something like that? It's unheard of that a Hawaiian person has so much detailed knowledge and speaks of it so articulately. Who are you? And the woman says, I am Pele. Watch for me. I will return. You'll know it's me. That same year, a tidal wave happens. The water's flowing up to Wainiha. Why is Wainiha so important in this story? Because on the island of Kauai, it's the first place where Pele landed. A lot of people ask. So there's all these Pele stories about her asking for a ride, uh, appearing to someone, saving their life, or even doing dastardly and horrible things to people who, who don't listen to her and, and make her upset. But they ask, in all these Pele stories, it could all be hearsay. The person could be making it up and could be such a convincing liar that they make it believable. Has Pele ever left any physical evidence of herself before departing human company. I forget at Windward Mall, if there was a Liberty House or a Penny's or something, but the story was told to me in late 1999. One of the managers Worked in town, but he actually lived on the windward side. And he says one night, he's going back to Kaneohe, but he's taking the polytunnel way. And as he's approaching the polytunnel, it's no traffic clear. It's unusual. And it's starting to rain heavily on the side of the road as he's nearing the, uh, the lookout, the turnoff for the lookout. It's an old Hawaiian woman, a white mu'umu with the, uh, the frills around her shoulder and embossed white, white flowers all over. She's barefoot. She's soaking wet. He pulls over, gets out of the car and says, oh my God, you're soaking wet. Come on, I'll give you a ride. And he says he physically touched that woman on the shoulders because she was old, helped her get into the car, put on her seatbelt, 
got into the car and says, oh my God, you're so soaking wet. Where's your family? Why are you walking? She said, it's an emergency. I have to get to Kailua. Are you able to take me? He says, oh yes, yes, absolutely. You just tell me where in Kailua and I will take you. Oh, what kind of children is that? Leave their mom out like this. She says, it's okay, I'll be fine. He says, they finally get to Kailua. And he says, he knows all of Kailua, but they end up taking a, a long path to a cul-de-sac that he's never seen before. When they get to the end of the cul-de-sac, it's just open lot, no houses. And she says, here is fine. Let me off right here. He says, mama, are you sure? Is there somewhere else you want me to take you? Uh, you have other family in Kailua? She says, no, I'll be fine. He said, as the woman got out of the car, opened her door, got out on her own, she lifted the hem of her mu'u so her body could turn toward the door to get out. He said, when she did that, there were no legs. She had no legs, no feet. And she hiked up the mu'u like this and she got out. He freaked out and drove home. When he finally got home, pulled into the garage and sat there and just trying to debrief or just absorb everything that just happened, he glances over to the passenger side seat and there are strands of volcanic glass, strands of thin volcanic glass on the seat where the old wine woman sat. We know it as Pele's hair. Are we ready for our guest? Okay. So at this point, we're going to um, invite our first guest storyteller. And we're sending him an email right now. Sorry about that. And I want to make sure that I get his email correct. This gentleman is coming to us. All the way from New York City. He is. A Hawaii resident living in New York. And just sent out the email. Waiting for our friend Spencer to respond. Um, how are we all doing so far? Are we having fun? Is this making any sense to you? Right, and here we have Spencer Moon. Spencer. Hello. How are you, sir? Good, how are you? Great. Are you uh, ready to lay that story on us? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. All right. So yeah, what, what what number are we on? We are on. So your story number fourteen. Oh okay. I want to do it like like you. That's why. Story okay. number fourteen. Story number fourteen. 
<clears throat> Miss you, by the way. Miss you too. All right. Evil spirits, dark entities, maleficence, de demons, demonic possessions, every religion, every culture has their name for it. And every person decides whether they believe them or not. I'd like to take you back to my first encounter with an evil spirit. When I was nine years old, I grew up in the Christian church and the Christian church, we, they call it demons. So when a person has a demon within them, they call it a demonic possession. At nine years old, I was attending one of the worship services and it was an ordinary worship service, um, more catered towards youth or teenagers intermediate and high school age kids. And I remember in the middle of the service, I saw this 15 year old girl. She had her hands in front of her face like this. And she was rocking back and forth like this. And at first I was thinking that this was just normal. This was her way of being involved in the service until all of a sudden she fell to her knees. And as sh her knees hit the ground, I remember hearing a screeching yell. The yell was so loud and so powerful that nearly every single head in that room turned and a circle began to form around her. It was at that moment that the hairs on my arms and legs were standing up. Literally, I had chicken skin. And I remember that she continued to let out more and more of these yells. And they turned from being the yells of a 15 year old girl to basically evolving into a darker, more growly, gravelly type of sound. And eventually she went from being on her knees to laying flat on her back and she was convulsing. It, it almost seemed like she was having seizures or you know, some type of weird convulsions. And at nine years old, I really didn't understand or know what was happening. I, I had never seen The Exorcist or, you know, really any horror films at that age. And as she was convulsing, there were moments where literally her head and her feet were the only thing touching the ground and her body was arched like that. Her eyes were rolled back in her head and all you could see were the whites of her eyes and her face began turning more and more red. And I remember very distinctly that around her, there was 10 to 15 foldable chairs and as soon as one of the pastors arrived and got down and started praying for her, these chairs literally moved simultaneously about six feet away. And I remember hearing the chairs scraping against the cafeteria floor. <sighs> Not a single person was touching these chairs. Everyone was further back. It was still, the worship service was still going on and they weren't really stopping, but there was definitely something happening. The moment that these chairs moved, I just, I knew that this was real. I knew that whatever was happening was beyond the explanation of, of the physical realm. I felt it within me that it was dark, that it was evil. And that whatever was in this little girl just had so much power that it was able to cross over from the spiritual world to the physical world and actually move things. And as she continued screaming, it began transforming into more of a, more of a murmur 
she was saying something in, in a weird language or tongue and, and, you know, she was saying it really softly and, and then it became more angry and more direct and more forceful. And I didn't understand it. I don't think anyone really understood it, but it, it just seemed like her whole body was transforming and the sounds that were coming out of her made absolutely no sense. They didn't sound like the same 15 year old girl. And I remember that while her body was arched, all of a sudden she went flat on the ground. And then in a matter of seconds, she was about five feet off of the ground. Her body was literally levitating, nothing underneath her, no one holding her or touching her. She was literally levitating. Now people can believe what they want to believe. All that I can really believe is what I've experienced and seen. And everyone that was in that room that had, was seeing and watching what was happening, you could tell that this was an experience that they had never had before. It was an experience that I'd never witnessed or witnessed since, but she was literally levitating off of the ground. And it lasted for about three to four minutes until the pastor grabbed her hand and was holding her hand. And as soon as the pastor grabbed her hand, all of a sudden, she hit the floor. And it was a dud. It was a dull dud sound, almost like her head had hit the ground or, or, or something. And that sound just reverberated. It reverberated through the room. And even now I can remember what that sounded like. It literally took four to five adults to continue to hold her down in order to prevent her from hurting herself or other people. And I remember the pastor asking the same things over and over again. The pastor, the pastor would literally say, who are you? What is your name? Who are you? What is your name? That's all she would ask. You see, in the Christian church, unlike the Catholic church, which has its protocols and the steps that they follow, in the Christian church, the belief is that the pastor is literally the guide for the person to fight these demons. The pastor doesn't really have much power, but the person does. The person who is demonically possessed has the power to decide whether he or she wants to eradicate these demons that are within them. And the pastor literally ushers this person by helping to find who these spirits are and call them out by name in order to exercise them from being within. And the pastor just continued asking, who are you? What is your name? Who are you? What is your name? And I remember her turn her head towards the pastor and her eyes were still rolled back, but they flipped over to being just her pupils, fully dilated pupils. And she responded or it responded. She does not want us to leave. And it said it three times. And after each time it had a dark sinister laugh she does not want us to leave. <laughs> she does not want us to leave. And it said it, I remember three specific times. They eventually were able to get her to her feet and corralled her out of the room away from the mass group of people. And I honestly never saw her again. What I was told was, that it took three to four more sessions of exorcisms of, of story or of, um, of prayer sessions in order to fully eradicate what was within. And it was said that there were 17 spirits living within her. In the Christian belief system, it is said that once you open up the doorway it's like a floodgate and it allows the legions to enter. Several months prior to this service, 
this girl and a group of her friends began dabbling in the occult world. And they first started with the Ouija board and, you know, trying to usher in the spirits of the past and get answers. And they started doing seances after that with candles and, you know, trying to ask the beyond to return. And then they started doing curses and spells towards several of their teachers or friends. And we don't know what happened, but we do know that with this 15 year old girl, a doorway was opened. And that doorway led in up to 17 spirits. So it really makes you think in your own life, what are you doing? Is your hate, your anger, opening up doorways? And are those doorways that you're opening up allowing things that don't belong in? Spencer Moon, oh, everybody. Thank you. Some story number 14. Hello. Spencer is one of the founding members of the Grant Society, so we're fortunate to have him here. Love you. Love you too. Aloha. Hello. I've heard that story from Spencer a few times and Every time he tells it, whew, yeah. I need to uh, take a second after that story. Oh. You guys are wondering where that, uh, that church is that Spencer's talking about. Um, it no longer exists, but, well, you know, I'll let Spencer tell you guys where the church was. It's, uh, it'll make more of an impact if he tells you. Story number 15. At the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, I did uh, a ghost walk on the property uh, 2000, 2010, about 10 years ago. And it was pretty uh, successful. It was mainly for the guests in the hotel and it was nothing too too scary. First night I did that tour at the uh, Royal Juan Hotel, it went well. The tour was over. I was walking through the big courtyard to uh, go to my car. And I remember three old Filipino ladies, they're housekeepers. They chased after me, grabbed me by the arm and said, we have to show you something. So they take me across the big courtyard to the banyan tree. And then they tell me their story. And they say what they do collectively is they help young Filipinos from the Philippines to come to Hawaii, uh, help to get them hired at the hotel. So they can work, make money, and you know, be able to bring over the rest of the family. And they said there was a young Filipino girl that they brought over and helped out and got her hired at that hotel. And the first thing they told her is that we don't steal from our customers. And whatever tips we get, we split it at the end of the shift. And so the girl was, was affable and she worked well, except one month at the newer part of the uh, property, a young Hawaiian man checked in and they said he came in his slacks, his blue button down shirt, nice shoes. And all he had was his wallet and his car keys, no suitcase. And he booked himself for a week and he put up the don't disturb sign. What no one knew is that while he was there, he'd actually committed suicide. He jumped and they didn't find the body right away because according to what I was told, the body fell between the hedges and the railing and some um, newspaper machines that sell all the, uh, the tourist magazines. Nobody knew that. But while that had happened, after the young Hawaiian man jumped, 
young Filipino girl walks into the room and starts to clean it. And as she's cleaning, she notices on the end table is a wallet fat with money. And she looks around, make sure nobody's in the other bathroom or anything like that, and walks over to the wallet and takes out a $50 bill. Not realizing that the young Hawaiian man had committed suicide. A couple of months later, she's back cleaning the same room. It's about two o'clock, but she's cleaning the room, vacuuming into the closet. Then she reverses, vacuums, and something catches the corner of her eye and standing just inside the door to the lanai is the ghost of the young Hawaiian man who says to her, I want my money back. She completely freaks out, loses her mind. She's practically hysterical. After that, three old Hawaiian, uh, old Filipino ladies tell me, the ghost of that young Hawaiian man followed that young Filipino girl everywhere. Appeared to her on the bus to and from work, uh, to her design club meetings, to her house. And that the appearances got so bad, the manifestations were so frequent that she stopped coming to work and she hid herself in her bedroom because at that point, the ghost of the young Hawaiian man had manifested outside the bedroom of this young Filipino girl in the hallway. And so she called an abulario, sort of like a Filipino kahuna, witch doctor. The abulario came, but the abulario let the young Filipino girl know that when I'm at your door, I will knock three times. There will be a pause and, that, and then I will knock a fourth time. And so that happens. Three knocks, pause, one more. Young Filipino girl cautiously opens the door like this. The abulario walks in and says to the young Filipino girl, now tell me in detail what happened, why this man's ghost is outside your bedroom. And she said, I stole money from his wallet, but I didn't think anybody was going to notice because nobody was in the room. But I didn't know that at the same time, he already killed himself. He, he jumped off the lanai. And the abulario said, hmm, it's not so much about the money. It's about the wallet. You see, the wallet is part of him. He touched the wallet with his hand all the time. It's inside his pocket, his skin. So the wallet is part of who he is. Unless that is taken care of, because he killed himself, he's stuck. He cannot go to where he's supposed to go. So the young Filipino girl says, well, what am I supposed to do? And the abulario says, here is $50. Go outside your room. The young man's ghost is in the hallway. Apologize. Give him back his $50. You'll be okay. The young Filipino girl leaves the room, goes outside into the hallway. The abulario hears her scream bloody murder, peeks outside just in time to see the young Filipino girl run down the hallway. Then she runs out the front door to the end of the cul-de-sac, jumps over the fence, runs down the embankment into the middle of the freeway and stands there with her arms open until she is run over by a truck and killed. Three old Filipino ladies say, the abulario realized she made a mistake. It was about the money. The ghost of that young Hawaiian man possessed her body long enough to make her kill herself.
Story number 16 happens in 1997. I'm with the uh, traveling group of actors. We're doing a show on Kauai. We checked into a place called Plantation Hale. We get there about 11 o'clock, but fortunately, all of our rooms are ready. And so we're taken to our, our separate spaces on the property. And and I, I get to the room with myself and the musician. The musician decides that he's going to go out and find something to eat. I'm a bit tired, so I stay back in my room. And you know, as your body is slowly starting to relax and sleep is slowly starting to come over you, and you suddenly awake because you get this right in front of you. Well, that's what happened to me. I fell asleep on the couch in the living room of that condo. The curtains were open. The lights were coming in from the day. And then this. I wake up and standing at the foot of the couch is a Hawaiian warrior wearing a malo. His body is oiled down. He has no hair. His eyes are fierce, and there's a horrible scowl on his face. I sit up like this, and then he's gone. It's so startling. I actually jump up out of the couch, jump off, off the couch, and just peel out the front door and nearly run over the old Filipino lady housekeeper, the porter, with her, her, uh, her wagon. And I apologize, like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry, Nana, I'm sorry, you okay? And she says, yeah, yeah. She goes, oh, what's the matter? You look scared, something happened. And I said, oh, I said, is, is something wrong with this room? And she said, why? And I said, I was falling asleep on the couch. And then I woke up and there's this Hawaiian warrior like standing right, right at the foot of my couch. And she looks at me and she looks at the, the room number and she looks at me, she goes, I don't know why they put you inside this one. It plenty goes inside. I go talk to him. Maybe you can switch room. We ended up not being able to switch rooms. We had to stay there for the weekend. Instead of sleeping on the couch, I took the room and locked the door and left the guitar player outside. Story number 17. Story goes that a young man is new to Hawaii and he likes to go hiking. He's an avid hiker. And that he's heard so many, so many stories about a hiking trail at a place called the Pali Lookout. And so one early morning, that's where he goes. He gets to that hike, slowly making his way up. And as he's finally clear enough to start walking up like this, and mind you, he's laden down with all this hiking stuff. So a beautiful young Hawaiian girl is coming down the trail toward him. He remembers her wearing some sort of tank top with a Daisy Duke shorts, barefoot. He was kind of worried for her being barefoot because of the terrain, but she was sure of herself, confident. She looked at him, he looked at her, she smiled, he smiled back. The second she walked past him from behind him, he heard, hi, Stephen. And he turned around and said, hi. Then suddenly he stops and says, oh, hey, wait. And she turns around and says, yes. He says, do I know you from somewhere? She says, of course, of course you know me. He says, really, where? Have you already forgotten? Um, Embarrassed, he says, I'm, I'm sorry. Is it in a general math class? Yes, 
exactly. And she says, Stephen, listen, there's something up there that I, I found that I thought was interesting. Um, do you want to come with me and go see it? He says, uh, okay, but he's hesitant. She says, don't worry, it's fine. She says, Bes besides, I like you. You're very handsome. And he follows her. And for some reason, he can't keep up with her. She's walking at a fast pace with bare feet. And finally, he says, hey, slow down. What's the big rush? She said, come on, Stephen. We're almost there. Hurry up. He says, oh, okay, but just slow down. I can't keep up. She says, yes, you can. You're so young and you're so full of life. You can keep up. Come on, hurry. And he says, no, no, I really can't. She says, no, come on, hurry up. He says, all right, but just slow down. And finally, she stops, turns around and looks at him and says, okay, Stephen, we're here. Come on, just a little bit further. Don't you want to kiss me? Hurry up. He says, all right, all right. And as he's now on even ground, walking faster toward her, he says, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, appears the ghost of his long dead aunt who says, Stephen, stop. And he stops, he says, oh my God. Auntie, what are you doing here? She says, for the love of, love of God, Stephen, stop where you are, stop, don't move. And he's still, perfectly still. And she says, look down, Stephen, look down. When he looks down, he says he's standing at the edge of a cliff possibly with an 800 foot drop into the valley below. He says standing not less than five feet in front of him is the girl floating in the air. <laughs> the girl says, <laughs> and she fades into nothing. Just a warning to you, young virile men from the continent coming to the islands in search of the beautiful island girl. They're not all nice. In fact, some of them are hungry for your soul. Number 18. In Hilo, in a place called Wainaku, just outside of Hilo, there are so many stories that could possibly fill a collection of more than a hundred ghost stories. People have often asked, has Pele ever been seen in Hilo? Being, you know, that it's come up on the side of the island. The only thing I can tell you, the place called, well, let me put it to you this way. We go to Hilo every year to tell ghost stories, to do a ghost storytelling concert at the Kilauea Theater, KMC. And so one year, my friend Mariner told me a story about a guy who worked at a Japanese restaurant, a local Japanese restaurant in Hilo, who had an interesting story. And we got to talk to him. His story was that when he was a boy, or younger, there is a sort of a place like diners, not a restaurant, but a place where you go to get food, sit down and eat. And he says he remembers working there and periodically the owner's wife would have a plate of food and call him over and give it to him. And then he would say, go take it to that lady over there, Pele. 
And he thought nothing of it because there's many people um, on the Big Island, many, many women who are named Pele, uh, Hiiaka, Hopoi, you know, Kapo, um, Kamohoali, you know, all the Pele family names, people in and around the Big Island are named after those deities. And so he thought nothing of it. And it went on for a while. The owner's wife would give him the plate of food and say, go give this to Pele, she's sitting over there. Always went to give the woman food. And so finally, he went and asked the owner, the woman, so who's this lady we were giving the food to? Oh, that's just what, somebody whose name is Pele. And the owner said, no, that is Pele. She comes here all the time. We make sure we give her food. And jokingly, he said, oh, so, but, you know, what if you tell me to go give her the food and then I turn around and go over there or I give her the food and I turn around and look back and she knows stay. The woman said, that's fine. That's Pele. And then he asked, why? If that's Pele, why, why you give her food all the time? And she gave him a tour of the facility and showed him an old lava flow. She said, when the volcano was erupting and was coming through here, we left out food for Pele. And then he was shocked at what he saw because the old flow came down alongside the restaurant and then it went back up and went around the restaurant and came down the other side. So the next time the owner's wife gave him the food and told him to give it to the old wine lady sitting over there named Pele, he went without question, laid the food in front of him. And he said, for some reason, I can't remember what she was wearing. I don't even remember what she went look like or what kind of hair she had. All I know is I put down the food in front of her. She kind of went look up and she nodded. And then all I did was, was step away, turn around and look, gone. She's gone. Sorry. Story number 19. A guy from Oahu, around the time the eruptions uh, began again up at uh, Leilani Estates, said he was up there for the day just, just to see what the lava caused. For some reason, I can't say the word devastation. I keep thinking about renewal. So he went up to that area, you know, was looking around, uh, saw where the lava had inundated many homes. Then he got to the end of Leilani Estates where the bigger part of the lava flow had taken everything. And it was in, in the middle of the day and it was a sight to see. He said as he was driving up that road to leave Leilani Estates, he said, a park ranger, the kind you see at Volcanoes National Park in the uniform was waving like this on the side of the road and he stopped and he rolled down the window and she came around and she said, sir, I'm sorry I had to stop you. He said, oh, I'm sorry, was I not supposed to be here? You know, if not, I'll go, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. If you're gonna give me a fine, that's, that's okay too. He, he said, I didn't know. And she said, no, 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 sir. I stopped you because your cell phone is, is on top of your car, the, the roof of your car. He said, oh, oh, oh my gosh. And she said, anyway, have a nice day. He said, oh, thank you, aloha. And he noticed that her name tag on her uniform said, oh, hello. So he said, oh, mahalo, oh, hello. She says, you're welcome. And as she walked up around the corner and disappeared, he got out of his car and looked on the hood of his car like this for his cell phone, there was no cell phone. And then he heard his cell phone ringing 
in his pants pocket. He looks in the pocket, pulls it out. There's a cell phone. He said within seconds after that, he heard this loud moaning, crashing sound. Looked down the road and this tree that was uh, burnt out by the lava just shoo, poof, fell, crashed right in the spot where he was parked. Not less than a few seconds previous. And he thought to himself, wow. That's unreal. That's supposed to be me. He spent the next day or two driving up in and around Volcanoes National Park, asking all of the park rangers for the employee, the Hawaiian woman, who looked about late 30s, early 40s. Pleasant smile, intense eyes. Her name was Oh, hello. No one knew who she was. Had never heard of her before. And so he was disappointed because he wanted to find her and, and thank her because he thinks she saved his life. As he was leaving Volcanoes National Park, he stopped at that general store at KMC. And he figured he'd get himself a couple of drinks for the long drive back to Hilo because he was staying up in Manilua, some snacks. As he went up to the counter to pay for his purchase, the cashier said, sir, I don't mean to be Niele or Mahale, but are you okay? He says, yeah, just disappointed. But why? What happened? Because whatever it is, it, it looks like it's weighing heavy on you. He says, oh, well, you know, the other day I was at Leilani Estates and um, I got in my car and this uh, park ranger was waving at me and then she came and told me my cell phone was on the roof of my car. I got out of the car, my cell phone was stay. Turns out it's in my pocket. And so I think that park ranger saved my life because right after I left this tree fell on the road. I was supposed to be under that tree, probably killed. But I went to Volcanoes National Park and I was asking them around for, you know, this, this lady, this park ranger, but nobody saw her. The cashier said, sir, can I ask you the name of that park ranger? Oh yeah, her name tag said, oh hello. You know, hello, okina, nakahako, over the old. Cashier said, what was she doing at Leilani Estates? Yeah, see, that's the thing. Every park ranger I met at Volcanoes National Park I asked them if Leilani Estates was part of a park and they said no. And the cashier said, so if that's the case, what would a park ranger be doing all the way at Leilani Estates in full uniform if that's not part of their jurisdiction, so to say? And the man thought, and thought to himself, oh huh. yeah. He thanked the cashier, paid his money, got in his car. And as he drove past the gate leading into the Volcano National Park, heading out to the main highway, to take the long drive back to Hilo, he stepped on his brakes. <coughs> and this thought hit him. Oh, hello. My tutor used to say that. Oh. Oh, hello, berries up at the volcano belong to Pele. And when you eat the oh, hello, you, you offer one to Pele and then one to yourself. Was that Pele? The professor who lived in Makaha had a habit of staying up late at night, sometimes until dawn, working on papers, dissertations, 
his own novel that he's been writing for years. But one night, the ideas were not coming, the stories were not being divinely inspired. And so he took some water, called a spam musubi, a backpack and a big flashlight. And he says, he started to walk. Oh, where? Like 7-Eleven, something like that? He said, no. I started to walk, you know, toward Kealaula side. And I said, that's kind of dangerous. He said, yeah, you know, but late at night, nobody bother. And besides, you know, I have my flashlight. And I said, okay. He said, yeah, you know, there are probably some homeless guys on the side of the road and whatever, but, you know, they're regular people too. They just don't have a house. And not all of them are out to rob you and crackheads, but it was a nice long walk and it gave me time to think, you know, just relax. And the moon was out. He said he finally got to Kaniana Cave. He thought to himself, maybe I should go sit in there. And he went into the cave, found himself a flat rock on the right side of the cave as you're going in, and sat and opened up his laptop and realized no Wi Fi. And so he closed his laptop and just sat there and relaxed. Then he heard the gravel crumbling under someone's shoes. He turned on his flashlight and not more than 10 feet in front of him is an older Hawaiian man, he said, dressed in nice slacks, shiny shoes, a brownish kind of shirt, long sleeve button down. Hair slicked back, he could smell the pomade on him. The guy says, oh, boy, you startled me. I didn't even see you come in. And all the old Hawaiian man would say to him was, they're mine. You cannot have them. They're mine. They're all mine. You go away. You don't belong in this place. They belong to me. You go. The man disappears. In his place, manifest children. The oldest, 12 years old. The youngest, about five or six. All boys. The similarity with all of them is that they have black eyes where they've been punched. Broken noses, some. Others split lip. Some of their shoulders look like they've been separated from the torso. Dried blood on some of their clothes. Slowly dissipate. Slowly fade into nothing. Man said he didn't have to be told twice, turned on his flashlight and took off, ran all the way back to his home in Macau. He said, you think I would have learned my lesson, but the next day, grabbed my backpack, <laughs> water, some snacks, went back to the cave early in the morning, right after sunrise, when it's still quiet. I said, you're crazy. You just had a ghostly experience the night before and you're going back there the next morning. He said, yeah, you know, don't ask me. I don't know. I was just being motivated, moved by some unseen hand, but I went. Oh, I said, so what then? He said, sitting there, just thinking, I just needed time to think. I have my head down, looking at the ground, and all of a sudden I hear, whoa, man, I didn't think I was going to make it out of there. And he said he looks up, and you know, that part of the cave, he says, when you go in and, you know, the left side, there's that big flat rock. He said, this Howley guy comes walking out, and he's got this, uh, this oxygen dive tank that he's carrying, and some, uh, what do you call those things? Swim fins and a goggle, and he's got these uh, khaki shorts. And so he's got on some, some kind of tennis shoe looking thing. 
and he's all sweaty, um, but he's all jovial for some reason. But he's saying, oh man, I didn't think I was gonna make it out of there alive. They asked the guy, he says, where did you come from? He goes, oh, I'm sorry to disturb you. Oh, what the Navy, see, we're doing a survey. They wanted to find all these artesian wells and lava tubes around you know, Oahu and find out where they went, uh, where they started, where they came out. He said, do you believe that I started on the other side of the island in the Kotola? And he said, man, at some point it got really claustrophobic, but I had to go to a class to learn how to de uh, breathe deeply in case I had, you know, a panic attack coming on. He goes, man, under there when it's pitch black, even though you got a tiny flashlight on, it's so claustrophobic, you, you, start, to, you start to lose your mind. He said, so I had to learn how to breathe. Other times I come into big caverns and you wouldn't believe the stuff that's down there. Oh, man, I am glad to be alive. I don't know how many days I was under there. I'm gonna go home, take a shower, uh, get some sleep and then report in for duty, uh, hand in my report. Wow, the Navy's doing that? He said, yeah. I'm not supposed to say anything, but right now I'm kind of loopy, so I don't care who I talk to. And he said, as the guy turns around, leaving the cave, carrying the dive tank, the fins, wearing strange looking tennis shoes, only the khaki shorts on, his hair matted with sweat, right in the very back of his skull, a big gaping wound with blood thick blood trickling down. This guy says, even before you can get up and say, hey, the back of your head, the second guy leaves the cave and the sunlight touches him. He's gone. By the way, that talk about the Navy exploring underground lava tubes, that didn't happen recently. That happened around World War II and further back. <clears throat> Story number 21. was the early 2000s. I dropped off my daughter and her mom at our old apartment on Lyle Street and went to park the old Volvo on Date Street, specifically the golf course directly across from the bus stop beyond that is the field at Kaimuki High School. That's where I stopped. We had some kind of party we went to, I forget. All I know is it took place at Chuck E. Cheese. I got out of the car and stood up like this and across the roof of my car, standing on the passenger side on the sidewalk, is old Hawaiian woman, short white hair, wearing a black turtleneck sweater, the Catholic schoolgirl skirt, and the knee-high white mod boots, and the thick black belt. And I thought to myself, this person is crazy, dressed like that. And this is all within seconds. And then she says to me, I want to go to Zippy's. I said, oh, well, you know, I was thinking about going Jack in a Box, so I can drop you off over there at a couple of the Zippies to do. She said, no, I don't want to go to that one. I said, oh, well, which Zippies are you going to? She said, the one in Wahiawa. I said, mm, I'm not going that way, Tutu. She says, but I'm hungry. And I sort of glanced down on my, my back seat, and I see that my daughter has left her box of Chuck E. Cheese pizza. I said to the, uh, the old Hawaiian woman, oh, well, Tutu, my, I have pizza over here. You want it? She said, okay. And I reached down into the back seat, grabbed the pizza, stood up and went like this to offer it to her across the roof of my car for her to take. She's gone. In that second behind me, I hear, <laughs> this car just whizzes right past me. It's going so far, the jet stream kind of pushes my body. It blows the traffic light at the intersection of Olokele and Date, and it gets T-boned by another car coming up Olokele. It's total. That was supposed to be me in my car. If that woman was Pele, 
She appeared long enough to save me time. And so when you see the old Hawaiian woman walking on the side of the road, no matter what happens, offer her the ride. Because it may not be so much about the ride, but more about buying you time to live. Story number 20, 22. And I want to tell this correctly because it's my youngest son's story. On Kauai, he had a really hard time taking a, a shower with the bathroom door closed. He always left it open. Even when company was over, he would leave the bathroom door open. And it was kind of strange. And so when he was asked by his mom why he leaves the bathroom door open, he says, you know how when I'm taking a shower and my brothers like to come in and make any kind to him? Yes. When I was taking a shower, I saw a shadow coming up to the curtain. And I thought it was one of the boys. So I ripped the curtain open like this and like, you know, I'm like, ah! And there's nobody in the bathroom. Now you're thinking to yourself, this is just another haunted bathroom story, but it's more than that. Because from what I understand, a lot of times when the towels would fall off the shelves, they would fall in slow motion. This is a place on Kauai where you should not only find, but if you can arrange it, you should live there. Story number 23. So back in the early 2000s, um, <clears throat> It was sponsored by uh, a business called 808 Communications. And that's when I first developed the ghost tour out to Wailua. And I, I forget what I called it back then. And so there's a, a famous story of a, a bride and a priest who are late to uh, the bride's wedding at the St. Michael's Church and they're speeding and the priest is, is driving and they take one of those hairpin turns out in Wailua, you know the ones. Uh, too fast. It hits this. The it hits a tree. The bride and the priest is is killed in that accident. And so that's one of the stories that I was going to tell. And we arranged it with the owner that the son's girlfriend was going to dress in a white wedding gown. And so we did several dry runs of that tour to get the timing done. And the way it was going to happen is uh, we would come down the road. I would start to tell the story about the ghost of the bride and the priest. And we would time it so that as we came around that corner, I would turn off all the interior lights in the bus. And then I would say, and there they are. And the people would look outside the bus window and see the ghost of the priest and the bride on the side of the road. And they all scream bloody murder. And that's just the way it happened. That tour is going on. We're going to all the hot spots. People are worked up. They're scared out of their minds. Uh, even when we take a break at the Tamoras in Wahiawa, they're all scared to go in and ask to use the bathroom because there's probably a ghost in Tamoras too. And uh, we're finally heading out that way. And I start telling the story about the bride who's late for her wedding. And the priest is driving his car and they're speeding out that way. The wedding is at St. Michael's Church. As they take that sharp corner, the priest loses control of the car drives headfirst into an old ironwood tree. The car is demolished and the bride and the priest are mangled. The interior lights and the bus are off. We round that corner and there they are standing right there. There's no priest. The kid who was supposed to play the priest wasn't there, but the bride was there. I thought it was cool the way she took uh, all the red ink, she, you know, uh, liberal amounts of red nail polish and ink all over. And the second 
everybody in the bus saw the bride all bloody. They just lost their minds, like jumped up out of their chairs, hugged each other. You know, some wanted to stop the tour, you know, right after that. So it was great. And then after the tour was over, uh, we went to a uh, bus dropped us off where we met. And I think we went to Wahiwa Zippies to eat. And um, the owner's son was there and I said, hey, your girlfriend did great, man. Just scared the holy crap out of everybody. And he said, oh, uncle, she never called you. I said, well, for what? Is she meeting us here? Does she need a ride? Did, did we leave her out there in the middle of the dark? And he said, no, she never called you. Call me for what? Oh, she couldn't make it. He said, God, bro, shut up. Let me call her that. He said, no, no, seriously. Her supervisor wouldn't call her work last minute. She had to go work. And so I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, we all pow eat. And the guy kept pressing the issue. So I said, you know what? Take me to her job. So two o'clock in the morning, we went to her job. And the supervisor verified that he called her in and showed me her time card that was stamped at the hour she was supposed to work. And she profusely apologized and she felt bad about it. By the way, I knew that story was an urban legend but I didn't expect the circumstances to turn out the way it did. Where the accident happened? Thompson's Corner. All right, so now we're going to send an email to a friend of mine that I think you will appreciate. I believe he's coming on with Two stories. He is coming to us all the way from Texas. And he was nice enough to send me some barbecue sauce from Texas. Which we have already generously indulged in copious amounts of, that's correct. And so we just uh, sent Chris Grant an email. And Chris Grant is the nephew of Glenn Grant. And so we're honored to have him uh, check in with us and share a ghost story. Okay, I guess we're just waiting for Chris Rand. So it's 5.50. Uh, let's move on to um, story number 24. It's a short story. It's a bus driver who drove the, uh, the old bus route up in Wyanoke. And you know, those, those mini buses only have the one door that opens. And I think that's uh, sort of the front door. But story goes that uh, one night she's going up Hakimo Road and pulls up to the bus stop. There are already a few people on the bus, uh, a few local boys. And she notices an old Filipino man wearing a suit. And when he gets onto the bus, she notices that he's not wearing any shoes. So how unusual to see an old Filipino man in a suit and tie nothing on his feet. And she asks him if he's, if he's okay. He says, oh yeah, yeah, just going up there. And he sits behind her. And as she's making her stops and pickups, you know, they're having regular conversation. And then the bus stops and the four local boys get off. 
and then and the, as the bus takes off, the bus driver says, so Tata, where are you going? And she turns around and he's gone. But she sees the four local boys walking up and she stops the bus and opens the door and says, you saw that old man got off the bus. And they said, no, we saw him get on the bus. We saw him ride the whole time. But how funny, Kanya, auntie, he wearing a, a suit, but no more nothing on his feet. Only people who inside one funeral make a lot of that. What do you mean? You know, when they put the body in the coffin, no more nothing on the feet. Right, and here we have Chris Brand. Ah, how are you, sir? Can you hear us? Is your volume on? There you go. There. Wait, don't press it. There. How, Got how's it. that? Got it. Got it. Got it. Cool. All right. Hey, look at that cool collection behind you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, man, thanks for joining us. Yeah. I'm a bit overdressed, but you know that's that's just. Now you look good. I'm a bit underdressed. I don't I don't wash clothes, so this is why I dress like this. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad to have you, man. Just uh, if you're ready, just lay that story on us. All right, I I don't know about two. I think I have one. Okay. 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 So, 1993, uh, my grandmother Glenn's mom died, and uh, they left me. After, after the funeral and everybody went home, my dad left me in the house to do some work, uh, painting, those kind of things. And one night I'm uh, laying in the back bedroom, which actually was Glenn's bedroom uh, when he was a kid, my dad's bedroom too. House is completely dark. I'm just in there watching TV, uh, kind of unwinding from a day of working when I hear a noise uh, up towards the front of the house, which clearly is the refrigerator opening. <laughs> and the light from the, from the refrigerator in the kitchen comes on, comes down the hall, I can uh, totally see it. <laughs> so I'm pretty, pretty freaked out. <laughs> you know, I have no idea what's going on. Uh, and eventually I kind of look, you know, thinking, should I get up, go check it out? But the, the refrigerator creaks, shuts, and the light's gone. Uh, basically, I should have prepped it. I should have done this differently. <laughs> but my grandmother, Glenn's mom, was a notorious late night snacker. So <laughs> her routine was, you know, she'd watch TV, fall asleep in her chair, get up, go get a snack, come back, and... I mean, I'm pretty convinced that that was her, like, you know, she'd only been dead maybe a couple of weeks. That was her still in her house, getting something to eat. Wow. <laughs> yeah, those, it was pretty cool, but I mean. Those stories are especially creepy because, you know, it's, it's someone you knew as a living person and to have them come back and it sort of throws everything off because you know it's it's their daily routine you don't think anything of it until you realize hey they're they're not around anymore right right that's crazy wow yeah um, okay but yeah uh, <laughs> thanks for sharing that story <laughs> i told you it was short <laughs> oh it's a good story it really is um is is ellie there she's still awake uh, she's not in the room. Okay. You want me to get her? I can call her. Well, I figured if she had a short story she wanted to share, to, uh, share with us as well. If not, no worries. <laughs> oh, uh, hold on. We'll, we'll see if she'll come. So, uh, yeah, I, that's really all I got. <laughs> Anything happened up there since uh, you've been in Texas, you know, where you're living now? No, not really. There, there are supposedly tons of ghosts all around, but 
Mm -hmm. Thankfully, not in our house. <laughs> so listen, we, we might do this again. So uh, maybe next time we'll have uh, Ellie join you for a story. Okay, cool. Yeah, she she's uh, shy, I guess. I don't think she wants to come in here. No problem. All right, man. Uh, say hi to your yeah. parents. For me. Yeah. Thanks, Lopaka. And say hi to Kelly. Will do. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Bye. What? Telling ghost stories, scaring the people. <laughs> How long did that take me? 45 seconds? Maybe. <laughs> I have a bad, bad tendency in like public speaking to like talk to us and answer. Okay, so apparently Chris Grant is still there. And I, I muted his microphone because, um, you know, we don't want to hear any personal stuff that might embarrass him. But that was awesome. That was really awesome. So moving on to uh, story number 24, the story goes that it's Makaha Beach. And this woman has been a student of a, a Lomi Lomi practitioner for a long time. And she's moved here from Hawaii and she's had, you know, some personal issues and uh, things that have basically broken her, you know, as a person. Uh, especially a broken heart. And so the story goes that she's laying on the beach and she's uh, on a love hala mat and she's receiving the lomi lomi. And the practitioner, his name is Nawue. And if his hair wasn't white, you wouldn't guess how old he really was. But full shock of white hair tied up in a high bun. And he's applying all of his uh, lomi methods on her body and she begins to tell him that her life hasn't been easy and that things haven't really gone well for her, especially in the romance department. And the, the lonely practitioner says, oh, I see. And she tells him that it takes her a while to get close to people and that she's not so giving of herself, which is why she doesn't have too many friends. The lonely practitioner says, I understand. And as the woman, whose name is Lily, takes a breath and sort of lays on her side like this and happens to glance up, she can't help but think that the night sky over Makaha looks like black cellophane decorated with stars, innumerable stars. And the way he's giving her the lomi, pressing his thumbs, his fingers into certain spots that release physical and emotional tension and trauma. She finds herself relaxing more and becoming more open. And she says to the lomi practitioner, Nawe, for all the time that I've known you and all the sessions that I've been in where I'm learning from you, or where, where you are applying Lomi, you've had numerous occasions to take advantage of me and you have never once done that. No way, the Lomi practitioner says, well, there's never been a reason to. And she says, this is the reason that I would like to make love to you. And they do. It starts first on the sands on the Love Hala mat and then it moves into the water where he gives her numerous amounts of the kind of pleasure she's never had before. And then she finds herself screaming in ecstasy, the scream that no one really can hear. The next morning, across from Kaniana Cave, the road, the dirt parking lot, down in the sand, just near the reef, this woman Lily is found. Only her top torso is there. Her bottom half has been completely ripped away as if bitten by a large, 
shark. The Lomi practitioner's name was Nole, but his full name is Nanole, the shark god. Story number 25, food offerings, the things we give to ancestors, the types of food we leave in the restaurant. It's late and it's about to close. The man sitting there seems to consume in numerous amounts of tonkotsu. Finishes one bowl, orders another. The owners just stand there and watch him. And they're looking at the clock. And finally the husband walks over and says, sir, we'll be closing in 15 minutes. And he says, okay, okay. Well, you know, just get time. Give me one out of bowl. And they bring him another bowl of tonkotsu. <sighs> and they serve it to him like that. Young local girl walks in orders two bowls of tonkatsu and two soda. She's waiting for her boyfriend to appear. And the man finishes his bowl of tonkatsu and calls the owners over to order another one. They say, sir, we got, we got to close pretty soon. He said, oh, well, what about that girl over there? She gave an extra bowl, nobody gonna eat him. Ask her if she like him or not, I go eat him. No, 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 we're, we're closing pretty soon, okay. And so he finishes off his last bowl of tonkatsu, drinks up all the soup. The second he places the bowl down on the table, the GMC SUV crashes through the front window, plows straight into the girl who's waiting for a boyfriend, and then straight into the man, literally licking the inside of the bowl where the tonkatsu used to be, and then picks him up plows the girl and the man into the wall, misses the two owners entirely, but it hits the gas line. The owners are a safe distance away from the restaurant, cheerfully looking at their life's work, going up in flames. The husband is crying, can't believe it. After everything we've put into this business, it's gone. It's gone. It's just going up in flames. Everything's lost. And the wife holds his face in her hands and says, it's not all lost. You still have me. He said, no, look, it's all gone. And when they both turn around and look, the restaurant is no longer in flames. It's an old, broken down, charred mess. The owner says, oh, what happened? And the wife looks at him and says, you're not seeing the whole picture. And they turn around again and the restaurant is whole, like it used to be. And the husband says, I don't understand what's going on. And the wife says, we were so mean to that man. We're so worried about closing and going home. That man, he's lonely. He has no family, no girlfriend, no kids, nothing. The only thing he has is our restaurant and Ponkatsu. But we never considered that. We just wanted to chase him out. That poor girl who came in ordered two bowls of Ponkatsu and two soda, waiting for her boyfriend. He called her and told her to wait there as a distraction because he was never going to meet her. He would go see one other woman. Husband says, how do you know all this? And she said, and us. 
What about us? We're in there too. How can we standing right here? When that big truck thing came through the restaurant, it killed the girl and the man, but it hit the gas pipe. That's what lit that whole place up, but we never made it out. We're in there too. Wait, the husband said so. We're the ghost too? Haunting our restaurant? That old Simon place is no longer there. But it was a place everybody went, especially on a weekend, after a night of drinking. That's where you went to go eat the Simon to sober up before you drove home. In Y and I, there is a place that was an opening, and I'm not sure if it's still there, that led to a place where the Minihune lived and they did some construction. And in the 70s, when they began to do construction around this hole, a Minihune in, appeared in front of the, um, in the front yard to a family's home. And it was crazy because news reporters were there, uh, six o'clock news, Bunch of people gathered in that yard to see the men who they appear because the woman who said it was someone very respected and believable. And she took these people to the very place, the opening where the men who they went in. And then she took these people to the place where the men who they come out. I know that you're asking yourself, where and why and I is this place? Well, where the many when it appeared is where the old Masagos used to be, which incidentally used to be a heiau dedicated to Kamuhuali'i, the shark god, and rededicated to Kamehameha when he came through after his campaign was won. It's over there. And so do many when they still exist in that area? Yeah. Today it's seen around a cemetery on that other road going up. I drove tour bus for about a year, uh, met a Vietnam veteran who was driving tour bus too. And he was a tunnel ramp, that was his job. And it kind of made sense because he was uh, less than five feet tall. His name was Norman. I wonder what happened to him. I hope he's still around. But he told me when he got back from Vietnam, he liked to do a lot of hiking. And so one of the places he used to like to hike was in Moana Loa Valley. And his story goes that one day as he's hiking up there, he's just out of habit marking the trail. And he goes off the trail in Moana Loa and he says, he comes up to the side of the mountain and comes up on this, this huge, huge cave. And he walks in and he says, there's canoes, there's feather capes, there's mahi ole. He said, there's this one huge pit with piles and piles of bones in it. And he said, beyond that pit with a pile of bones is this huge, huge double hull canoe with the sails open. He said, everything he saw in that cave was beautiful, but it just felt kapu, like this heavy, heavy feeling. And so coming back out of the mountains of Moana Lua, he marked the trail. And for some reason, he felt that he should go see someone at the Bishop Museum. Tell them about the trail, tell them about what he saw, what he found, and take them up there. And he said it happened. People from Bishop Museum went with him. And they knew he was who he said he was, a Vietnam veteran, because of the way he marked the trail, I guess. So they followed the markers, and they came upon that part of the, uh, the side of the mountain of Moanalua, and the cave was gone. There was no cave but he swore up and down to these guys from the Bishop Museum. He wasn't suffering from PTSD, uh, Agent Orange, but the cave was there. And he actually uh, took a notepad and drew what he saw and where he saw it and how many items were there. Drawing was legit. 
problem was there was no cave. Story number 28. So, you know how there's tattoo conventions every year? So, the story goes that there was uh, one guy at the tattoo convention, and there's always a guy at the tattoo convention that wants to get as many tattoos from as many artists as he can, as you know, bragging rights until he can't stand the pain anymore. And one tattoo convention, a Caucasian guy is standing there, and everybody thought he was Polynesian or Filipino because uh, of his dark skin. Turned out he was a, a combination of Greek and Puerto Rican. So even though he was fair skinned, every time he got into the sun, he got dark. So nobody thought anything of him while he stood there watching the old Filipino man applying tattoos. He wasn't looking so much at the type of tattoos that the Filipino man was applying. He was looking at the tattoos that the old Filipino man had on his body. It kind of went up the chest like this around the shoulders and came down. And According to the questions that people asked him about his tattoo, the old Filipino man, that tattoo can only be worn or applied to your body when you took a head or a life. And so without the old Filipino man knowing, the guy positions himself, takes a picture with his phone, leaves the convention, finds a tattoo parlor, shows the picture to the artist and says, I want this. And it's done on his non-Filipino body. As the tattoo heals, it looks great on his skin. And he's at the, uh, the swap meet at the stadium. And he's just walking down the aisles and sees you know, interesting stuff, not so interesting stuff, and comes upon this booth that has some pretty cool looking shirts and some items, a lot of knives, Filipino style knives. The shields with the knives that Filipinos have in their house, the black ones. He's talking to the young Filipino couple. Uh, he's got his shirt off and, you know, his shorts. And the young Filipino man says, oh, nice tattoo. He says, oh, thanks. And he says, uh, how much were those items over there, those knives? And the young man, Filipino man's giving the prices. And the tent sort of extends to the back of the booth. And there's the van, the Dodge van with the door open. And sitting inside is an old Filipino woman. And she's saying something in Filipino to the young Filipino man, obviously her grandson. Young Filipino man says to the customer, excuse me, hold on. Goes to the van, talks to his grandmother, comes back and says, well, my grandmother says, um, are you Filipino? He says, no, no, no. I'm actually a Greek Puerto Rican. Okay. Young man goes back to the grandmother. And now as the grandmother is speaking in Filipino, she sounds a bit irritable. She says, my, my grandmother says, um, where did you get those tattoos? And he says, oh, uh, I saw it in an old Filipino man. So I took a picture of it and went to a tattoo parlor and, had, and had, had it done. Young Filipino man relays the information to his grandmother, who's now yelling in Filipino, to the grandson who comes back and says, um, maybe you should get the hell out of here. Oh, what? Is something wrong? My grandmother says, only a Filipino can wear that, too, that tattoo, but more specifically, a Filipino who's taken a head or taken a life. And you're not Filipino. You're not supposed to be wearing that tattoo. Did you even ask that old Filipino man you took the picture of? Guy doesn't say nothing and leaves. He heads back to his condominium in Moiliili. And as he's going into the elevator, presses the button for his unit and the door closes and bounces open and closes and bounces open and closes and bounces open like this. The man says, what the hell is going on? And as he peeks out the elevator door, someone grabs his hair and yanks him out and the door finally closes around his neck. The person holding his hair pulls it back like this and he's looking into the face of the old Filipino man whose design he stole. The Filipino man has a knife, a long one. <laughs> Off goes the head. More designs. 
applied. <clears throat> Story number 29, we try to hurry these along. The medical driver says he was coming back from Kailua making a delivery. It was about two o'clock in the morning. He was in the intersection of uh, the road going up to the Pali lookout or the Pali tunnel on the windward side uh, and Kapa Quarry Road. And he said the traffic light was taking a while and he's sitting like this and he looks in this mirror and sees an old Hawaiian woman in some kind of dress, long white matted hair, walk behind his trunk. And he says, I go to look in this mirror to wait for her to appear from the back of the other side. He says, buddy, when he looks in the mirror like this, her face is right there in his. <gasps> and she says, as she grabs him by the back of his head, pulling his face toward her, you can give me one ride. He stepped on the gas, rode through that red light, sped all the way up to the, the tunnels, through it, all the way until he got to town. He said, I never even think after that. If she would fall off the truck or not, I never care. Story number 30. Medical milk driver tells me that he's delivering milk at the Royal School and it's four o'clock in the morning. And he said, the gate, the front gate to get in, it's really, really heavy. To open it, to close it, is, it's a chore. Just thick, solid, dense iron gate. He said nothing really happened initially, nothing strange. He made this delivery in the cafeteria, um, came back out, loaded a hand truck, and got into his truck and sort of reversed it this way and was coming out to the front. He said, here's the scary part. He said, my windows are down. He said, this, this tornado-like wind is blowing right through downtown Honolulu. You know, they talked about heavy winds. And so it's coming through the, the school, you know, the part of uh, the driveway that I'm leaving. He said, the wind is so, so strong. It's actually bending all the hedges this way toward the street. So all the wind is going this way. He said, that gate is closing slowly against the wind like this. He said, the wind is going that way, but the gate Closing, no problem. Story number 31, Windward Mall. A lot of customers are complaining, a lot of complaints. There is video footage of old people in the Sears tool aisle in broad daylight, being pushed down by something that's not there, something nobody can see. But the larger complaint is coming from adults in the, the food court and other parts of Windward Mall. A man says he's in the tool department looking for tools. And he says this little girl he's never seen before comes up to, to him and says, you know, your mom is saying, why are you even in here buying tools? You're useless. You can't even light one match. The man says, what? That's what your mom said. You're useless. You never even know how to tie your own shoes until you was 10 years old. Your mom did everything. Surprising that you're looking for tools because you probably don't know how to use them. The man said he was so upset. He went to smack the girl like this. The girl was gone. Woman eating at the food court sitting there by herself. And she said, it was scary later on because everybody's at the food court, the place is full. And I'm eating my plate lunch and this small freaking little, little Hawaiian boy come up to me. You know what he said? He told me, the reason you have so many problems in your life, why you can't get along with your friends and family and you get, a, you know, get along with nobody at work and why you hate kids. The reason you get all the kind of problems is because you fat. She looked at the kid and she said, what? And she went to go push the other, the chair right next to her, like right into him. And she did. She pushed that wrought iron chair right toward the kid and it went right through the little boy. Came out on the other side. Story number 32. 
even at the theater at Windward Mall. People would say they'd be sitting there watching a movie by themselves. And they'd look, and there's a kid sitting one seat over, looking around for the kid's parents who never show, no adults. And so they ask, oh, are you here by yourself? Where's your parents? My parents no stay. Your parents stay, but you no care about your parents. When they die, you're not going to care either. So no ask me where my parents are. Ask yourself, how come you're not with your parents? The man said, he was so upset. He looked at the girl and said, you know what? You gonna get one slap. Yeah, like how you slap your father. He's all crippled, no can help himself, but you slap him. He looked at the little girl, said, what? You heard what I said. All of a sudden, there was a smell of something that died. This heady smell. And the girl was gone. There was a cemetery behind Woodward Mall. And the bodies that are buried in that graveyard are not all the bodies that are buried in that graveyard. Some are underneath one of them. <sighs> Poor thing, this guy in number, story number 32, Alex Tongonan. The building where he was working, he was leaving, driving his car, and you know, he had to go out the security gate. The arm lifts up and he says, have a good day. And the security guard says, my day is done. Oh, are you going home? Security guard says, no, I just died. Security guard disappears. He's freaked out. Completely freaked out. He finally ends up at YL Zippy's. Sitting down and he looks really shook up. And the waitress says, oh, bro, what's the matter? You okay? He said, I seen one ghost at my workplace. Where you work? Well, not at my workplace, but you know, the, the security booth when you leave in the parking lot. The security guard was on ghosts. His ghost told me he died and then he disappeared. He asked the waitress, by the way, I'm a ghost in the sippies, huh? The waitress says, no, of course not. That's all rumors. And the waitress says, I'll be back to take your order. As soon as the waitress leaves, Alex Tongonan gets up, calmly walks out of the doors of the Wyalzipis, runs to his car, and takes off. Because as the waitress says, I'll be back to take your order, as she walks away, it's only her torso that walks away. There's nothing below the waist. Lance Nakasone said for an entire week, outside his bedroom window on Pupukahi Street, only late at night, he would hear a young girl's voice outside calling his name, Lance, Lance, Lance. He would ignore it the entire week. But finally, at the end of the week, he'd had enough, Lance. Lance, Lance, when he rips open the curtains, there's a young Hawaiian girl standing outside. He doesn't remember the color of the hair. He only remembers that her hair, uh, her skin is pale. Her eyes roll over black and she's pointing at the window like this. She wants to be let in and Lance says, The girl presses her finger up against the screen of the window. As she's rubbing the finger across the window, the hook that's holding the screen to the windowsill slowly comes undone. The girl pulls the screen back and starts to climb in. 
and it's the last thing Lance Nakasone remembers. When he wakes up, he's in the psych ward. Of what facility? I won't say here. But just make sure that you don't buy the abandoned house behind Leeward Drive-In on Fukukai Street. I'm gonna tell this story for number 34. Uh, the one that's listed here is really long and a lot of detail. But what I will tell you is there was a Hawaiian man who uh, lived in the, uh, the plantation, Eva Plantation, and was renting out a room on Hope Peel Street and met a young mestizo, Filipino girl, half Spanish, half Filipino, fair skin, very beautiful. It turns out the women at her design club didn't really particularly care for her, just something they didn't like. But they were seeing each other for a long while, but the only thing is she would only see him during the day, never at night. And he would question her about it. And she would always say, if you love me, you'll understand. And so finally, the Hawaiian man thought if he proposed marriage to this mestiza that she would accept. And she did. She accepted his uh, proposal of engagement. They hugged and they kissed and you know other stuff. And he said, so now that we're engaged, we can see each other all the time. And she said, no, only at night. He was so enraged at that point that he slapped her across the face and walked off. And in the old plantation days, uh, the, the sound of the, the horn went off uh, and you had to get to work. And if you didn't show up at work, the plantation boss would grab a couple of guys, go to your house and make you go to work. And so that Hawaiian man didn't show up. The plantation boss grabbed a couple of Filipino guys went to that guy's house on Hope Peel Street, came into the house through the banyo, found the back room where they opened the door. <clears throat> Wine man was sleeping, covered in his sheet and blankets. And they ripped it off him and yelled at him, hey, get up right now, get to work. And then they're stunned because his body is pale, all the blood gone. There's two indentations on his neck. And as the plantation boss is just standing there, <laughs> not sure how to react, but he is afraid. The two Filipinos looking at that indentation see a flicker of light through the ceiling. And through the corrugated tin roof, the mail is the nail is missing. And so above that is the branch of the mango tree outside the window of that room. Two Filipino men go outside, stand underneath the mango tree, look up at the branch and see that it's mangled claw marks. And they whisper to themselves, Aswang. If you need verification of Aswang living in the old Filipino villages, plantation villages off Renton Road, Tenny Village, Fernandez Village. Go to the old plantation manager's house. Ask about it. Or hang around the old post office off of Rampton Road and wait for the older Filipinos to come get their mail. And mention Aswan and see what they say. Years ago when I was still doing the Ghost Hunters bus tour and um, then started to do the downtown walking tour after Glenn passed away, the security guard told me that every Christmas, the old Hawaiian ladies at the church would bring presents and decorate the headstones of all the children buried at the cemetery. And one of the security guards was so close to them that during Christmas, he would help them carry all the presents. It's part of his job because he worked a graveyard shift. But one night he told them, Ladies, I'm so sorry, but tonight's my last night of work. Um, a new security guard will come through. But when you see him, just explain what you're doing. It should be okay. 
So a couple of nights later, the new security guard shows up and the women are putting presents around the headstone of Peter Gregory Naholo. It's that big tree next to the playground at the old Adobe building where I used to teach, Kauai Hall. The security guard comes to the hedges and the old Hawaiian women greet him and explain to them to him what they're doing. And he says, you, you, and you get the F out of here right now. And they're shocked, what? He said, you heard me, get your F in presence out of here right now, okay? It's bad enough I have to work this uh, graveyard shift. I don't want to be bothered, so get the hell out of here. And he's so intent on making his point, he kicks the presence so hard that it hits one of the old Hawaiian ladies in the shoulder. They all leave, you know, in a huff, swear get him in Hawaiian and all that kind of stuff. When that same security guard comes through the second time, no presence on the gravesite of Peter Gregory Nahola. And he chuckles to himself, snickers and says, I showed them. As he turns around to leave, he sees a little Hawaiian boy about waist high with his hands on the security guard's hips like this. And with soulful eyes, the Hawaiian boy looks up at the security guard and says, why mister? The security guard replies and says, what do you mean why? Little Hawaiian boy says, why? Why did you do that? As he turns around to walk the other way, he has his flashlight and the light flashes on the headstone of Peter Gregory Naholo, who has the porcelain portrait on the top of it. And he sees that that face in the portrait matches the face of the boy behind him. And he realizes it's a ghost. And as he runs screaming through the cemetery, he hears the voices of children screaming at him, why, why? He said, it's almost like a black whirlwind following him all these voices screaming at him, why? Until he finally collapses at the lane leading out to punch bowl. Fetal position, head over his head, screaming, leave me alone! This lone flashlight falls upon his face and when he opens his eyes and looks up, it's the police. Okay, we had reports about kids screaming in a graveyard. You seen any kids? No. Oh, bro, look at you, what happened? Pants all, all torn, gouges in his shin. The ambulance shows up. Security guard explains to the police officer what really happened. And the officer says, you idiot. First thing you never do is piss off old Hawaiian women who belong to a church. They're pious, but some of them can still put curses on people. The second thing you never do is piss off the ghosts of children, especially Hawaiian children in this cemetery. I don't know if it's still happening. It was happening up until 10 years ago. Supposedly every Christmas, if you see the old Hawaiian ladies decorating the graves of children, you're supposed to see the security guard with arm, an arm full of presents helping. Everybody loved King David Kalakaua during his reign. And some were kind of not too happy about him because of his, his extrav extravagant ways and um, his forward thinking. He was a brilliant man before his time. What people were not aware of, except for those people in his immediate circle, is that some people didn't like him to the point where they were sending curses to the palace to do him in, real curses. That's how upset they were. In fact, Rumors said that they were sending spirits to kill him. And spirits not in the form of a wisp of smoke or like Casper, their friendly ghost, but the kind of spirit that looks like you and me, the ones that are hard to discern. And those spirits are sent basically to make everyone miserable, cause dissension, disunity. In ancient times, when a spirit was sent to a village, its intent was so evil that the village ended up killing themselves. And so that's what this kind of spirit was meant to do. Like I said, the problem was no one could tell who the spirit was because it looked like everyone else. Some people say you have to make sure it has feet or you have to poke it to make sure it's flesh and blood. Well, that's the thing. It looks like everyone else and it has human qualities and texture like everyone else. They call it kahuna po'e uhane, 
a kahuna who comes with a wooden bowl in it is by purified by Olena and Paakai. The kahuna goes up to each person, holds the bowl underneath their chin and waits. Sometimes it takes a second, sometimes a minute, an hour, a day, a week, but the process has to be done. He goes up to every person one by one. And he's not looking to see if anyone has a reflection or if they're gonna drink the water. What he's waiting for is exasperation at having to stand there for so long. And you know how we all are if we're standing at one place for so long and we're waiting too long, we go, oh. that's what he's waiting for. Person becomes so exasperated, they go, oh. the breath leaves the body and touches the surface of the water and the bowl. If it makes a ripple, it's a human being. If nothing happens, it's a spirit. The kahuna slaps the water in the bowl, the water dissipates. So too does the spirit. You're asking yourself, is this practice still done today? If it is, where is it happening? What place today can a spirit like that infiltrate and cause dissension, disunity, to the point where people are at each other's throats? Where indeed? That's where you call the kokuna po'e uhane, the spirit catcher. It's one of the state buildings. <clears throat> the nurse at Queen's Hospital, the chief nurse, the nurse in charge, was running late and the new nurse on the graveyard shift was supposed to meet her where she was supposed to be given all the duties, all the things to do, all the things to watch for. When she gets to the nurse's station, there's the young Filipino nurse, the girl waiting there. And as she's talking to her, giving her all the what to do's and the what have you's, she notices that the young Filipino nurse is not paying attention and she's now really, really irritated and says, are you even looking at me? Are you even listening to what I'm saying? And the young Filipino nurse says, my toe hurts. What? My toe is sore. What do you mean your toe is sore? It hurts, my toe. The chief nurse with years of experience behind her, under her belt, looks down and sees that the nurse is not wearing any shoes. She's barefoot, but the one toe has a toe tag tied around it. The label has the girl's name, the nurse. The cause of death is listed as suicide. The place the nurse's station where they're standing. Story number 39. Oh. Uh, let's say it's a hospital. Let's say it's Queens. <sighs> There's a doctor that works there and um, he came from the Philippines from a poor province, but his father busted his ass, saving money to send his doctor to school to be a doctor, his son to school to be a doctor. And that's what happened. Son goes to medical school in California and becomes a doctor, opens a successful practice. And after a few years, uh, moves to Hawaii and supposedly is now the Queens Hospital. That's the way the story goes. He was a kind man because whenever a fellow countryman from the Philippines came, he would give them a break or sometimes not charge them all, at all. But as he became known for this service, even though he said no money was needed, people gave him money anyway. A lot of times millions of dollars and it went to his head. Then he began to charge outrageous prices turned a lot of people away. And so one day, Filipino father with his daughter from the Philippines, from the same province as the doctor, is in the waiting room and says that his daughter is deathly ill. 
close to death and would that doctor please treat her? He's a compatriot from that province in the Philippines. And the nurse talks to the doctor and tells him what's going on. And the doctor says, well, can they make a co-payment at least? When all that argument is going on, that Filipino father, his daughter dies in the lobby. That father is enraged, yelling and screaming. The doctor comes out and he sees the doctor jumps over the counter, chases after the doctor, wants to kill him. The chase goes on for quite a while, most of the day. And the doctor can't seem to get out of the hospital because everywhere he turns, Every exit he takes, that old Filipino father from the Philippines is either behind him or waiting near the exit. So finally, he takes the elevator. As he presses the elevator to the floor he's going to, the elevator starts going down until it gets to the floor where the morgue is. Before it gets to that floor, it stops and the door opens. And a young Filipino girl steps in, opposite side of the elevator. Her hair is down, her clothing looks simple. She's wearing shoes. And then the door closes and it heads down to the morgue. And when the door opens, the doctor looks out and the girl sort of peeks out too, and they see this little local boy running down the hallway toward the elevator, going like this. Doctor, wait, doctor, hold on, I'm coming, I'm coming. Don't close the elevator, don't go, doctor, wait. Doctor jumps in the ele elevator, furiously presses the button like this. And just as the boy is coming to the elevator, it's closing. And the boy says, please, doctor, wait. The doors close. And now the elevator is going back up. The Filipino girl in the elevator says, Dr. Porting, that boy sounded like he needed your help. Why didn't you let him in the elevator? The doctor says, because <laughs> we just came from the morgue. And that was no little boy. That boy died in my office yesterday. <laughs> I'm not letting his ghost on this elevator. And the Filipino girl says, the morgue? How did you know he was from the morgue and that he was dead? He says, because I make it a habit for the people I treat that lose their lives, that they don't have toe tags, that they had a, have a red string tied around their wrist so that I know they're mine. The Filipino girl says, a red string around their wrist? <laughs> Doctor says, yes. The Filipino girl says, you mean like this one? A group of uh, budding paranormal investigators did something very stupid. I'm going to tell you this, and I don't want you guys to go there. I want you to have some respect and avoid the place. But when you go past Kanyana Cave and you're rounding that corner that sort of comes down to the left, you see the high um, Kiabi trees and you'll see the yellow gates. Beyond that is the cemetery, and it's mainly Japanese people uh, who live in that area. Please respect it. You know, don't go over there and do investigations, please. So these buddy paranormal investigators said they went there and um, they're all taking pictures and you know doing the things that people don't know what they're doing do. And they're spread out through the cemetery on all ends. And then they're on one end of the cemetery altogether. And then they notice this, uh, this woman, local Japanese woman, they never said what she was wearing but she was walking through the cemetery coming to them. And she was holding on to her baby like this. And they freaked out They're like, oh, auntie, auntie, you scared the hell out of us. Oh, what are you doing here? She said, this is my baby. It won't stop crying. It won't stop crying. I don't know how to make it stop crying. And the woman, the oldest woman in that group said, but 
Auntie, your baby's not crying. Yes, yeah, she is. She's crying. I can't make her stop. It's just, I know I'm not supposed to get irritated, but I don't know what to do. I, I can't handle it anymore. But Auntie, Auntie, your baby's not crying. It's not crying at all. But then they started to hear it. The baby crying. But the sound was minimal, like it was at a distance. But the crying got louder and louder and closer until it engulfed the entire group that was standing there. And the woman said, see, see, my baby won't stop crying. It won't stop crying. As she's holding the baby like this, blood begins to appear on that white towel-like diaper that the baby is wrapped with. See, my baby won't stop crying. Make my baby stop crying! The group took off, yelling, screaming, running to their cars, peeling out in the sand, but not really making any traction until they finally got out of there. The group came back a year later just to see if it was all real during the day, of course. And they went through the area, taking pictures, really got nothing. Until they were driving away. And the older woman in the group just randomly, as they're driving away, stuck her hand out the window with her cell phone like this, just took a random picture. And she said when she looked at the picture on her cell phone, there was the woman standing in front of the yellow gate, holding her baby like this. Please don't go there. My papa used to be a security guard at Bishop Museum. Uh, story number 41, by the way. <laughs> uh, 40, I think. Yeah, story number 40. So my father used to be a security guard at Bishop Museum. And he said, what was really funny is um, he wasn't bothered by anything. And he, you know, he was always asked if something happened or things followed him around. He said, no, nothing happened. You know, it's, it's our kupuna, we don't have to worry. But he said there used to be complaints from the non hawaiian security guards who would go to close the lights in the, the Bones collection room. And the story was every time they went to close the lights, You'd always hear a voice go, hey, it would scare the hell out of him. Hey. And so my papa noticed that and asked him, something wrong? You look troubled. And he would say, yeah, every time we go to the bone collections room, we hear, hey, it just scares the hell out of us. Or when we open the elevator, hey, we don't know what that is. My papa told him, Oh, that's the kupuna. Kupuna, yeah, the Hawaiian ancestors. They don't bother me because I'm Hawaiian. They know my name. So when they call me, I know who it is. But you Hawaii, you're not Hawaiian. They don't know who you. You have no ancestral connection. So that's why they call you E and not by your name. All right, we're now going to bring on Lloyd Harbach, who is, uh, has been my hero since I first came across a podcast that he did um, 11 years ago. And it was the most eye-opening podcast that I ever heard. And it explained a lot of things and made a lot of sense. And so I've been a big Lloyd Harbach fan ever since then. And I got to meet him in person last year. It was awesome. All right, and we have invited Lloyd to join us and tell us a story.
and we started at four, it's now six. So I'm gonna get, try and get through these as quickly as possible without uh, losing any of the quality of the stories. But thanks for hanging with us so far. Oh, sorry, we got some dead air. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, you know, um, how's it going? Liking it so far? Uh, thanks for being with us. We really appreciate it. So we're just waiting for, uh, for Lloyd Arbach to join us. I said, just sent him an email. And um, yeah, so Lloyd is going to be story number 42. So we're at 42, we're halfway there, kinda, yeah. All right, so we're at 652. I'm imagine Lloyd's going to try and check in exactly around seven. So uh, we'll go with number 42 right now. The story goes that there was a young man early in the morning uh, hiking up the trail to Manoa Falls. And being that it was early, there wasn't too many people around. And as he was heading to the falls, he said all of a sudden, beautiful Hawaiian girl walks up next to him, she's following him along and can't clear, clearly remember what she was wearing, but she was smiling, you know, and seemed to have a bright personality. And finally he says, oh, hi. She says, hi. And she says, are you from here? He says, no, no, I'm, I'm visiting from Massachusetts. She said, okay, is it your first time up here? He says, yeah, I, I heard about it um, from the concierge. So I thought I'd, I'd check it out. And she says, okay, so, what are you going to do with the, the falls? He says, oh, I, I don't know. Uh, won't know until I get there. Maybe stand out of the water or something. She says, you know, there's kind of a pond at the bottom of the falls. It's great for swimming. And as they're walking, they're, they're already upon the falls. And he says, really? She says, yeah. And she pushes him into the pond. And she dives in after him. They don't see the other local guy at the other end of the pond who witnesses this entire scenario. The girl dives in after the guy. When the guy surfaces, she comes up and wraps her entire body around him and drags him down. The pond is still. And the guy is sort of watching, curious. And he says, finally, the guy surfaces, scrambles to the edge of the pond and just takes off running. He says, the girl turns around and looks at him and smiles and climbs out of the pond backwards. He doesn't bother to stay to see what's going to happen next. Because as he told me, he didn't want to be next. <laughs> All right, so Lloyd Armock. Oh, here we are. Hi, you... Hey, how's it going? Okay, how are you? Great. I'm I'm liking your office space. Thank you. <laughs> Especially the one video behind you. It's got a familiar logo on it. <laughs> yeah, it's actually an action figure. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Very cool. So thanks for joining us. And yeah, if, uh, you want to please share that story with us. We are interested in hearing it. Sure. We've got a couple of quick ones for you. Oh, that's yeah. That's good. Oh, that's great. <clears throat> so as I think I mentioned to you via text, I'll share one that was shared with me and then also something that happened to me, one of my cases real quick. <clears throat> uh, both of which are, I think, are worthy of the Twilight Zone in some respects. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So a number of years ago, I was on a local talk show here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And of course it was Halloween and we were talking about ghosts and the host was being very skeptical as many talk show hosts do. And as we finished the show and we're, we're walking off the, uh, the set, he says, you know, I grew up in a haunted farmhouse. 
And I said to him, you couldn't have mentioned that on the show. He said, I didn't know, he didn't want to get into it. <clears throat> His name was Patrick Van Horn. Okay. He went on to go on, went on to CBS uh, network, I believe. So he said that they moved into this house in the Midwest, um, he and his family, a number, when he was in his, you know, before he was 10 years old. And they lived there for a number of years. When they first moved in, they noticed that around 11 o'clock at night, every night, they would hear the sounds of footsteps walking up and down the hallway. And it initially made them curious. You know, they look in the hallway, there was nobody there. They didn't quite know what to make of it. But this continued for so long that most of the family got a little freaked out by it. Patrick, as he got into his teenage years, his teenagers are often contrary. He decided one night when he was 16 years old, he'd stay up and try to follow the footsteps to see where they went, even though they paced back and forth. So he had the lights on in the hallway. Uh, the lights, the place didn't need to be dark for the footsteps to be sounded, sounding. He waited for the footsteps. He waited till they walked past his bedroom door. He stepped out in the hallway and started walking after the footsteps. And for the very first time, the footsteps changed pattern. They started moving faster and away from him. So he started walking a little bit faster himself. The footsteps got a little faster, he said, and headed for the stairs, going downstairs, which had never happened before. So he chases after the footsteps. The footsteps are running down the stairs. There's still nobody he can see. He runs after them. He hears the footsteps come off the stairway walk through the foyer into the living room and he hears a scuffling sound and a thud. He turned the lights on in the living room and he notices that the rug that's on the floor, which is on hardwood floors, is bunched up at the edge. He hears the sound, as he said to me, the sound of someone getting up and brushing himself off. The footsteps ran for the front door. It did not open, but they ran for the front door and that was the last time they ever heard the ghostly footsteps. Wow. Wow. So, you know, my lesson from that was the, one of the best ways to get rid of a ghost is to embarrass him out of your house. <laughs> I'll try that next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the other one happened to me in my early days in the field. Um, actually, it was in the New York area. Uh, I grew up in Westchester County, New York. And when I was there after grad school for a couple of years before I came back to California, got a lot of calls, case calls that came in through the American Society for Psychical Research. And this was a couple that sounded very, you know, sane on the phone, as most people do when they call us. And they said that they were hearing, again, footsteps from the attic that they had in their house. They had an old house, <clears throat> not, not quite as old as some of the houses in Westchester, which some of which dated back to the Revolutionary War. But this was decades, many decades old. And so they had looked in the attic. They couldn't quite figure out what was going on. This was... Um, closer to midnight when this would happen almost every night, although it varied a bit, wasn't exactly the same pattern. The footsteps or the sounds that they heard were not exactly the same every night. So it didn't sound like your typical residual haunting at all. Uh, so this was what, because I got, I talked to the folks quite a bit on the phone. This is my early days when I was young and a little bit, uh, I don't want to say arrogant, but I figured I would, would go on my own. This was a Lloyd goes solo, which was a lesson I learned a few years later, ne never to do that for safety reasons. These could have been crazy people for all I knew. So I sat down, talked to them quite a bit. It had started uh, only a couple months before. They had lived in the house for quite some time. They had never had this experience before. This was brand new to these folks. And so I decided first to go upstairs and check out the attic. Um, and this was a kind of a pull down stairway to go up. And the attic space was at, at the peak of the house. You could actually stand up but it kind of had, um, you know, angled roof. So towards the edges of the attic, it was a lot lower. So I, I didn't see anything that would right off the bat that would make sense or make sounds. I, I couldn't figure that out. So I decided I'd, I'd hunker down since it, it was closer to 11. We, we, we had talked for quite some time. I wanted to stay and see if I could hear the footsteps as well. And so I hunkered down, I had a flashlight with me, turned off the lights. Uh, just to see since the lights were normally out in the attic, they were right below the attic with their lights on because that's how things were for them. <clears throat> and I waited. 
And at some point, a little while after it quieted down throughout the house, I heard a scuffling sound from across the attic from me, a scratching sound and then a scuffling sound. And then I heard a light thump and then another scuffling sound and another light thump. And this was actually continuing and coming closer to me, which was kind of bizarre in itself. The couple downstairs yells, the footsteps, the footsteps, do you hear the footsteps? But I'm only hearing a light thump. So it gets close enough to me that I kind of slowly picked up the flashlight, turned it on, pointed in that direction, and scared the hell out of a squirrel. <laughs> Pushing a nut across the very rough floor. And that's what the thuds were. So the squirrel takes off. I, I find that there's a hole in the attic in the roof. That's where the squirrel is getting in. I look around and, and actually pretty close to where I was sit seated were a, was a pile of nuts. I just didn't notice what that was. Apparently the squirrel was putting away food for the winter time. No. And it occurred to me that this thud, if this, this correlated to the footsteps, I grabbed one of the nuts and I rolled it across the floor. It bounced quite a bit and they yelled downstairs, the footsteps, the footsteps. So I didn't say a word because you know sometimes you have to have fun as an investigator. I grabbed a handful of the nuts and I threw them across the floor. And the couple started screaming bloody murder. It was, they thought it was like the army of darkness had invaded the attic. So I then went downstairs, explained to them what was going on. They, they actually were a little afraid of me, thought maybe I was possessed or something like that. So I had to put one of them upstairs and one downstairs and have them tested out to prove that this was really not a ghost, just a very nutty squirrel that had uh, convinced them otherwise. That's... That's a funny story, but then that also validates how a lot of people misunderstand a haunting. <laughs> yeah, the acoustics of the attic were just such that it was appropriate. It was magnifying the sound through the floorboards. We find things like that all the time. You know, we, we don't go into necessarily debunk a case like they talk about on the TV shows. We're going to try and find the explanations. Right. Uh, Patrick's case was pretty interesting because they had so many witnesses. And this was interesting in itself for a different reason. <laughs> uh, do you happen to have this story in one of your books? Or are you going to submit it to one of your books? Um, the Squirrel in the Attic is actually in my paranormal casebook, which I have to bring back into print. I'm just going through it. I've got to just reformat it. I've got right. the rights back. So that'll be back out um, hopefully this summer this or fall at the latest. OK, so for those of you who are watching, when I do my regular live uh, ghost stories on Friday, you always see me sitting down or standing, uh, reading a book, and normally those books are Lloyd's books. And um, it's a great way to advertise Lloyd Arbach, Arbach, but those books are, I think, required reading if you decide to get into the, um, the paranormal field, especially as an investigator. Uh, Lloyd has a very comprehensive um, list of things to do and not to do, and they're very, very common sense, especially for myself as a cultural practitioner. It, really brought a light, brought a light to a lot of things. And that's why I've been such a fan of Lloyd's for so long, but thank you. Uh, well, thank I think you. if we do this again, we may have to come, have you come back. <laughs> sure. I'm sorry, I can't come to Hawaii right now. Well, you know, never say never. We're no, I'm not gonna say never. I'm, I'm, as soon as things happen, you know, we can do travel again, I'll, I'll try to make it, so. Yeah, we'll and we'll, we'll try to get that uh, Temple of the Jedi going. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. All right. You're excellent, Lloyd. Thank you so much. All right. Good night. Good night. Lloyd Arbach, he's, he's amazing and he's really down to earth. And if you guys are, ever get to meet him, you'll see just how much of a cool guy he really is. <clears throat> um, story number 46. One of the other ghosts that people uh, tend to see in the parking lot across the street from uh, Kaneana Cave in Makua is the ghost of a, a local brada, about six feet tall, um, no more shirt on, big pot belly, uh, wears the grayish khaki shorts with the belt and, you know, the bus up rubber slippers. And nobody quite knew who he was and who his ghost was. 
there's a story that was told for, uh, to me by a group of uh, fishermen who normally fish out, out at Kiava Ula. And, you know, when it's fishing time, they, they camp the whole day and the whole night, you know, the whole weekend. If you've ever seen Kiava Ula during those times, you'll see it's like packed and you'll see loads and loads of, of fishing poles set out, right? And what, what's good about that is, you know, the whole family saying you hear and see the kids running around, having a good time. And so this was the case a few years ago, it was the weekend, all the families were there, all the poles were set out. And there was enough space for this one local family to uh, reverse their car into and set up everything. Uh, the makeshift tarp, the coolers, you know, the table, uh, the Tupperware, uh, the hibachi and you know the kids just took off went into the water to go play and the husband was there six foot tall local brada no shirt big pot belly grayish khaki pants belt bust up slippers and the wife was basically doing everything uh, setting up the table with food um, paper plates cups everything starting the hibachi and brada was just sitting on his chair and the wife is, you know, just busting her behind, setting everything up, tent, everything. And all of a sudden, you know, he's like, hey, make me one sandwich before I false crack you. And so no argument, she gets out the stuff, makes the sandwich, puts it on a plate, gives it to him with a beer. And the kids are having fun in the water. And pretty soon, some of the guys who've been fishing uh, caught a fair amount of fish and walked over to that tent and saw the wife and said, sister, we get extra fish you guys like, and plus we get extra pole you guys like. And they went to hand it to the woman and she went to take it. And the husband sitting down goes, brah, get out of here. We don't like that kind. Well, we know the fish is rotten and the poison is no good. Oh, no, bro, we just caught him this morning. The fish is fresh and, you know, the, the poi, poi is good. We just got him from the store. Bro, never hear what I said. Beat it. And so they took off. The husband gets up, backhand smacks his wife right across the face in front of everybody. And what you doing? Huh? Taking the fish and the poi from these guys. What? What? You like poke them, huh? That's why. And the wife said nothing. And people near them Intervene, sister, you okay? You like us call the cops or something? You like, you'll come over here? Bring the kids over here? No, it's okay. Just leave me alone. You sure? Look, your face all red. You're getting one black eye already. I said, just leave me alone. So everybody left. That was the atmosphere for the rest of the day. Lunchtime came. The kids came running up the beach. The wife made the sandwiches and bought out the cold sodas and the carrot sticks, the kids sat down at the mini table and started to eat. The husband sitting there just chugging down his beer, eating his poke, ignoring his wife and kids. An errant wind comes out of nowhere and just blows all that stuff all over the place and the kids food on top of the, the back of the father who gets up and just smacks the hell out of his kids. And then smacks his wife again. Because why she never see the wind coming? That was by the end of the day. The husband said, let's go, pack them up, let's go, hurry up. And the wife does everything. Takes down the tarp, rolls everything up, puts all the food away in the coolers, lugs everything onto the back of the truck. And they're all loaded up. Except when they're about to leave, the wife's parents show up. And the husband's like, oh, what are you calling him for? Huh? Why, why? And the wife says, Oh, kids want to go stay overnight with my folks. Oh, get in. The kids get into the car with the wife's parents and they drive them up. Everything's loaded and the wife has started the car and they're driving. The husband is stinking drunk by that point. He's nodding off. And you know how you're sleeping like this against the window of the door and sometimes when there's a bump or a turn and you whack the window like that is so, so on. Driving, leaving Kiawaula. The wife is looking at her husband. Something snaps. She floors the gas pedal. They're going fast. 
taking those turns. One, she takes two sharp, one this way, one that way. When she takes the one this way, the husband head goes, boom, cracks the window. Blood coming down the side of his head, still drunk, but still awake. Oh, what happened? What you doing, huh? huh? What, I gotta reach over and false crack you again for make you understand. At that point, the truck is now heading toward the parking lot across the street from the cave. And it heads straight for that telephone pole and hits it head on. But before it makes the impact, the wife serves, swerves the truck this way so that the pole goes right through the part of the truck where the husband is sitting. Kills him instantly, mangles his body. The wife dies too, but slowly. The ghost, the six foot tall local brother, no shirt, pot belly, khaki gray colored shorts, belt, bus up, slippers. Supposed to be that guy. So here's a story that I promised uh, one of our, our fans that I would read. <clears throat> and forgive me if I, I butcher it. So gentleman's name is uh, Arthur Plateros. And so in the future, uh, we'll read some stories that you submit by your permission only. And so Arthur says about story 45, by the way, three years ago, he was fishing in Kebe, mm, haunted already. It was about 11.30 PM. He was sitting in his truck, just kicking back, listening to music, and then suddenly heard the bells going off on the fishing pole. So he opened his door and shined his headlamp at the poles, the fishing poles. It stopped and his pole stood up straight. He walked over and realized that his line was slacked and was straight down on the sand into the water. He reeled in the line and asked himself, I didn't throw this far. You fishermen who are listening, you know what that is. He said he suddenly felt a pull, so he tried to set his hook. His lead came flying at him like something threw it at him. He shone his headlamp into the water on full beam and saw what he thought was a monk seal. It kind of looked like a night diner. Then he realized it was something else. It was about 25 feet away from where they were standing. It went underwater and swam to the left to the other pole. It came up, then swam back in front of him. And that's when he realized it wasn't a monk seal or a night diver. It stood up about waist high so he could clearly see the upper part of its body. It was green and gray in color with big eyes, with shoulders and arms. He got so scared that he grabbed his pole, sand spike and bell and ran to his truck, threw it in the back of his truck and ran to get the other pole. It swam over in front of his other pole, stayed there and watched him. He reeled in his pole, grabbed everything and ran to, back to his truck. He looked back and noticed it actually moved closer on top of the bank. He drove away as fast as he could on the rocky sandy road bumping all over the place. He ended up at the McDonald's parking lot and started calling his friends and told them what happened. One of his friends told him that his dad experienced the same thing while fishing there three years ago. A woman was in the water calling out to them while he was fishing. So, no go fishing over there. So, one second. I've been sitting in the same position since four o'clock. Uh, it's about seven thirty right now. Oh, the body is not what it used to be. <clears throat> so. That was 47, sorry. Um, story number 48. 
my uh, my cousin Kili Makua used to work uh, construction. He was a foreman, and he was involved in the building of H3 on the Halava side. And he knew my cousin's husband, uh, George Crawford, because they're working on the same project. The story goes that one day they were sitting on the side of the hill having lunch, and the hill sort of like went down this way into the valley. As they're sitting there eating, they noticed this huge blob coming out of coming out of the overbrush. And they said the thing was black, just black and so huge that the tusks curled in this way. And George grabbed this huge pipe wrench and ran down the hill chasing after, chasing after it. And my cousin Gilly was like, no, no, bro. But you know, George is taking off. And so here's George's part of the story. He said he's taking off after the thing, as he said, trucking it through the bushes. And he said, suddenly, as he looks up, he notices they're running closer toward the side of the mountain in Halava Valley. It's coming closer. He's just taking off. And pretty soon they're coming to this huge, huge clearing, the circumference of like 100 feet around if you're standing in the middle. That's where he ended up. And as he was running after that huge pig, this voice in his head said, George, what are you going to do if this thing stops? And in the middle of that clearing, the pig stopped and it turned around and it dug in its heels and it started to do that. <clears throat> Thought to himself, I get chance. Let the thing charge me last minute. I step out of the way my pipe wrench. I crack them right on their shoulder blades. Thing no can move. And he said, when he looked at the pipe wrench in his hand, it wasn't the big one that he thought he reached for. He actually grabbed a small one. And now he knew he was gonna die. <clears throat> And he stood there waiting for death to approach, deciding to fight till the end if he could survive it. But he said at this very last second as the pig was almost on him, he said a guy, a Hawaiian guy, darker skinned than he was, claims must have been more than seven to eight feet tall, appeared out of nowhere, scooped up that pig like a football under his arm like this, in his arm. And he noticed the guy was wearing this huge black feather cape. He said the guy stopped and looked at him, checked them out from head to toe, and then looked toward the other end of the forest and walked off. He said, as that Hawaiian guy in the black feather cape walked off, he said the feathers on the back of the cape stood up and he realized it wasn't feathers, it was bristles on the back of the pig. He said to me, uncle, that was Kamapua. The pig god. For those of you who don't understand the Hawaiian words and names, Google. <clears throat> There's a story, which is a uh, story number 49, about a group of kids who were playing somewhere in the windward side and, and came across this heiau that they'd never seen before, never knew it was there, but there it was in the clearing. And it's just somewhere between um, Mauna Wili and when you're coming out of the poly tunnel, you're taking that turn, there's a place where you can pull over the side of the road and, and it's an overlook. So apparently it, it's, place between Mauna Wili and that lookout. They're hiking and they just came across this massive hail. And <laughs> they said it, it looked brand new, like it had just been made. And they were kind of drunk in the middle of the day. And you know, when it's hot and you're drunk and you become more stupid than usual. Well, one of these guys, supposedly his name was Justin, had to go and he went shishi on top of the hail. And his friends were warning him, bro, what you doing? That's when, hey, oh, bro, you know, you know, she, she on the hill. Bro, I can't, I gotta go. Sorry, it's nobody stay. And his friends abandoned him. They said, bro, we don't like be around for whatever gonna happen to you, bro. And so they, they took off. But he continued the hike. And supposedly he heard trees being broken down behind him. And he claims as he turned around, trees were just falling one on top of the other, like something huge was coming toward him. And so he took off running in his drunken stupor. 
but he got to that top uh, part of that lookout on the side of the road after you leave the poly tunnel coming one word side and follow that trail that led up eventually to the poly lookout and the trees kept falling behind him the banana plants the hala pepe the hollow something was coming that he couldn't see when he finally got up to that gate that road leading up to the poly lookout where everybody stands and looks his friends were there and he was yelling after them, whoa, 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 wait, wait. So this is the part of the story that his friends tell me. He said as he was running up toward them in the middle of the day, some huge black shadowy figure grabbed him and dragged him down the road and then left. He said after that, their friend is never been the same. It's not the same just than they knew. It's almost as if making shishi on that hail elicited something to come and steal some part of his psyche away from him. They said, we can't put our finger on it, but he's not the same Justin. I asked him, did you guys ever go back to find out exactly where that hail was. They said they'd been back several times, but they've never found it. Could it be that the shadow that grabbed Justin might have been the Ihum, the executioner who guards the hail? and searches for human sacrifices. <clears throat> 50. Yay. Yay, Happy we're halfway there. <laughs> I was doing a, uh, a ghost tour for um, a program couple of summers ago. And I usually like to, to change it up so it's not monotonous. So we ended up um, at the Triangle Park um, in Kahala, right past Diamond Head. You guys know that park. And for fun, we we're just gonna do this, this thing. And it was just completely fun. There was nothing serious. And we all sat in a circle on the grass and in the middle was a flashlight. It's that exercise where you say, if there's something here, please turn the flashlight on or turn it off. And so that's what I did. And it was a, my own personal flashlight. It wasn't rigged or anything, you know, full batteries and turned it off, put it in the middle of the grass. And I said, if there's anyone here with us right now, please turn on this flashlight. And the flashlight slowly flickered on like this and then flickered off. Not the click on and click off, but just like something was shaking the actual light just like that, on and off. And right at that moment, this male voice whispered in my ear, Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. And so I stopped and I said, is there anyone here named Rachel? Anyone? And a hand raised. And then a voice said, Mitch, Mitch, Mitch. I looked at this person and I said, do you know somebody named Mitch? The reply was, he was my boyfriend in high school. And then the voice said, I'm sorry, it's not her fault, I'm sorry. And I said, uh, Mitch says to tell you that he's sorry and that it's not your fault. Woman broke down crying. I mean, really broke down crying. I found out later on that the high school where they attended, Mitch, her boyfriend, <clears throat> committed suicide. Before he did it, he looked her in the eye and said, this is all your fault. And then he did it. 
I guess he came back from the ethers to relay the message that after all these years, it was unfair of him to do that. Letting his last words beat her that it was her fault. I saw this person a year later and apologized for doing that and that it wasn't purposeful, it just happened. And she said it was okay. But just out loud, I said, I wonder why this happened at Diamond Head Park, uh, the Triangle Park of all places. And she said, oh, I forgot to tell you last year. That park is where we used to hang out all the time, me and Mitch. It was our spot. Place memories. <clears throat> Claudia Wong was my classmate. And we met in intermediate school and she was cool, liked her a lot. And so the summer happens in 1976 and then 77, it's, it's our freshman year in high school. And so <clears throat> one morning when I'm walking to school, it's actually after school, I'm walking past the store by St. Joseph Church. I see a bunch of uh, bigger girls harassing Clydia. And so I went and chased them away and they took away her Fritos and her, her seven up. And so I gave her my Fritos and my seven up and asked her if she was okay. She said, yeah. And then I said, are you sure? Everything's fine. And she goes, yeah. So she said, what classes are you taking? So I'm taking a drama class. I said, what about you? She goes, oh, I don't know yet. And then she mentioned something about possibly having a part-time job. I said, oh, me too. I'm only a freshman, but my father wants me to get a job already. And she said, if you get a job, what are you going to do with your money? And I said, I'm going to buy the Bruce Lee shoes. And then she said, okay. And every time we would say goodbye, she would always say, Wah! and we do that to each other. <clears throat> A couple of days later, it's after school and where Mr. Hada's uh, cane tassel room used to be, maybe it's still there. I went to the soda machine to grab myself a soda and this hand comes over my shoulder and puts in the quarter and presses the Coca-Cola button. My drink comes out and I turn around and it's quiet in. And she says, so that's for the other day. I said, oh, thanks. I said, so what, what you gonna do now? She goes, oh, I gotta go home and do homework. I said, okay, see you tomorrow. And she said, yeah. See you tomorrow. Later on that evening, it's dinner time and the news is on. And I'm sitting in the, uh, the living room. And my father is kind of watching the news, but I'm watching it. And I go into the kitchen to get a, a drink of orange juice. And in the kitchen, I hear it. Body found behind White Powell High School, a place called Mosquito Junction in a junkyard. A young 14-year-old local girl. But I heard the word Waipahu and I went into the living room. They said the back of her head had been, had been bashed in. And on the news report is a refrigerator on the dirt and sticking out from the other side of the refrigerator is a pair of feet with the underwear and the pants down to the ankles. But I looked at the shoes carefully. At the same time, when I said to myself, those are Clydia's shoes, the news reporter said, it's the body of Clydia Wong. I never got to go to the services and a lot of people knew her and loved her. I never told anyone this, even though I'd written the story of Clydia about 10 years ago. But my freshman year in high school, I would always see her ghost lingering near the soda machine. And then in the uh, English room next to the Kane Castle room. She was always near the soda machine or standing at the chalkboard in the English room. And I never knew why.
sorry, wasn't planning on telling that story. <clears throat> Number 52, also in intermediate school, there was this girl that I liked uh, in the eighth grade, her name was Ruth Bender. And I kind of sent her a note that I liked her. And one of my classmates saw the note and made fun of it. And I remember Ruth Bender crying and just me feeling really bad about it. And she never talked to me after that. And that didn't bother me, I understood why. Come freshman year at Boy Pablo High School, she wasn't around, so I just naturally assumed she went to Campbell High School in Pearl City. So don't hear about Ruth Bender until my senior year. And I forget my classmate's name, I think it was Beverly, but we were at her house listening to Elton John records. I think uh, the song was Someone Saved My Life Tonight. And a classmate of ours came over to Beverly's house and said, have you heard? And we said, no, heard what? And he said, Ruth Bender was murdered up by a dull plantation. They found her body in the cane field, naked. She'd been shot. I hadn't seen Ruth Bender since intermediate. And here it was 1980 bothered me for the whole day. <clears throat> and I was at home later that night talking on the phone with uh, my classmates about the whole thing. And I think even back then you could do three-way calls. And uh, I forget who was on the phone with us. But as I was listening to all of them talk about it, I kind of glanced out my window. We're living in a duplex. Uh, air watercress farm. And just for a brief second, I thought I saw Ruth Bender's face outside my window. Not really a scary face, a bloody face, but just a face. Blank expression. I screamed, went to run out of my room, tripped over my chair, banged my head on the door. And when the phone call happened, I just come out of the shower. So I still had uh, my towel around my waist. And when my dad opened the door, <laughs> thought I was nuts. I tried to explain to him what happened, but he didn't believe me. The worker tells me that um, he'd been psychic for a while and he just never acknowledged it and ignored it whenever things happened. When he heard things, saw things, got visions, impressions, just completely ignored it. And so I promised him I wouldn't say where his state office is, but it's somewhere in the area of the uh, Kamehameha statue, those buildings in that area. And he said for a long time, because he's been a lifetime state worker, he um, worked across the desk of this old Filipino guy about his age, and his name is Milton. And Milton knew how to do it, his work, but there was something that was kind of off about him. And so they never socialized um, outside of work. It was just work and that's it. So one day he says, <laughs> in the middle of work, he completely freaks out because he said, now here it is, the new millennia and standing in my office is a young Japanese girl with a Tara Fawcett hairstyle. And she's wearing those Aloha print shirts that they used to wear in the eighties. You know, the kind of girls would tie around their waist and those slacks and those, those shoes. And I said, yeah, yeah, I get it. I said, so it was a ghost? Oh, he said, yeah. It was definitely a ghost. But rather than talk to him or try to tell him anything, she kept pointing to Milton. Without really trying to make a scene because Milton like was right across the desk from him, he just looked at her and said, the ghost of the young Japanese girl just kept pointing to Milton. This went on for several weeks. 
And then finally, after several weeks, Milton gets up, goes to the bathroom for lunch. The guy says, I don't remember. And he says to the ghost of the young Japanese woman, what, what is it? She said, Milton, his wallet. Look in his wallet. He knows me. Tell him. He knows me. So the guy says, Milton comes back. And he says to Milton, hey, you know, back in the day, you wouldn't know when Japanese girl kind of tall, had the fair faucet hair, um, I don't know, black copy coat, a lower shirt kind, the kind you tie around your waist, black slacks. Milton looked up at him and said, why? Why you ask for? Oh, well, just, just asking. Well, but why? Why you ask? Now the Japanese girl is looking at the man and says, inside his wallet, inside his wallet, he knows me. He said, well, Milton, no freak out. But if you know who that is, um, her ghost telling me for tell you to look in your wallet because you know who that, you know her. And he said, the guy Milton freaked out. Never yell, never scream, never go crazy, but would freak out. Bro, he would crawl underneath the desk and he was in one fetal position, like one baby. He was rocking back and forth on the floor. You know, good thing had carpet. It's like, Milton, Milton, what's the matter? He's like, no, no. What can be? What can be? And he's going like this. What can be? What can be? So the ghost is looking at the guy and saying, his wallet. He knows who I am. He knows me. And so the guy says, Milton, I'm going to reach for your wallet, okay? Ah, what can be? What can be? So he reaches in the pants, pulls out the wallet, looking at the ghost and says, what, what? She said, there, there, the yellow paper. Pulls out the yellow paper, unfolds it. It's an old, worn newspaper article. Picture of the girl, the Japanese girl, the ghost. He's reading the article, Milk grabs it like this and said, oh, I went like her. I went like her, I really went like her. But she never liked go prom. She never liked go prom. So she was working, she was working at the mall, so after the mall, I'd wait for her and I'd ask her, go prom with me, she never liked. So I follow her to a car, I just begging her, please go prom with me. And she got in the car, she said, I said, no. She would yell at me and some spit would come out of her mouth. And I, I just, oh, I lose him, so I choke her, choke her. And then she, yeah, choke her. And then she, and then choke her, and then, yeah, what can be, what can be? Some youth leaders at Kualoa Park, the beach park, facing uh, Mokoli or what you know as Chinaman's hat, erroneously named, told me that they, they got lost. Uh, there was a lunch break and they all jumped in a car and took that, that back road that goes out to the main, the main road. And right after you come out the main road, you can see Kualoa Ranch. And they said they'd taken that, that road millions and millions of times. But on that particular day, about 10 years ago during the summer in broad daylight, they got lost. They lost their way. And it took most of the day. Couldn't find their way out to the road, couldn't find their way back to the camp. They were starting to get worried. And they said, all of a sudden, this man, this Hawaiian man walks out from the high grass. He's in dungarees. He said, you know, the kind of we're doing the plantation, you know, the kind of dungarees, the cowboy kind, you know, boots and hat and everything like that. Tall Hawaiian man just came out of the tall grass and he went like this. And so he stopped and he came over to my, my, my side, the driver's side door, and he said, boy, you lost. Oh, Papa, yeah, we, we can't find our way to the main road. We've been looking all day. We've been up in this, down this road so many times. Now we know we can find the main road. Ah, away. Oh, you can get lost like that. 
the main road right over there. You Marco Polo, you guys gonna see? And they all looked, and there's the main road. And they said, "Oh, Papa, thank you." He said, "Sometimes things happen for a reason, you know. Maybe it look like no makes sense, but then you find out later." They said the old man just walked down the rest of the road, heading toward the beach. They found the main road, and they're heading toward Kahuku site to go to that little strip mall to get something to eat. But while they're eating, and they're talking about what happened, one of the camp leaders posed the question, "Eh, hey, you know, the whole time the that old Hawaiian man was talking to us." Like he was leaning inside your window, right? Talking to the guy who was driving. Yeah. And all you guys seen him, right? And everybody says, yeah, why? Anybody remember seeing the guy's face? Because I don't can remember seeing the guy's face. The youth leader tells me, they all agree. No one remembers seeing his face even though it was right there, right in front of them. By the way, there was an accident, a horrible accident. It happened during the time they were lost and couldn't find their way down a simple road to the main road. Sometimes things happen for a reason that we don't immediately understand. All right, so now we're going to bring on Lane Wilkin and send him an email. And Lane Wilkin is a Filipino, traditional Filipino tattoo artist. So he tattoos the way that uh, my cousin Kili Makua tattoos and uh, Keone Nunes tattoos. And he is going to share Some ghost stories with us. And for me, I wrote down your email address on this post it note in small letters. So I need a couple of seconds. So Natalia at Filipino.kitchen.com. Okay. Okay, so we're just waiting for um, Lane Wilkin. We're at 7.44. And um, I think we got a quick minute for uh, story number 55. It was told by a tattoo artist, a Japanese tattoo artist, in fact, um, who has a shop in Japan that he was doing the uh, old style, the Izumi style of tattooing where they just dig the prong into your, your skin, but the um, tattoos are beautiful, beautiful colors. But he talked about one time while doing a tattoo um, in the middle of the session that the person he was working on, their shadow came out of their body and stood in the corner of the studio until the, the tattoo was done. So you imagine it's a very uh, visceral experience and even though you're physically tattooing someone, there's a lot going on spiritually as well. So a lot of things come out uh, during the session, emotions, memories. Um, it's a very intense experience. And I remember getting my first tattoo and smelling uh, of a puhi and pua kenny kenny. Even uh, Lomi practitioners sometimes say that as they're applying the Lomi, these uh, this dark black liquid comes out from the pores of people's skin. You know, so many things happen because it's not just a, a physical thing that's going on, but it digs up a lot of spiritual residue. And so that's number 55 as we wait for Lane Wilkin to join us. We're a little bit early. So number 56.
I worked at a place called Classic Audio Video from 86 till about 1988-ish. And um, it was in the old uh, Chunhun market. And so it was upstairs and, you know, they rented out regular videos, videos, but their main thing was the old classics. And so the guy who worked with me, I remember his name is Brian, and um, he worked that job. He worked at American Air part-time while going to school. And so he told us an interesting story. He was staying in a house on the Tantalus side of Manoa, sharing it with other students as uh, they tend to do, you know, splitting the rent and everything. And he said one night he'd worked uh, one complete day he had worked all three jobs and so when he finally got home he was just beat and he got home he lay down on the couch and he had his eyes closed like this and all of a sudden he felt this in his forehead and he opened his eyes he said on the ceiling right above him are these dots like this and he looks at the dots and then up until the dots there's these little footprints across the ceiling down the wall. But then he realizes that the footprints have actually gone up the wall across the ceiling and then stopped exactly above where he was sleeping. He realized that these dots were toe prints. And so he said, it sort of seemed like something was standing on its tippy toes. And so when I felt that, maybe it was trying to wake me up. But he mentioned it to his roommates after have, having lived there for six months. His roommates, the reply to him was like, oh yeah, we forgot to tell you there's, there's menehune in our house. Then they had to sit him down and give him a, a brief education as to what menehune are, not were. When we refer to things in our culture, um, well, not we, but I, um, I don't refer to them in the past tense. So he didn't realize that the place where he was staying was in alignment with uh, the Cook property where the Menehune Hiel is sitting until today. Interesting. Uh, okay, so we're still kind of early. Um, Number 57. Sorry, I'm looking at the stories. Yeah, probably gonna have to change 57 because it's like I said, it's long, it's detailed. Uh, it's probably one of those stories you're gonna have to read on the blog. So we'll switch it out for something else. So I'm a Freemason if you don't already know. And um, I've been in a craft for a while. And the building where we have our lodge meetings, I'm talking about the old lodge building, not the new one, was known to be haunted. And during the day, uh, I would show up to go over ritual or practices in the downstairs area, the dining room. But upstairs, we could hear noises like uh, people were up there. And we knew that nobody was up there. One Sunday, I was uh, up in the lodge room with a, a brother of mine, a Masonic brother, and helping him, helping him with some of his, his stuff. And as we're sitting in the lodge room, he sort of got lost at one part of what he was supposed to memorize. And there was this silent pause. And he and I together heard this clear as day, this man's voice say, it's time to get out. And so we got out, we left. <clears throat> About 10 years ago, uh, Channel 2 News did an overnight thing with Marissa Yamane at that lodge building and the cameraman, Justin Cano, ended up becoming a Freemason after that. And he's a great guy, Justin, really is. One of the best cameramen we have. Um, <clears throat> but so many, interesting things happened overnight. Uh, we got a lot of solid EVP recordings uh, because we left the digital recorder upstairs in the lodge room when, while we went to explore. So one of the famous stories is that um, the thief broke in to the lodge room upstairs overnight and he was cold, he just needed somewhere warm to sleep. And while he was sleeping, he woke up because uh, he said these men in tuxedos 
wearing funny looking uh, aprons were walking in circles around him and the circle got smaller and smaller and he freaked out and ran out of the lodge room, broke the window, opened it and was yelling for help, somebody help him. And so cops came, uh, they were led into the building, they went upstairs and got this guy and they brought him down through the dining room. The thing you have to understand about the old dining room is on all four walls, front and back, are <clears throat> pictures of all the old masons who are masters of their lodge uh, from <clears throat> as early as uh, 1842 till today. And so as the police were walking this, this homeless guy through that dining room, and he saw all those pictures of all those old masons, he began to freak out pointing at those pictures, saying, those are the guys. Those are the ones who are upstairs trying to crush me, walking in circles around me. Those are the guys. <clears throat> Number 58. Young Chinese guy in the 80s uh, got tired of the club life in Waikiki and wanted something new. So for some reason, he went of all places to the old Union Bar and Hotel Street and won. And if you've been to the old Union Bar, it's quite compact. So really not too much room for, for dancing. If you dance, you got to dance in place. And he went in there and saw this, this beautiful 16 year old um, local Chinese girl, but couldn't help but look at her, even though he probably was 26 already. And so <clears throat> it got hot and he went outside to get some air and the girl came outside and they started talking. And she, uh, she was very alluring and he ended up taking her home and they spent the night. And he said, oh, regrets after, I shouldn't have done this. I'm 10 years older than you, man. He says, listen, I'll, I'll take you home. And she says, well, I can't really go home, you know, because Chinese style, I, I, I dishonored my family. So they disowned me. That's why I was at the union bar, didn't know where to go. She says, can you um, just, just bring me to school? And he says, okay, uh, do you want to go get your books? He said, she says, no, my books are at school. And he then says, okay, so are you going to go in your club clothes? Because maybe you should take a shower because you smell like smoke and liquor. And she took a shower and she came out and she says, well, now I have no clothes. And he says, oh, okay. But she goes into his room, rummages through his drawer and wears one of his shirts and uh, one of his pants and her sandals and gets dropped off at school. So supposedly the school is Roseville. And so he uh, works for his parents and during the day taking care of all, you know, the property management and everything like that. And he lived all the way up in Lilihon, uh, almost close to Pu'unui in this old Chinese style house. And they said, what do, you, what do you mean Chinese style house? He said, you know, with the red porch and the red trimming and, you know, the circle door. And, you know, I didn't live with my parents. And so he completely forgotten about the girl. So he said, when he walked in the house, something felt kind of off. So as he's walking upstairs, like slowly, he sees his bedroom doors open and he sees her standing there in his room, her back facing him. And he claims she's not wearing any clothes. And then this is the part of the story where he pauses for about an hour. And every time I say, are you okay? I'm gonna go. I go to leave, he reaches out and grabs my arm. It makes me sit down. And after an hour, he finally says, so her back is facing me. She's not wearing any clothes. And I know I didn't drink that day. And I don't smoke weed or do drugs. But she took off her skin. 
and what was standing there was was a demon. Never been back to my house since. Sitting there. Yeah. Okay. All right, so Lane is not coming to join us until 8.30. So I get a lot of calls also to do uh, cleansings and blessings. So the short story is uh, when my friend Paul Smith was here, um, he helped me out in this case. Went to go meet, the, meet this guy at a Walmart in Mibilani. And um, I remember telling Paul that I was kind of frustrated with this guy because I kind of figured out what was going on. It just hit me that uh, probably this guy's wife is having an affair or something because he said um, she was possessed and she went to all kinds of healers and nothing worked. So we met him at the Walmart. We went to his house uh, not too far away. Nice house. And he said everything that was in and around the house was made by him. Uh, a garden with all the plants, uh, the house dedicated to the wife. Um, Then he took us to a, a room with shoji doors and tatami mats. And in the room were all uh, these small altars representing different religions and practices and philosophies. So there was Hawaiian stuff, there was Buddhist stuff, uh, Filipino stuff, I think uh, Hindu stuff in the room. And it was a really nice room that he made for me. As we're walking around the room, we also noticed that um, there's this life-size photograph of an Eastern Indian man dressed in a white suit, you know, like the John Travolta kind. And I just happened to ask the guy, I said, well, who's this? And he says, oh, that's my wife's guru. I said, well, what do you mean guru? Oh, she goes to uh, Encino twice a month and, um, you know, for about two weeks, they have a one-on-one -on -one session. And up until that point, he said that his wife was possessed. And so we had to tell him, that the wife is really not possessed by anything spiritual or demonic. She probably became a possession of that man, her guru. And so when he finally opened his eyes and realized what was going on, he broke down crying. He tried to pay us, but we didn't take the money. <clears throat> A lot of times we, we get called for stuff like that. It ends up not really being a haunting, a possession, an attachment. Normally ends up being something very human. And sometimes these people are, are so affected by whatever's going on in their personal life and rather than say that it's a personal problem, it's easier to say that it's, it's a haunting or a possession. A friend of mine told me that uh, when she was in high school in 1977, uh, she and her boyfriend cut out and they went to the beach to go make up. And then she laid the blanket down and, you know, the boyfriend was on top of her and they were doing homework vigorously. And she said she had her hands out like this and one hand was off the towel. It was actually in the sand and the boyfriend was on top of her and he had her hands behind her back like that, both hands. But she said, well, her hands were, were like this uh, in the sand. She turned her hand, hand over as the boyfriend was um, doing whatever he was doing. And she said from out of the sand, she felt a hand go like this and grab hers. And she said when she and the boyfriend looked because she was startled and she sort of yelped, she said the hand slowly sunk back into the sand, just like that. The beach is called Kula Ilai, but everybody knows that it's prayed for sets. Uh, 
I don't know how to end that story except to say, go try them. So that was number 61, <laughs> um, preceded by number 60. <laughs> So, uh, number 62, kind of long. So um, I'll replace it with, with this one. I talk a lot about growing up on Kalkamana Street in Maili, and you've heard those stories. But before we lived in that front house facing the road on Kalkamana, we actually lived in the back house, which eventually, after we moved out to the front house, became uh, occupied by um, a man named Johnny Martin and his son, Johnny Jr. While we were living in that back house, we had an interesting experience. And even after that, I, as a kid, I never understand why we moved into the front house after what we saw. Um, I remember we were all up late, my, my Hanai mom and dad and I sitting on the, uh, the steps and um, somebody else was over, but they're all talking in the front of the garage as they move off the steps. And the adults are talking, but they're looking toward the front house, toward the road. You know how you do that when you're having a conversation. And all of a sudden, we see a woman come out of the front house dressed in a wedding gown. And she's standing there, kind of looking down the road like this, like she's waiting for someone to show up. And then she walks down the stairs, goes up the gravel driveway. She's bare feet. And on the main road, she just looks left and looks right. And then comes back up the stairs in the house and then comes back out again and does the same thing. Except this time when she's looking left, uh, the headlights of the car are coming. We don't hear it coming, but we see the headlights. And when it illuminates her, she walks toward the headlights because now obviously on the other side of the hedge, um, it stopped. We couldn't see the car, but we could see the headlights. And she walks toward the headlights and then passes the hedges. And so Johnny Martin Jr. Uh, who was living somewhere else with his dad at the time happened to be there and he jumped on his bicycle and rode out to the road and the whole time we saw him riding out his bicycle out to the road the headlights were still there but the second he got to the road he screamed bloody murder and he hadn't gone through pu puberty yet so you can imagine that scream and just booked it didn't come back down the driveway but just booked it and back then, boys his age always wore uh, the button open Aloha shirt with uh, the hat with the chicken fight feather on it because all the chicken fighters wore those kinds of hats. And so his father, Johnny Martin Sr., is yelling after him and just runs to chase him going up Kalkum on the street. Later on, we find out from Johnny Martin Jr., like much later on, when he got out to the main road on Kalkamana. There were headlights shining, but there was no car. And that woman, that girl in the wedding gown was not there. He said the headlights were just there, shining, but no vehicle behind it. <clears> the <throat> Oh, I'm sorry, number 63, because we just did number 62. Uh, number 63, a woman tells me that um, they went to go see an Odaisan, and upon seeing the Odaisan, they had to go to the temple. And the case was that someone had stolen her daughter's bike, and she was just furious about it because she spent all that money to buy it, and now it's stolen. And so she said, They did something called Kokurisan. The Odaisan brought out a piece of butcher paper, wrote down all the characters in Japanese, and on the top of the paper, she painted a red torii gate. And instead of using the planchette, they used the, the yen. Everybody puts their finger on the yen, 
And <clears throat> the way you work kokuri san is you don't ask a question the way you ask a Ouija board. Um, you have to say kokuri san, kokuri san, when will I get married? Kind of like that. So the reason they have the red torii gate on the top is that's the only way kokuri san can come through to do what it has to do. And so woman says they're all doing it and the yen with their fingers on it is just gliding across the paper. And finally, the mother says, uh, she asks, Kokuri-san, Kokuri-san, where is my daughter's stolen bike? And apparently, the Japanese characters spell the word outside. So the woman says, she looks at the Odaisan and says, outside, what does that mean? And the Odaisan says, maybe outside, maybe you look outside. So the woman says, she kind of leans back and looks outside and they're in the temple and she says, outside, beyond the grass on the sidewalk is the daughter's stolen bike. They were so shocked and so thrilled that somehow the bike showed up there that they thanked the Odaisan and they left and they went home with the bike. The woman says a short time later, the daughter whose bike was stolen begins to act strangely she begins to take on characteristics of a dog. And so they have to go back to the temple and talk to the Odaisan. And the Odaisan said, you know, I tried to call you, you know, answer the phone. You gave me the wrong number? The mother said, no, I gave you the right number. I'd never received your phone call. She said, you sure? Because every time I call, somebody answer and I hear a dog, dog barking and then they, they, they hang up the phone. And so the case is explained to the Odaisan about what's happening to the daughter. And the Odaisan said, oh yeah, you know, after um, Kokuri-san bring back the daughter's bike, you guys left. We never closed Kokuri-san. You supposed to stay here while I burn the paper. And then you supposed to spend the yen. That way Kokuri-san is gone. But you so rushed to leave, we never close." Maybe that's why it happened. No, she never said if they closed everything out. I was standing in line at the cashier's counter at Macy's and Kahala Mall, not really paying attention. When I walked up to the cashier, she looked at me and she said, oh my God, you're that guy, you're the ghost story guy. I said, oh yeah. And you know, I was sort of in a rush and she said, you know, I'm from Nepal, I'm Nepalese and I'm, I haven't been here long, but man, I've encountered so many spirits. I said, okay. And I gave her my card. I said, just, you know, give me a call, let me know. And she says, you know, um, I think it was last week it was big rush like like today and the line was long and we we're just trying to get people through the line and it's trying to be as courteous as possible you know taking the clothes cashing out so i wasn't really looking and she said through her her sort of peripheral she noticed a woman walk up dressed in red and she said hi how are you ma'am and she went to go take the purchase and noticed there was no purchase and that a woman was standing there and this is in broad daylight dressed in red her hair sort of in the front of her face and the woman's boom, slams the hands on the counter. The girl said she sort of jumped back and the woman looked up and went like this with her hair. When she flicked back her hair, she said that woman had no face. And she said, these two girls working with me, they saw it too. Those two girls on the cashier uh, machine behind them turned around and said, No parable, faceless woman, still hunting Kahalamal. I wonder if she's there now. My Hanai brother Paul lived in a greenest, it was a greenhouse, but it was two tones of green. Uh, the darker green were the trims 
around the windows and the doors. You, you know how that goes. And I used to spend a lot of time over there, you know, with my nephew Shorty. And one night he and I were playing in his room and it was early about seven o'clock. I think we just got done watching Kikaida. And outside his room, we hear a girl's voice going, help, help, help. And so I called my brother Paul and he came in the room and he heard it too. And they ended up taking me home. A couple of days later, my brother Paul um, tells my dad that they got to move out of the house. Because a couple of nights ago, they're just in the house having dinner and they hear someone walking around the house pounding the walls. Boom, boom, boom. My brother Paul looks outside. There's nobody there. Turns on all the lights. Goes outside with a flashlight. Boom, boom, boom on the walls. But there's nobody there. When he goes back in the house, then they hear boom. Like somebody's running around the house full speed, just pounding on the walls. And then the pounding stops. And then on all the screen windows, front, side, back of the house, these giant handprints appear. On all the windows. They just moved out. I remember that. They never bothered to get the house blessed. It wasn't until years later on, um, when I began to do serious research under the tutelage of Glenn Grant, that a collection of stories that were amassed all along Gulick revealed that Gulick Avenue itself is built on a night marcher's trail. The woman who works at the Attorney General's office, I'm sorry, that was 65, this is now 66, says, her routine is to get off of work, uh, drive to Mirilani in time to pick up her daughter from school. That's her routine. And so one day she got off early and decided to go home first to change her clothes, and then go pick up the daughter from school, then maybe go McDonald's or something. When she got there and walked into her house, she said her daughter was already sitting on the counter wearing clothes that didn't belong to her. And that in front of, in front of her on the counter was a plate of cookies, which she was eating like this. <laughs> She said, my daughter's hair was all any kind. And under her eyes were these deep, dark circles. When I touched her on the, the back and said, baby, you okay? <laughs> like that. The phone rings. She answers the phone and turns her back to her daughter and says, hello. The voice on the other side of the phone says, mommy, mommy, you're late. I've been waiting for you. You're late. Hurry up. And in that second, she thought to herself, that's my daughter on the phone and who is this? She turned around to look, whatever that was that was her daughter that was sitting on the chair at the kitchen counter was gone. What had left on the chair was a pile of kukai. On the other side of the chair, walking across the kitchen floor up the wall, the ceiling above her going out the front door were kukai footprints. That's somebody who worked at the Attorney General's office telling me that story. Mirilani Malcolm. The paranormal investigative team from Japan is trying to conduct an investigation at the post office and they're having a really hard time they have a show in Japan that's quite popular and a lot of the equipment they have, they invented themselves. So it's high, high tech, uh, state of the art as far as they're concerned. The second they roll film and they're about to conduct the investigation, uh, investigation uh, the battery, the brand new batteries, the self-made batteries on every single piece of equipment dies, just dies. And so they're taken to uh, Long's, Polly Long's, where they go to get the uh, throwaway Fuji cameras. And then they go back to the post office and try to do the investigation again and the throwaway cameras won't work. The thing won't turn, cell phones die. At that point, two of the younger men on the investigative team from Tokyo, Japan are grabbed around their neck by something they can't see that drags them down the hallway. 
and finally lets them go. Big fingerprint bruise marks around their throats. They found out part of the post office used to be the old gallows. And on the weekends, young Japanese men, bachelors working on the plantation, get their money, go to town, blow it, drinks, female company, get thrown in the can. Come Monday, they go to court, appear in front of the judge, sentence passed, pay the fine, go back to work. But during that time, there was a shortage of uh, court judges. And so they replaced them with military officers. A lot of times young ensigns, straight out of the academy, second lieutenants. The young Japanese bachelor comes from the plantation, spends his money, wine, women, gets into a fight, thrown in a can Monday morning, appeared before the judge, sentenced to hang. Story number 68. This person who lives near the Kipapa Gulch area is currently trying to sell his house, but he can't. He's having a hard time. Once people find out we're interested in buying the property that it's at Kipapa, it's a no-go. He says strange things are happening. Footsteps across the house, Pounding, knocking, the smell of blood, that metallic smell. Sounds of moaning and groaning as if someone is in pain. Growling, the deep growling sound of a dog. And pigs just showing up on his property at odd hours as if something is chasing them. Something's trying to catch them, corral them. It's obvious in the way the pigs are running about but there's nothing there. He asked me, what's wrong with this place? What is it about Keep Up On? What is it indeed? <clears throat> On Richard Street, there's that state art museum. If you've been, it's beautiful, it really is. I had the privilege, the opportunity uh, to tell some ghost stories there last year. And it was a really nice place, nice place and we have yet to go. Back in the late 50s, early 60s, the Masonic Lodge of Freemasons of Prince Hall, who are African-American Masons, especially a lodge called Cosmopolitan, had a hard time finding places to meet. The last place they ended up meeting was at the old Kamo Iliili Church. Another place was at that art museum. I think it was on the second floor, if I'm not mistaken, or the third. I can't go into details, except to say that <clears throat> for many, many years, on certain nights, people driving down Richard Street would see a body come flying out of the second or third story window and it would land with a thud on the ground. And a lot of times, because the fence is so high, they couldn't really see if the body, um, the person who was thrown out was killed or still survived. But they would call the police, the police would come, they wouldn't find anything. And this has been going on for years and years. Always the body coming flying out of the I think the third story window, but no one actually finds it. And then I become a Freemason. My ex-father-in-law was a Freemason too, and he was the master of Cosmopolitan Lodge. And he talked about when they had their secret man meetings at the old uh, current state uh, art museum. And I can't tell you the details of that initiation when you finally achieved uh, the right to be called a Freemason in Prince Hall but it involved being thrown out the third story window. Sometimes 
guys didn't survive the fall. Seventy. We're close. So the Prince Hall Lodge of Freemasons met at the old Komot Ely Ely Church before it became what is now known as the Contessa. But they had a problem. The problem was when they were having their secret man meetings, there was a window that was 10 feet off the ground. And every time they would look at that window, they would see a Hawaiian man peeking in. They said classic Hawaiian features, uh, head full of hair, thick beard, thick eyebrows. And they would always go outside to chase the guy away and the guy was never there. And this went on for a while. And then on the umpteenth night, when they did this, went outside to go find the Hawaiian guy, chase him away. Somebody said, you guys ever notice that there's no foothold, no way to climb up to that, that window that's nine feet off the ground? And everybody agrees and says, yeah. He says, so either this guy is actually nine feet tall or he's figured out a way to climb up there. Well, the church is leveled. Some of the bodies in the old graveyard are taken to Kauaihau Church. And then when they start construction for the Contessa, they start to dig out the area where the swimming pool is now located. One of the workers who was on that project was on my tour and verified the story as being 100% true, that they uncovered some sort of Senate casket. That's what they called it. It was large. When they opened it, they found a skeleton that was about nine feet. And so some of them opted to send the bones to the Bishop Museum for money, but others wanted a kahu to come and bless the bones. The kahu came, the Hawaiian priest, and looked at the bones and says, oh, aole, put him back. He was asked why, and the kahu said, because look, the hair is growing on the skull, the fingernails and the toenails are still growing. This is a powerful kahuna. If you know like nothing happened to you, put him back. So they put him back. Could it be the same man that the secret society of Freemasons were seeing during their secret meetings, peeking in at them from a, from a nine foot window that had no foothold, no handhold, nowhere to climb. Number 71, I get calls all the time from people who ask me one question and that is, can you help me put a curse on someone? What? I always say, well, why do they do that for? And the reasons are always petty and stupid and not worth indulging. One woman called and said, she wanted to put a curse on a new girl that was hired and she'd only been there three months and she already got a promotion. The woman on the phone said, I've been here 20 years, did everything my supervisor said. And this girl only here a little while and she got one promotion. I want to put a curse on her. But why? She never do nothing to you. The woman says on the other side of the phone, you can help me or not? And I said, no, I'm not, I'm sorry. And she hung up. A short time later, I get a call from Okohuna, who says, you get a call from a lady who wanted to curse somebody at work. She worked for the state or something. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, what happened? He said, ah, she didn't call me too. I said, oh, what did you tell her? Because, you know, when she called me, she sounded like she really wanted to put a curse on this, this girl she worked with. He goes, I oh, know. But, you know, getting old and tired, so I figure I scare her so she, you know, she don't like doing I said, well, what did you tell her? I told her, you know what? If you for real, and you like put one curse on this girl, you like curse this girl, you sure? The lady said, yeah, of course. That's why I'm calling, right? So I told her, okay. I like you go back work, make friends with her. Oh, why did I do that for? I just told you like curse her, I hate her. Because you go back work, you go make friends with her, you get close to her. Her guard is down. And that's what you like. I don't understand what you mean. Look, make friends with her. She trusts you. 
she wouldn't relax. So maybe when you're working, she will walk away from the desk or get water, go bathroom or something. Maybe she'll leave her purse. If that happened, go look inside her purse. Go grab her hairbrush and grab some hair. More better yet, go look inside her waste basket. If she can go blow Hanapusu or Makapia Pia, go find them and bring me that. But more so, if she trusts you now, you guys can go back from the same time. You know how you guys, you are here make one on the toilet, the other one over there talking. If you get to that point where she trusts you that much, Jump up and down, like you gotta go bathroom real quick, like you cannot hold them. Chase her out of the bathroom and then lock the door. Or like you go inside the toilet, lift up the lid. If she didn't make Mimi, bring me that. If she didn't make Kukai, Kyo, bring me that too. On the other side of the phone, there's silence and I'm like, so, so what happened? But that's why I'm calling you. She's still outside my door right now. She actually went go get everything. What? Yeah, I peek in outside my curtain. She get the rectangular Tupperware container, um, get wet paper towel and look like get hair on top and all this other kind of stuff. Rah, so can you do me one favor? You can come over here and talk to her real quick. Oh, why you gotta do that? You, you're the kahuna. You, you're the one said that you was gonna help her. Yeah, but you're getting old already. Just just come, fast guy, go talk to her. And so I went. There she was outside the door with all the stuff. And I went up to her, I said, Aloha. And she said, who are you? I said, oh, I'm, I'm the one you called earlier. Oh yeah, one never like helped me. What you like now? And I asked her, I said, so why do you want to curse this girl? Because I told you, working my job 19 years, she get hired three months, she get promotion. Is that the only reason why? Oh, my supervisor, we'll go promote her. But you know, 19 years, I do everything for him. Pick up the kids from school, uh, put gas in his car, uh, dry cleaning for the family, you know, a flower for the wife on an anniversary. 19 years, I do the kind of stuff. Stuff I'm not even supposed to do. Plus the other stuff I got to do. And then he promote her just like that after three months. So I said, why don't you just tell him how you feel? And she said, oh, I don't can. I said, why? She said, because I love him, that's why. Oh. So she cried. I convinced her to dump the stuff. And the kahuna was not in a good state of health to handle something like that. All right. So here we have Lane Wilkin trying to check in. Lane Wilkins is going to be story number 72. Number seven. Turn on the audio. The video. <laughs> hey, we can't see him yet. I hear Filipino being spoken. I'm assuming that's them. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, brother? Good. Good to see you. Man, you are looking like Good positive magic. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. No, thanks for accepting. You know, it's it's really an honor for me, and um, I'm especially happy because now, you know, people get to see you, they get to hear you, and you know, it's just not not through my praises anymore because you're right in front of us. <laughs> but yeah, well, lay it on us, man. Let's hear it. Okay. Well, it was it was really hard to to uh, try and uh, narrow things down to, you know, a particular story. Um, but I can tell uh, either a possession story or I can tell uh, 
basically fighting a ghost story. So Man, they're they're both good actually. Yeah. Um, so I guess we'll go with possession. So possession works. <laughs> possession works. So this was back in January of 2018, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with what I do, I do cultural tattooing uh, from uh, the Filipino tradition. And uh, in our culture, sometimes the tattoos are, are meant as protective devices against malevolent entities. And so this story is about one of those instances. So uh, it was January, 2018. I was invited by uh, the University of San Francisco, San Francisco to come up and speak. And while I was there, I took on a, a couple of appointments uh, to do uh, our, our tattooing for a couple of people. And one of the, the first, the first person that I worked on, it was just like silk. Everything was beautiful, just a beautiful experience uh, working with this woman. And I had a, a brand new stretcher. This is somebody who holds the skin taut for me while I'm working so that the tool can enter and exit the skin cleanly without causing a lot of damage. And uh, this is what one of our tools looks like. Um, I'll pull one out here. It's, you know, it's got some teeth on it. I'm working tonight, so don't mind the dirty tools. Anyway, right. um, so the, the next day I was supposed to work with another woman and I just kept feeling this feeling of foreboding, just something wasn't right, something was wrong. And um, it was so bad that I was considering Maybe I need to cancel this appointment. I don't know why, but it just feels wrong. So I, I thought, well, in the morning, I'll call her and tell her maybe I just don't feel right about this. So the ne that next morning, I woke up, and during my morning prayers and meditation, the message comes through, you need to go tattoo her, Lane, because you can help her. And, you know, I've, I've learned that when that voice speaks, I need to listen and, and follow through. So we, uh, we in this brand new stretcher of mine, we went out uh, to this person's home in the Bay Area. And, and the whole time we were driving down there, me and, and uh, he's now my apprentice, Johnny, my skin's just crawling I'm, and I'm getting nervous, butterflies in the stomach, like what is going on? So we finally, we finally get to their place and we enter the house and it, and it just feels like the air is thick, like, like way too much humidity, but it's not humid. It just feels oppressively heavy in the house. And uh, this woman and her partner, I had worked with them before I had tattooed her before, but there was something off about her. And so I asked her, so where is this, uh, this new uh, batok or tattoo supposed to be? And she said, it's supposed to be right here on my wrist. And um, her partner says, babe, I don't think it's supposed to be there. Remember, you put all your stress and everything here on the inside of your wrist, not on the outside. And the woman started getting irritated. She's like, I don't want it there. It's supposed, I, I don't want it there. I want it on the top of my wrist, not the inside. And they kind of whisper fought a little bit. They argued. And finally her, her partner looks at her with this gaze like, if you don't do this where it's supposed to be, it's a deal breaker. And meanwhile, I'm just there watching all this unfold and and the woman this woman who we're supposed to work on is a very soft-spoken woman very quiet but she got angry and she kind of growled at her partner like fine i'll get it there just like that and so we draw up the design and she's getting very nervous um she asked for this design that, for spiritual protection so we drew the design on there and she's getting nervous and nervous. And then we begin our prayers and she's getting even more nervous and antsy and fidgety and 
and everything. And finally, we start, we, we get ready to do the work. And she's just doing this. And her partner has her arms around her and is kind of holding her, trying to comfort her, settle her down. But this woman is just getting really nervous. And I come close with the tool and she's just getting really nervous. And with the first tap, she starts growling like an animal. Doing weird things like that and would alternate between growling like an animal to laughing maniacally and sobbing. Just <laughs> and my poor stretcher, his eyes are just huge, like, what the crap is going on? And I just look at him like Johnny hold the stretch, hold the stretch. So we're working along, she's growling, she's crying, she's thrashing around. And I pull out one of the tools that we have, which is made out of a stingray bar. Um, the stingray in the Philippines, we call it pagi. And with the, in our tradition, we use the tail and the barb of the stingray to drive out malevolent entities, or specifically vampiric entities. And, um, and I have a tool that's made out of one. It's only got two little points on it, two little teeth. Uh, generally speaking, most people find it very, very um, acceptable. It's, it's easier to endure the pain from that. But I got that out on purpose uh, because I knew that she had something in her. Uh, what we call in, in, uh, in our language, she was nalubanan, she was being ridden by another person or another entity. And so we, uh, I got that, that tool out. Pow. Ah! Pow. Ah! Growling, thrashing around, sobbing. We finally finished the design and she just kind of goes limp. <sighs> and uh, the entity had left. And she was back to her soft-spoken self. Well, we packed up very quickly. I did a quick debrief with the woman and her partner and I said, just bluntly, I said, you know, whatever that was that you were looking for protection from is now gone. But if you don't make changes in your life, it may find another point of entry into your body. And then me and Johnny got the hell out of there. <laughs> and. Uh, and I have not heard from them since. So that's one of the examples that uh, that we've encountered in this work of, you know, basically spiritual warfare. Uh, okay, one second. Next story. <laughs> oh, you want me to tell another one? Uh, the ghost one that you're going to tell. Oh, okay. <laughs> So um, this one was with my other apprentice, Natalia, who is right here. You want to say hi, Natalia? <laughs> um, so what happened was um, we got a call. Um, again, this is in the Bay Area. A lot of this weird stuff sometimes happens in the Bay Area. I, I don't know. Uh, but we were... We were got a call to come and do a protective piece. And this woman I had met before, she uh, was a student at a college I was speaking at. And she approached me afterwards and asked if she could get tattoos. She, she shared with me that she, uh, she comes from um, an interesting line, a uh, genealogical line, I, I should say. But within that family, there's a lot of people who are clairvoyant or they're seers or they're, um, for lack of a better term, they, they use witchcraft. And uh, I said, who was the last one to really practice? She said, oh, it was my, my great, great, great grandmother who was the one who was really practicing. But after that, we've had really bad, uh, unfortunate things happen in our family where uh, people either die young or go to prison or, uh, you know, health problems. We just encounter all this bad stuff. And it's usually um, when after a person gets married. And uh, so I said, well, you know, if you wanted a protective piece, we can, we can do something about that. And so we set up an appointment. 
I flew up to the Bay Area and uh, Natalia and Johnny were with me for this uh, particular Matuk session. Well, the woman came in and we could feel that spirit. And upon, you know, not to drag things out too long, but upon investigation with this woman and interviewing her and just what we could pick up, this was uh, the spirit of a woman that her progenitor had cursed. Uh, they were in a love triangle. She, her progenitor and another woman were in a love triangle with her, her uh, grandfather. And her grandmother having these abilities and practicing cursed her that she would be forgotten and have no posterity. And then the woman uh, committed suicide and drowned herself. Well, that spirit had been haunting that family for generations and causing all kinds of problems and mischief in their life. And so we drew the design on this woman. We, uh, but there was this just oppressive feeling that came over us. And uh, I, asked, I asked Johnny, do we have anything to burn, you know, to smudge with? In the, in the Philippines, we use uh, different types of smudges. Uh, we use guava leaves, we use uh, bark cloth, we use tea leaf uh, for smudging. But we didn't have any of that available, but um, we happen to have a little piece of Palo Santo, which is used in in other traditions for, for clearing uh, negative energy or bad spirits. And so I had Johnny burn it. And he made several circles around us where we were going to work. He, uh, he also um, burned, he burned this piece of Palo Santo down to about this big. And we, we ground that up and I mixed it into the ink. And uh, this woman was, uh, she, she has uh, Latin American descent. She's Latin American descent. And so it would be, a, it was an appropriate ink for her. So we do this, we start, tat, we, we're about to start tattooing and we feel all of us in the room feel somebody clawing at the back of our legs. Like uh, even our host was like, I feel like somebody's grabbing onto my calf. And squeezing like climb all of us were feeling this person climb at the back of our calves and natalia actually had bruises on her calf in the fingerprint marks where this entity had grabbed her calf well we started tattooing kept keeping that smudge burning the whole time um and the entity became desperate Again, this was a, the spirit of a woman who was cursed never to be remembered. And she actually whispered her name into my ear. And I dared not uh, repeat it because I didn't want to have her get attached to me. But um, we finished the tattoo. And again, the air felt lighter. The woman felt brighter. But, uh, and the entity had, had gone. Well, the interesting thing about this story is that, um, a, was it about a month later or so mm -hmm. that she, she, the woman messaged me again. She said, you know what? I went back down, um, I was in Mexico and I spoke to the spirit. This is a woman who has gifts, not necessarily trained with them, but has gifts. And she spoke to the spirit and the spirit told her her name. And she's, she kind of negotiated with the spirit saying, hey, you, uh, you've been cursing our family all these generations. And, and it, I know it's because my grandmother did this to you, but what if I remember you? What if my family remembers you? And instead of hurting us, you watch over us and protect us. And the spirit agreed. And so she called me back up and said, hey, I'd like to set another appointment. I would like to have a new tattoo to honor the soul of this woman. And 
I said, okay, this is uh, kind of unusual, but I agreed to it. And when she came back up, we did a design that, that figuratively represents that woman's name. And when I met with this woman again, I said, you know, she told me her name. Did she? And she says, yeah, she told me the name too. And we were talking. I said, you want to compare notes, basically? Would you like to know what she told me? We both had the same name, except I had the full version of her name. And, uh, and I'm still not going to speak it. Um, that's for her. But uh, we, tat we did a beautiful tattoo to honor this poor woman who was caught in a love triangle and was cursed by a witch. And since then, they've had very good experiences in their family. Their, their luck has basically turned around. And so, uh, you know, when you get cultural tattoos, they're not just pretty. They're not just uh, for the aesthetic or for, you know, to represent where you came from. There's power behind these traditions that we have throughout the islands of the Pacific. And so uh, remember that if you seek this type of work out, that there is a spiritual component to it as well as, a, as, well as the cultural component. And they're one and the same, really. Oh, definitely. No question. That, that was a freaking scary story, man. <laughs> Ooh. I mean, if, I, if we had, maybe we could upload the picture of Natalia's calf later. <laughs> she, took okay. a picture of the, she took a picture of the, the, the bruises, but you know, she's shaking her head because she hadn't shaved her legs when she took that picture. So maybe. No. <laughs> she's so modest. <laughs> well, brother, you know, thank you for, for these uh, stories. Um, I can't wait till we, we see each other again and you serve me sour ava and it just curls my face, man. <laughs> Love you, brother. Love you. Miss you so much. Thank you. Love you, Natalia. And Bye, stay happy with that. Love you. Love you. Good too. night, everybody. All right. Aloha. Aloha. How's that, huh? Ooh. Yeah, so for you, um, you people out there who are watching, you know, uh, friends and fans, um, you want to rediscover or get acquainted with your Filipino heritage or part of um, your cult cultural heritage, um, Lane Wilkin is one of the people I highly recommend. Um, I've seen him spend hours of sessions, not only tattooing, but talking about um, a lot of deeply cultural things. Um, in the Filipino culture. Number 74. <clears throat> so for Lane, that was a 72 and 73, 74. There's a <clears throat> story that's been going around now since um, 70s and the 80s. And it resurfaces every time um, we talk about this particular subject. So. It happens at Aya High School, and I believe it's in the early 80s. <clears throat> um, Uncle Norman, I love you, but please, I'm working here, you know, another time. Love you. Um, and the story goes that uh, an English teacher at Aya High School had taken her own life. And so the principal found out that morning and had the sad duty of going to that English teacher's class to relay the sad news to her students. And I think, I think it was the eye bell. I'm not sure. But principal gets to the class and relays the bad news to the students and the students are like, I don't know what you're talking about. She was just here. Uh, she just came in and she wrote down the plan of the day and they even told the principal what the teacher was wearing. Uh, dark colored moo moo with different uh, colored flowers on it, the small kind, kind of looked like daisies. And he told her, told the principal, she was here. She wrote down the plan of the day and they pointed to the chalkboard. And sure enough, it was her handwriting. And remember in school how they wrote down stuff on the chalkboard and on the top right corner was, you know, the date and the time and all that. That was all on the chalkboard. They told the principal that she just walked out that door like a second before you walked in this door. Number 
number 75. Uh, substitute teacher who was on one of my tours told me that she uh, often did substitute work at the school out in, um, in Ka'ava. And she said one day, they, um, I stand corrected. It's actually King Intermediate. That's right. So she said one day she had to come in and substitute for what she called the class with all the bad kids. I said, oh. And she said, <clears throat> you know, kids weren't as bad as everybody made them out to be. And they had recess, they went to lunch. And after that was over, they were coming back to the class. And the classroom has the, uh, the wooden slats on the windows. And she said, as they were walking through the class in broad daylight, this dark, dark pitch black shadow came out of nowhere. And as she was walking into the class behind the students, because she let the students go in first, she said this dark shadow inserted itself between her and the students, pushed her out of the classroom, slammed all the doors and closed all the slats. And in the classroom, she had blur bloody murder screaming, pounding on the door to get it open. Finally, the custodian comes, you know, everybody else comes because they hear all the screaming and they're pounding on the door and then just click, doors open, slats open. Students said it was pitch black, windows shut, they couldn't open them, doors closed, locked, couldn't open those. But there was something in the room with them that kept running through them and touching them, all on their face, their hair, the back of their neck, just these creepy feelings of someone touching them. And then it stopped. I told ghost stories at King Intermediate recently, and the principal asked me if I would be willing to come back and bless the school. I agreed, but I haven't heard anything since. The old Ghost Hunters bus tour, <clears throat> uh, we always took a break after leaving the Manoa Chinese Cemetery at the McDonald's in Manoa. And that gave everybody a chance to, to go use the bathroom and buy some food, you know, about a 15 minute break. And then we get back, back on the bus and continue the tour. And this went on all the time. That was the, the regular routine. One night, <clears throat> On the tour, I had a man who was a supervisor from McDonald's and uh, he asked, are we going to McDonald's in Manoa? And I said, yeah, it's one of the stops. And every time as we left the Chinese cemetery and we're heading to that McDonald's, I would tell the story that in the early seventies, uh, the story goes that a you know, seven or eight year old boy lived across the canal behind the McDonald's when it first opened. and so. He tried to get across the canal to go get the Big Mac, which was new at the time, and fell in the canal and drowned. And then after that, his ghost haunted that McDonald's, and he appeared in the uh, the, the cupboard, the broom closet upstairs, and a lot of times behind the grill, and just scared the crap out of everybody, and in the women's bathroom at that McDonald's. <clears throat> but he took the story one step further and verified to me that everything I talked about as far as the haunting at that Manoa McDonald's was absolutely true because he was the manager of that store when all of that happened. So he said, that's 100% true, we all witnessed it. He said, but uh, one day they, they ran out of a swing shift uh, manager. So they end up get, ended up getting the one who transferred from the McDonald's in, in Eva Beach. And he said she was a tough someone lady. Everybody was afraid of her, but she did her job well. And there's no question about that. And so he said the day came when uh, they were changing over from the breakfast to the lunch. And as they're changing over, the, uh, the Samoan lady from the Eva Beach McDonald's, now working at the uh, Manoa one, is standing there. Um, she's got all the, the frozen um, patties on the grill and she's getting the burgers ready. And she looks down and there's this little Japanese boy like standing there just looking up at her like, here I am. And instead of screaming bloody murder and running like everybody else does at that McDonald's when they see the ghost of the boy, 
instead of doing that, she looks at the boy and says, hey, what are you doing over here? Let me slap you. Beat it. The boy ran, disappeared. And the supervisor said, now, after that, the boy's ghost doesn't haunt the upstairs. He haunts downstairs in a basement where the crew, crew room is. I said, there's a basement in this McDonald's? He said, yeah. Yeah. And that's where he is. You don't like him upstairs now because he's scared of that, that manager from Eva Beach. We should do a tour of haunted McDonald's franchises. In 1997, on 6 o'clock news, there was an unfortunate story about a bunch of boys who cut out from Kowananakoa Intermediate, and they spent the day at Kapena Falls. A short time when it was, uh, a short time before they realized it was time to go home. One of their friends disappeared. They couldn't find him. He never surfaced. They called the authorities and about three hours later, the body came up, floated to the surface. The news crew was there and interviewed the boys about what happened to their friend. And on the news, the boys said they swam down and at one point they felt his body, they found it. And they all grabbed on to the body of their friend and began to swim it up to the surface. That something yanked it back down. A lot of these stories about bodies disappearing at waterfalls, it's always men. You never hear about it happening to a woman. It's always men. Number 78 is also a lengthy one. So one night on the downtown walking tour, we were passing the Kanaina building and the windows are open and we peer in and we see candlelight and we see men inside that building dressed in dark suits, wearing feathered capes. One of the women on my tour starts to laugh and I asked her what was wrong. She said, I was just here the other night, walking through the grounds of the palace, going to my car, which was parked on punch bowl by the library. And I happened to glance up and saw all those guys in there wearing feathered capes. And I screamed bloody murder. The security guards came out and asked me what was wrong and I said, look right there, don't you see them? The ghosts of all the, all the Hawaiians wearing the capes on the monarchy? Security guard said, no, those aren't ghosts. That's the meaning of the Royal Order of Command Mountain. And so the woman laughed, I thought it was absolutely funny. <clears throat> and then she told me an interesting story. She said, there used to be a kahili in the throne room of the palace that was called the death kahili. Nothing but bad things happened around it, but it always caused death and that it was so bad, they actually had to move it out of the palace. And so I asked her, where is it now? And she said, last I saw with my own eyes, it's at the Bishop Museum. I said, oh, in the kahili room? She says, I don't wanna say it. I don't wanna give the wrong information. But when you see it, you'll know. Funny thing about that story. When my daughter was, I think, about eight or nine years old, and we, she and I went to the Bishop Museum, and the first spot we headed to was the Kahili Room. Two people went in in front of us. And as my daughter and I were going in and the doors opened, she just jumped back. And I said, what's the matter? She says, there's people in there. I said, what kind of people? She said, there's people standing by the Kahili, except for that one. She was pointing toward a black one. She said, the people don't want to stand by that one. 
it makes people die. Of course, there's more detail in history to that story of the death Kahili, but we'll talk about that next time. Number 79, we're getting close. What? You know how much we love our moms. We love them so much. But sometimes moms tells us, they tell us things we don't want to hear. Well, they tell us things we should hear, but sometimes at the most inappropriate moments. And so many years ago, when I first started doing the, the Ghost Hunters Bus Tour, uh, and we stopped at Sandy Beach where we always took a break and you know, Glenn provided uh, drinks and um, snacks, musubi a lot of times. Young man on the tour came up to me and said that he and the woman he was with just recently got married. He said, but something strange happened. And I said, at a wedding? He said, yeah. He said, I'm standing there, you know, waiting to go stand in front of the, you know, the, the guy who's going to marry us and all the ushers. And I'm kind of nervous, you know, I got a lot of my mind. And, you know, my bride is, is waiting to walk down the aisle. And he said, my mom is over there just, just giving me rash. I'm like, what do you mean? She's asking questions like, okay, so has everything been arranged for the food? Are the caterers going to show up? I'm like, yes, mom. And um, how about the ushers? Um, are they drunk from last night? Or are they, you know, they're wearing the white, the right tuxedos? Yes, mom, they are. And what about the ring boy? The ring boy get the right ring? You know, you got to make sure he's not going to play with the ring and, you know, and, and lose it. Get the ribbon on, on the pillow. That's what it's there for. You better tie it around the ring. It's done, mom. It's already taken care of. Okay, and then what about the flower girl? Does she know to throw the flowers every few feet and it's just not just dump it all over the place? Yes, mom. We had wedding rehearsals like three times already. Everybody knows what they're going to do. Okay. And what about what about the in-laws? You know, the in-laws say they like you, but, you know, things always change at the last minute. Are you sure everything's okay with the in-laws? And at that time, I, I got irritated with my mom. I said, mom, yes, everything's fine. Mom, I'm trying to concentrate. I'm getting married. You're just freaking me out. It's irritating. My mom looked at me and she says, don't you dare talk to me like that. After everything I've done for you, raise you by myself, put you through school, private school, by myself, on my own, all the money I have to save, broken knees, cracked your head, Who's there for you all the time? Me. Just trying to make sure that everything's correct and okay on the day of your wedding. So don't you give me a hard time. You understand? Yes, mom. I understand. And right at that point, I get this text message from, from her. And the text message says, is everything okay? And I said, yeah, everything's okay. And she texts me back. She says, you seem like you're stressed out. Like, are you talking to yourself? I text her back. Uh, no, I'm okay. And so his new bride says, so I am standing far away, you know, waiting to walk down the aisle to go stand by side and, you know, get married. But I see him standing kind of like behind the kahu and he looks like he's arguing with somebody. And when the kahu moves, nobody's over there, but he's definitely having an argument with somebody, but nobody was there. Wow. Yeah, he said, my mom passed away like right after I graduated high school. And I see her ghost all the time, like all the time, but it's always the same thing questions, just questions. But after that day, before I got married, um, after that, I don't see her anymore. 
think she's not worried anymore. I think so. Eighty. 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 We started at four. It's nine oh seven. We're at eighty. <clears throat> Remember when those uh, buildings started coming up around Kapako and they were advertised as being affordable? The question has always been, you know, affordable for who? Interesting thing that happened in one of those buildings. Um, a Hawaiian family was lucky enough to get a unit unit in that building. Mother, father, son, who graduated high school and, you know, had no real desire to go to college right away, so just wanted to work. And he worked at one of those furniture stores on the ward, and everything was fine. And then one morning, when he comes down, he's sort of lethargic, and he doesn't seem like himself. His parents ask him, what's, what's wrong? And he says, oh, I'm just tired. I haven't been able to sleep. And they said, why, what's going on? He says, I'm just having these dreams and I can't remember. And every morning it's the same thing. Lethargic, tired, dreams he can't recall. But as every morning wears on, he starts to develop these pussy sores all over his body. His parents are worried. Because now he doesn't seem like himself. And they call a priest who comes to the house and has a talk with the family sees if the family relationship is fine, and it is. Any problems with uh, the couple, the mother and father? No, they're fine, they're in love, no problems. And so he asks if the parents would mind taking a walk so he can talk one-on-one -on -one with the son. When they leave, he asks the young man, is everything okay? He goes, yeah. So I hear you've been having nightmares you can't remember. He goes, oh no, I remember the nightmares, I just, I don't want to worry my parents. The priest asks, what kind of nightmares are there? Um, it's the people, a lot of people. People from different walks of life, different classes, mostly children. They're always in my room. They fill up my whole room and they're not happy. They all have these pussy sores all over their body these people. The priest asks the young man, do you think you have an idea of who these people are? And the young man says, yeah, I know who they are. Can you tell me? The young man says, they're the people buried under this building. If you know Kapa'ako, there's a lot of small pond burials. It could be one of them. The young man who lived off of Day Street said, the apartment he lived in was quaint. A little bit old, worn, but it was comfortable. He said when he first moved in, he had no problem. But then after a month, along the side of his bed, on the linoleum floor, he would hear scratching sounds. Not from beneath the floor, but on top of it. Like a sharp nail was gouging across the floor, moving. The ambient light shone in through the windows enough so that he could see the linoleum floor and also see that there was nothing there. He jumped out of bed, turn on the lights, nothing. But always the sound of something sharp going across the linoleum floor. <laughs> Yeah. 
He told his friends about it, who told him to go call a priest. But somehow, while online looking for a priest, he came across a psychic who he contacted, who came to his house to rid him of the spirit that's haunting the place. The guy thought it was cool, so he invited his friends. And psychic said, the more the merrier. She bought a Ouija board. He placed it on the floor and began to work at Blanchett. When the psychic asked who is haunting this house, Planchette only spelled out five letters, S-E-P-O-R, again and again and again. Who are you? S-E-P-O-R. And then they began to hear it. across the linoleum floor. Everybody panicked. Someone in the group began to notice the letters S E P O R. Made everybody come back to the Ouija board, put their hands or their fingers on the planchette. And that person asked, friend of the guy who lived in that apartment, how did you die in this space? S E P O R ropes. They find out later the previous tenant was a hermit. Locked himself in the apartment, paid all the bills, of course, the rents, but just a hoarder. Never went out. Never cut his nails or his toenails. But for some reason hung himself in that apartment. And so as the buddy slowly swung back and forth, the uncut toenails drag across the wooden limb floor. <sighs> The girl at the Catholic school, uh, which I won't name, but they wear uh, Sailor Moon uniforms, was being bullied by her classmates and constantly told that she was not good enough. Not good enough at athletics, uh, didn't uh, dry clean her uniform good enough, didn't drive good enough, eat good enough, hair, clothes, looks, nothing good enough. Just harassed at school and bullied online, text messages, relentless. And she committed suicide, slit her wrists open. So the bathroom at the mall in the um, YL, IA, Pearl City area, the mirrors were taken down. It's the mall that has the theaters in the food court. The mirrors were taken down because when people would go to use the bathroom, the third stall, the door would creak open. And behind them in the mirror, they would see a girl in a Catholic school girl, girl uniform, pale, dark circles under her eyes, her hair matted. And she would walk up behind them and hold out her wrists, dried blood on her forearms, asking again and again, am I good enough? Am I good enough? Am I good enough? Another twist to the makeout story on the beach from a different couple is at Nanawe Beach. So Nanawe Beach is right across from the cave. 
walk out of the cave across the street uh, through the dirt parking lot down to Sandy Hill. And it's this private area and it's beautiful. And that's called Nanoe. So another couple tells me that they're feeling a bit feisty and uh, it's broad daylight. Place is empty, hardly anyone there. They walk on down to the sands of Nanoe Beach and they start applying the leather. <laughs> Boy says he's on top of his girlfriend and it's getting intense. And so they take a moment to uh, relieve themselves of their clothing. And now he's back on top of her and she feels his hands on the small of his back, moving down to his uh, gluteus maximus, down to the back of his thighs. And he's really into it. And then all of a sudden, he feels his cheeks spread open and feels something insert itself down there. And he get, sort of goes up like this and looks at her and sees that her hands are not anywhere near his gluteus maximus. It's actually like this, both sides of her on the sand. When he turns around and looks like this, it's a skeletal hand that came out of the sand. shouldn't do those kinds of things where the dead are buried. <laughs> the old ghost hunters bus tour, we went up to Kionoli, Kionoli Road and told the famous story about the tree that was infested with the spirits of the restless dead. And if you wrapped your arms around the tree and looked up into its branches and saw the dark shadowy human figures with the red glowing eyes, and if they saw you, you'd be stuck to the tree. You couldn't let go. We also talked about the unfortunate death of Don Didi Bustamante. Who lost her life, I think, in 1975, around March or April in that area. I won't go into the details uh, out of respect for, for the family. But I knew what she looked like. I saw the pictures. The triangular, triangular rectangular shaped glasses, uh, what I call the Glenis O'Connor hair, just that classic look. And um, I would end the tour up at Keonoli Road with that story, and then we'd leave. And several times people would come up to me after the tour and claim to have seen her ghost standing by the tree or just behind the group. And, you know, it was what it was. People claim to see what they see and who am I to question them? But the descriptions were always the same, never wild or, you know, just overly dramatic, just that they saw her standing behind the group. And I think this was possibly the last time I did the tour up there. Uh, Another ghost tour showed up and started going to the places that I, I go to, and mainly because they read my book, Legend of Morgan's Corner. And so I stopped going because um, it's too much different energies up there that just makes things worse. And so on that last tour, when we were talking about Don Bustamante and we all said a prayer and we left. I always stop as we're walking back down to the bus to make sure that everybody's with us. And so I kind of flash my light back to the tree and there's really no one there, but as I sh flash the light on the tree trunk and I pull the light away this way, uh, away like this, I catch a glimpse of someone standing just to the side of the tree, just a glimpse. And I turn the light back and it's this, Local looking Hapa Holy girl, rectangular shaped glasses, the reddish brown hair, and the shawl looks like it's made from crochet. And she's sort of looking at me, but not really looking. And in my mind, I said, Thank you. 
I don't know if I'll ever be back, but I won't forget you. And I'll talk about you as much as I can. Roland Kotani was at the end of his marriage. He and his wife were separated and they had a daughter. And the story goes that they uh, agreed to be together on a Sunday at the house in Pearl City, sitting in the backyard together, watching the daughter play. And according to the account, the wife became just overwhelmed with this feeling of maybe they'll get back together and walked up behind Roland and put her arms around him and he pushed her away and said, don't do that. Without going into detail, Roland Kotani was found murdered in his house, his head bashed in, blood splatters all over the wall. His wife confessed. <laughs> then she took her life. In the uh, old police station on Veritania, that's about as far as I'll go with that story, because I want to be respectful. So if you know where the old Baratania police station used to be, you know there's a couple of condominiums that sit there now. Some people who've been on my tour who live in that building, uh, especially I think the guy said he was the building manager or the maintenance guy. He said there's always all kinds of stories from different people hearing gunshot, a single gunshot. <laughs> Sometimes they hear it more than once and they go and investigate because maybe, oh my God, somebody got shot. It's a pretty rough area sometimes. But maintenance guy says he did some research himself and kind of realized that the sound was coming from the basement where his building is. So he asked me about it and I told him. As much as possible, he tries not to go down to the basement anymore. And people still tell stories about hearing that muffled gunshot. But it seems to reverberate every time they hear it. Sometimes even traumatic events make an impression on the environment. And it's residual impression tends to play itself back like an old film, whether we are there to witness it or not. <laughs> 87. I always talk about the story of Miles Fukunaga, and he was a 19 year old man who murdered Gil Jameson, kidnapped him from Punahou schools. And his headstone is in the Mo'ilili Cemetery and that story was passed down to me from, uh, from Glenn Grant, learning it from his tours. And then a couple of years back, I was given official permission by Glenn, um, Dr. Dennis Ogawa, Glenn's lifelong friend and uh, colleague, to officially tell me that, yes, I've given you permission to tell the Miles Fukunaga story. And um, Glenn was, you know, the ghostwriter on that story. And... That was a story that Glenn told on, on the Mo'ilili walkie tour when he did it and in much more greater detail. <clears throat> I'm thinking about doing that too. And so on one of the many nights that I, I told that story a few years back, um, dropped people off, tour was over, went home to my old apartment on Lano Street. I remember taking a shower and watching some TV and falling asleep in the living room on my stomach. And exactly three o'clock in the morning, because I saw it on my digital clock, I woke up in the living room and looked down my hallway and my bedroom light was on. And at that point, I didn't sleep in the bedroom anymore. So I could see the light shining into the hallway from the bedroom, but standing at the end of the hallway outside my bedroom was the ghost of Miles Fukunaga. And he was about five feet four, five feet three, slightly built, slick back hair, um, Button down, long sleeve shirt, sort of curled up around the elbows, skinny black tie, black slacks. He was standing there. And I didn't freak out. I didn't lose it. 
he just walked into my bedroom. So I got up, walked down the hallway and walked into my bedroom. And Miles was not there, but my ironing board was out and the iron was still on it. And it was still on, plugged in. And the underneath of the iron was orange, hot. I'd left the windows open. So the, the wind was blowing the curtains dangerously close to the iron. So I turned off the iron, folded up the board, and I thought to myself, all right, um, thanks. I owe you one, I guess. And then my apartment suddenly is inundated with the smell of burning candles and it won't go away. And without even thinking about why I was doing it and where I was going, I grabbed my keys, um, got dressed, shoes, pants, shirt, got to my car, drove to the Mo'ili'ili Cemetery, went down the lane where Miles Fukunaga, you know, where his headstone is. And gathered around his headstone are what I can only describe as UH hippie types of all different shades and colors. And they were gathered around his headstone and they had piles of candles on the headstone and on the ground. As I got closer, I realized and I saw they were working a Ouija board trying to summon the ghost of Miles Fukunaga. And you guys know me, I'm, you guys always tease me about being a, a big teddy bear and soft hearted. But right at that moment, you would not have wanted to be around. I did not swear, I did not yell, but I chased them the hell out of there got rid of all those candles, cracked the Ouija board in half. I remember somebody grabbing my hand. I remember pushing them down. And I dumped everything in a garbage can that was uh, sort of across the lane from where Miles is. And I chased these people off. And they ran, they went running. And I looked at Miles's headstone and I said to him, now we're even. I left. One day, I don't know when, but I'm gonna recruit a bunch of you to hang out with me at Miles's headstone. There's an urban legend attached to it. No one knows who's leaving things there. No one's ever found out who or why. Not since the time of my late mentor and boss, Glenn Grant, and not since my time. Maybe. <laughs> Ever want to curse somebody really bad? I mean, from the deepest, darkest hate of your hot heart, did you ever really want to cast a curse on them just to erase their existence from the earthly plane? And if you're saying no, you're a liar because you have, you have, you've thought about it, especially when somebody cuts you off on the freeway or somebody cuts you off in line at the grocery store or wherever, you have. In Japan, there's a thing where if you wanted to do this, you go to the oldest temple you can find and you go to the oldest tree on the grounds of that temple. And you're supposed to be dressed completely in white, in kimono for Japan, or uh, I forget what they call it now, but you know what I mean. You're supposed to take a piece of wood, a hammer and some spikes or, you know, a nail and you find the oldest tree on the grounds of that old temple. And you have something called, can you, oh no, that's okay. We've already talked about it. The Wadaningil and you pound it into the plaque with the spike and you recite the sutra as you're doing it. And you wear a crown of lit candles. And so during the hour of the ox, between 12 and four as you're doing this, it's gotta be done for 40 nights. The bad thing about that is if you see someone walking by, you have to go chase them down and kill them. 
Otherwise, the curse doesn't work. <clears throat> and you've heard me say before that this, this thing is uh, sort of still being done in certain circles because there's still some hateful people out there. Curses are real. Human emotions are absolutely real. There's a story about a man who went to a, not a florist shop, but a place where they have coin plants on the windward side. And he's a good looking man. You know, um, one of those Hapa, Hapa Hawaii that, you know, full on Hawaiian speaks the language, but has blonde hair and blue eyes, but you can tell he's Hawaiian. And so he went to this place on the windward side and saw a beautiful potted uh, tiare plant and all, already had tiare blooming. And he went to go grab it. And at the same time, two beautiful blonde ladies grab it. And they're like, oh, oh, are you going to grab it? No, you take it. Oh, no, you take it. So finally, the Hawaiian man says, look, I see you two ladies you wanted. So, you know, you have it. And he gave it to them. And the two Hawaiian ladies went to go pay for it and found out that the Hawaiian men already paid for the Chiari plants. And so they went to their car and he was waiting outside. He says, you know, I don't want to be too forward, but why don't you guys um, let me take you to lunch? And so they went to lunch at Haleiwa Joe's and lunch became dinner. And then they had drinks. And finally, he went back with these two ladies to their house in Haula and ended up spending the weekend with the both of them. Turns out they're sisters, but <laughs> willing enough to share uh, one Hawaiian man between them. Something strange starts to happen a short time later. The two Hawaiian, uh, the two Hawaii ladies, the sisters, wake up one morning and there's these huge bruised bite marks all over their arms. And when they're trying to, to show it to each other and all freaking out and one takes off the shirt, it's all over the, the chest. And they go to the bathroom and take off their clothes and there's human bruise and bite marks all over their body, inside the thigh, all over. They're all freaked out. They go to see a, a kuhuna. But when they show up to see him and show him all of the nahu, the bites, he says, oh, I think I know what happened. So tell me again, what happened? I just want to hear it from, from you guys' mouth. They say they met a beautifully handsome Hawaiian man. Siri came on by herself and uh, described him as being blonde hair, blue eyed, but definitely having Hawaiian features and that they'd spent the weekend together. And you know, lea, lea, po, 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 po. okay. And then Monday morning, you guys woke up with all these bite marks. We don't understand. They thought the man had a disease or something and passed it on to them. Kahuna says, it's not a disease. You guys go home, don't worry. You never do nothing wrong. But I'll help you get rid of it. He made a call and the Hawaiian man who spent the weekend with those women answered the phone. And he said to the Hawaiian man, uh, where you was this weekend, why? I just met two ladies who said, you know, they got to know you over the weekend. Oh, why? What happened? What happened? Wow, they get Nahu bites all over their body now. Oh, oh, sorry to hear that. Sorry to hear that. You want to tell me uh, why they get Nahu bites? Oh, I don't know. Of course you know. And I know you know. Put your wife on the phone. The wife gets on the phone and says, I had it with him. I just had it. I couldn't throw him out of the house, divorce already. So I understand you're mad, but were you mad enough to curse these two holly ladies? No, not their fault. It's his fault, the idiot. So I couldn't file for divorce. 
come to find out it was the daughter who did it. She'd had enough of her father's ways and hated what it was doing to her mother. And so she put the curse of the Nahubites on those two holy ladies. Number 89, number 89. I remember hearing stories about women who were having a hard time bearing children, having dreams about the sun descending down from the sky and touching their stomach. A short time later, they would be with a child. Or sometimes not being able to have a child, having a dream about eating a certain type of fruit, sometimes ulu. And the next thing you know, they're hapai. One woman had a dream that for every night while she slept, a Hawaiian man would walk out of the dark ocean, his eyes bloodshot red, sea salt crusted, wearing a red mala, long white hair, would come up out of the ocean, walk up the sand into the front door of her house, into her bedroom and lay with her the entire night. And then when she would wake up, he'd be gone. A part of that dream. The dream went on for 10 days, same dream every night, same circumstance, same dark Hawaiian man with the red mala, long white hair, red blood sh bloodshot eyes, encrusted salt in it. Suddenly she finds out that she is with child. And when she gives birth, the kahuna, for some reason, have to be there because they know that it's a special child. And they pray and pray and it's, a unique delivery, except that when the child was, is born, it has scales for skin like a fish. It won't take the breast milk, and the kuguna tell the mother it can only be fed, uh, fed by oli, pule. That's the only thing that will quiet the child down, and that's what they do. Round the clock, the kuguna pray, they pule. The mother is weary and becomes curious and pulls out one of the scales from the child's skin. As the blood sleeps, seeps out, the child cries and cries, wailing in pain and won't stop. And the prayers do nothing. The kahuna take the child from the mother, walk down to the beach, put it on the sand. And they watch as it crawls into the ocean and disappears. went to go be with its shark's father. Years later on, when the men in that family would go fishing, sometimes the canoe would tip over or they get washed off the rocks while throwing the net or picking opihi. Whatever things like that would happen, a shark would appear, colored entirely black. And instead of attacking the men and killing them, it would bear them on, their, on its back and swim them back to shore. Family believes that shark is that baby born of a human mother, but sired by an almakwa. It's the story that is now story number 90. <clears throat> we know the story of Nanawe, who was born of Kamuhali, his mother, Kale. And that Kamuhali told Kale when he left that she would have to be careful not to feed the sun meat in case he was part shark. But as it was in ancient days, Kabaka Hiko, when the boy became of age, he had to stay in the Halemua, the men's house, 
And even though Kalia warned her father not to feed the boy meat, he did. And he developed the taste for flesh. One day as Nanawi is swimming at the beach, Kalia is worried because something strange is in the middle of his back and she calls him over and looks and examines the mark and sees it's the mouth of the shark. And she says, away. Nanawi grows up to be strong alert, Eleo. One day he's in front of his hale, digging in his mala. And some children from the nearby village walk by, walk past, and he calls out to them, Ihiana Oko, where are you folks going? And the kids say, Ikai Mako, you're going to the ocean. And now he says, Maka, be careful, lest there be sharks. <laughs> Later that afternoon, the same children are now passing the house of Nanawe, wailing and crying. Nanawe says, oh, wahaia. what happened? What's the matter? The children wail and cry. One of us has been killed by a shark. And Nanawe says, wahaia <laughs> One day, Nanawe is involved in a furious digging contest. At this point in his life, his mother has uh, made him wear like a short shawl or an ahuula to cover the mouth on his back. But as Nanawe is digging, the thing flies up over the back of his head and everybody sees the mouth of a shark. And now they know that this is the Aikanaka that's been killing the people in their village. They sit upon him, they beat him, they tie him to a stake, carry him up into the back of Makua where and Imu is waiting to bake him alive. And he begins to pray and calls for his father, Kamohali, the king of sharks, who sends a mighty tidal wave up into the valley, grabs his son, brings him back into the ocean. And he is never heard from or seen again. But in the late 1800s, early 1900s, people in that area would talk about walking past the cave, seeing the glow of a fire inside it. A wrinkled, bent old man with white hair, holding a stick over the flames, piece of sizzling meat on top of it. He invites the travelers in and has them sit and gives them their fill of the meat and also gives them ava. And as they become ava drunk, he takes on the form of a terrible shark and kills them, but does not eat them, but lays them on that flat slab of rock and lets the body rot until the flesh becomes putrid and delectable. The man is sort of semi lift lifted if you want to take a drive out that way. Ninety-one. <clears throat> we were doing the, uh, the YNI ghost tour. And we had some uh, teachers from uh, what used to be Nanaika Pono Elementary, and now it's the uh, charter school whose Hawaiian name I forget. I apologize. And uh, there was not a lot of reaction from the people because they realized later uh, that they were really scared. So we drove up to the parking lot across the cave and on the tour was Scott Porter and Stephanie Burke. And Stephanie is suddenly overcome with this feeling of dread and that she doesn't want to go in the cave. Absolutely does not. And so she agrees to go and she leaves her backpack on the bus. Something told her not to bring it. And so the feeling was sort of a weird. And there was a thick, thick atmosphere. Couldn't explain it. So we didn't go all the way into the cave, just a little ways in. And I started to talk about the history of the cave, culturally um, and otherwise. I got to the story regarding the girl with the hairbrush, who, when I've taken tours in there and we leave, people tell me, what happened to the girl? What girl? The girl that was in the cave that asked me for the hairbrush, where did she go? 
and they would describe her. And I would say, there's no girl. And so I learned to tell the women on the tour later on that if anybody did ask a very hard brush, not to give it. And then I showed a picture of what might actually be the apparition of the actual girl in the cave who asks women for a hairbrush, a girl that was never actually there. Stephanie lost her cookies because she realized that not only did Scott bring the backpack, but that a hairbrush was in it, hers. Being a psychic, she was afraid that the girl's ghost would either, would either channel itself through her or attach itself and follow her, asking for a hairbrush. Oh, kawaikona o kana well. Mahalo, thank you. So, what, are these you guys who came on the tour? <laughs> Uh, number 92, we're close. I'm going to have a burger after this. <laughs> so this is another urban legend that I find funny. And the circumstances are, are humorous too. So just let me tell you the story. Um, a guy who works at the Y on Richard Street, like right across the street from the, the palace, Paleoli Iolani, tells me that uh, one night <clears throat> he's driving up Alakia and you know, uh, right past the Starbucks, there's that Chinese restaurant. He said there was a 66 Cadillac Coupe de Ville parked there and that it was up on jacks on the back and that uh, old Howley guy in a tuxedo um, was trying to change a tire. And so he went over there and says, oh, can I help you? Do you need help with that? And the old Howley guy tells him, listen, if you can change this tire in 15 minutes, I'll give you a hundred bucks. And the guy says, oh yeah, shoots. So he just makes the 15 minute mark, changes the tire and the guy hands him the hundred bucks. And he says, you know, before I drive off, can I, can, can, can you do me a favor real quick? He says, sure. He says, can you go check the headlights in the front? Um, I'm going to turn it on. I've been having problems. Just tell me if the headlights go on. And so he says, sure. And he walks around the front and sort of, you know, bends down like this and makes his hand like that and headlights go on. And so the old Holly man in the car, is sitting there with his, his wife, who's got this, this big white fur coat. And he says, did the lights go on? He says, yeah, the lights work perfectly. And the Holly guy says, good. Can you take a couple of steps back away from the front? The guy says, okay. And he takes a couple of steps uh, away from the front of the, uh, the Coupe de Ville. And he says, the old Holly man lays on the gas and lurches forward. And next thing you know, the old Holly man with his wife in the car is chasing him with his Cadillac going up all the kale. And then coming back down Richard Street. And the guy says he runs South King to go back up Alakea to lose this guy because that's one way. But the guy takes the right turn on South King against traffic. And so this time he says he cuts through that alley, you know, where that Starbucks is, the subway, the alley between the Y, right, and the old building. Cuts right through there. The arm comes down, the guy in the Cadillac, right through the arm. Comes out on Richard Street. The Cadillac breaks that other arm you know, the thing for the car. And he said, the Cadillac is right on top of it, now going the wrong way in traffic up Richard Street. And he said, it's nearly gonna run him over. And then he just steps right through the Kinau gate and turns around and hears the Cadillac come to a screeching halt. <coughs> and he turns around and starts swearing at the Holy guy, just swearing at him, calling all kinds of names. And the old Holy guy gets out of the car, you know, opens the driver's side door, kind of stands up halfway in, halfway out of the car and says, hey, you're no fun. I'm only trying to have fun. It's just a joke. The guy says, bro, it's not a joke. You're trying to run me over and kill me. He goes, yeah, but it's all in fun. And he says, the next thing he knows, the old Holly man, his eyes glow red. And he has this grin that's evil. And he realizes the guy is the devil. And he asked me why, why the devil couldn't come onto the grounds of the palace. He was coming through the Kino Street gate, that's the wrong way, but still he could have. Why he never come through the gate? 
He had plenty of space for running the over, why he never? Why he coupled. That's all I could think of. And so, if you guys are driving past that Chinese restaurant on Alakia, you see it as 66 Cadillac Coupe de Ville with a flat tire, old Holly Man in tuxedo, changing the flat tire. Keep driving. Ninety-three. The girl's name was Laura, and she was single for a long time because she couldn't find the right guy. She always met the wrong guy. And Laura was Laura was a big bone girl, but beautiful, lovely personality. And she became close to this family because she was the babysitter for their kids and the kids loved her and family loved her too. And they're always trying to hook her up with some guy, but for some reason it just never seemed to work out. And Laura always sat, sat on this one spot on the couch and the kids climbed all over her, you know, while she was babysitting. And they always felt bad for her because they felt like they were always hooking her up with the wrong guy. And Laura says, no, no, it's not your fault. It's just, there's stupid guys out there. Just real stupid guys. One day at work at the mall, very handsome, athletic looking guy comes up to Laura and asks to be shown uh, different types of cologne. And so she shows him and uh, he asks her, well, can you recommend one that's uh, right for my, I don't know, my DNA? And she says, oh, we'll try this one maybe. And he takes a whiff of it, he says, well, that actually kind of matches. And she says, yeah, it actually does match you. And he asked her, well, how, how do you know so much about colognes? And she said, oh, I don't know. It's just, I've been in this department so long. It's like second nature. He said, well, thank you. And he walks away. Lunchtime comes around and the guy shows up and says, hey, I'm the guy from earlier, you know, the colognes. And Laura says, oh yeah, I remember you. He says, listen, I, I don't mean to be forward, but can I take you to lunch? She says, well, I don't know you, really. It's kind of weird. He says, okay, if you want me to leave, just tell me to leave and I'll leave you alone. But I'd really like to take you to lunch. And so she said, well, okay. They go to lunch. The guy is a perfect gentleman. Doesn't take advantage of the situation. Doesn't try anything. And then they start to go to lunch all the time. And pretty soon they've exchanged phone numbers emails. And they start going out on dates. They start spending a lot of time together. The only time they're not together is when Laura has to babysit for that family where she sits on that one spot on the couch and the kids climb all over her. Pretty soon, they're spending the night together, many days together. It's getting serious. In fact, so serious that it one dinner date, in the middle of dinner, the guy gives her a ring and proposes. She doesn't accept right away. And she says, honestly, I'm not sure. A lot of my relationships don't work out. And I don't want this to be just one more disappointment. And he says, fine. If you want me to leave, I'll go. And I won't bother you anymore. And she says, no. And she puts her hand out and says, I'll marry you. And they're engaged. And she's gushing with happiness when she goes to babysit for the family and telling the parents. And they look at the ring and it's a big rock. And she says, I can't believe it. And the parents say, oh, Laura, we're so happy for you. Finally, she says, oh, my God, finally. The kids are happy. And she always brings them candy and gifts and stuff like that. But on that night, it's just more of the extra stuff. A week later, well, Laura is at work at the cologne counter at the store. A woman walks up. It's very tall. Looks like she could be a runway model. Very beautiful. 
and introduces herself to Laura and says, hi, are you Laura? Yes. And the woman says, my name is Marilyn. Hi, Marilyn, can I help you? Yes, you and I have something in common. And Laura says, we do? How's that? He says, and she says, do you know someone named Ronald? Yeah, he's my fiance. And the woman says, he's my husband. What? And the woman says, listen, Laura, I haven't come here to make a scene. I haven't come here to yell and scream. I haven't come to swear at you, call you names, nothing like that. I'm here to tell you that this isn't the first time this has happened. My husband Ronald belongs to a fraternity from college. And even after college, those fraternity guys have still hung out together. After these many years, I've sort of gotten used to it because I realized how useless Ronald is, but how useful this money is. And so I've got him by the balls, but he always plays nice and comes back to the fold. Laura says, I am sorry, I don't follow you. The fraternity that Ronald belongs to always has this, this running bet that they make with each other. Who could date a girl who's overweight that no one would possibly date? And how far could they take it? Well, you'd be glad or not to know that Ronald won. He's the one who took, his, took it the farthest because now you're engaged. Laura looks down and then looks at the woman, Marilyn, and says, if that's true, then I don't understand. I mean, look at you, you're so beautiful. Why, why would he bother with someone like me? Marilyn says, because it's all ego, male bravado, stupidity. Who's got the biggest one? <coughs> oh. I'm sorry, Laura says. Oh, don't be sorry. She takes the ring off. And slides it across the counter. This must be your ring. Yep, that's the one. Puts it back in her purse, Marilyn does. Laura stands there just devastated, head down. And the woman, Marilyn, walks away and then turns around and walks back and says to Laura, oh, I forgot to ask you. And Laura cuts her off and says, don't worry. I already checked. I'm not pregnant. Whew. Thank goodness that would have been a first. Well, you have a good day. She leaves. A few nights later, the parents get the news, but they don't know how to tell the kids because that's the night when war is supposed to babysit. With tears in their eyes, the parents walk downstairs to the living room to let their kids know about Laura, who took her own life. But as they're walking down the stairs, they hear laughing and giggling. The kids are piled on something in the corner of the couch, but there's nothing there. But on the couch seat itself is an indentation as if someone were sitting there. Even after all these years, the parents say, they can't help but always think of Laura.
95. We're almost there. The father, unfortunately, had to listen to the ramblings of his daughter, who told him that you are the most despicable person that ever existed. I can't believe that I'm from your genes, your DNA. I'm glad that mom is dead. I really am. She, she wouldn't have known how to handle this. The father says, oh, those are such cruel words coming from the daughter. I can't believe what you're saying. Those words really hurt, but I can tell you're not thinking. So I'm not gonna get mad. The daughter says, you don't have to get mad. You don't have to do anything. <clears throat> Personally, I don't care what you think or what you feel, but you're gonna pay for everything you've done. The daughter walks <clears throat> to the front of the garage and presses the button. And it's one of those garages where the door slides forward like this. And as the door begins to close like this to the front of the garage, the father is bound by ropes, hands tied behind his back, the main rope up here tied to the garage as it, the door closes and slowly it brings him to dangle in the air. And he looks at his daughter and says, I don't understand what this is all about. What's with the ropes? Why are you tying me up? What's, what's all these accusations? She said, they're not accusations. They're facts. They're things that I found out about you and things I've discovered in this house, all the research I've done. Um, <clears throat> all right, but the way these ropes are tied, it's, uh, it's kind of weird. Yes, it's a Japanese method of binding. I did it. I researched it, so you couldn't escape. Okay, but but what what is this? Well, what is this all about? The daughter disappears from the garage, goes into the main part of the house, comes back out. The big fold-out table spreads out a dark cloth with blood candles on top of it, a satanic Bible in front of the father. And she begins to do the incantations and by themselves, one by one, the candles light up one by one. The wind now filters through the garage that's closed tight. Flames rise higher and higher. The incantations are given in a more powerful voice. And then there's silence. It's the kind of silence where you make a noise, the noise, the sound just drops off the second it leaves your mouth. The garage door opens and people filter into it. And they all gather just in front of the satanic altar, all looking up at the father who's dangling from the top of the garage door, bound. As he's looking at them, he sees there's a little boy in front of him. The daughter walks in and says, recognize them? Uh, yeah, that little boy. Hey, aren't you Sean Grism? You're Sean, right? The boy looks up and says, yeah, I'm Sean. You, uh, you're the paper boy. Yeah, the paper boy. Oh, I remember you. When you would deliver the paper, you'd throw it at my front door and hit the glass. Man, it just irritated the hell out of me. That's right. In fact, one day you were so irritated that when I was riding away on my bicycle, you had one of those hard pigskin leather footballs and you threw it at the back of my head so hard, it broke my neck, like it decapitated me. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember that. And then I, um, I buried you under the house. Mm. Another woman steps forward. The father looks at the woman and says, Mrs. Danby, the busybody, always looking out of your windows, trying to see what was going on in the house. Oh, man, I'm sorry I have to burn your house down with you in it, but you understand. No, the woman said, I don't. 
the old Chinese man standing at the back of the group. Oh, hey, I know you. You're, um, oh, you're, um, Mr. Wu? Yeah, yeah. Um, why did I kill you? You didn't like the cigars I smoked. They said the cigars were good for my health, but you didn't like the smell. I found this on the web. Is Siri working by herself again? We're getting close. Because it bothered your nose. That's right, that's right. When I came and yelled at you to put those freaking cigarettes out, you did it. Um, I think I took everything that was in that bag and stuffed it down your throat until you died, right? You choked? Yeah. Yeah. Man, I'm sorry I had to bury you under my house. That's the way things go. The ghosts of the people the father killed disappear. The daughter walks to the garage door, shakes it, makes sure that the binding is tight, and goes to the door that leads into the house, disappears, and then comes back. Following her are a bunch of other people. Oh, who are these people? Are they ghosts too? No, dad, the daughter says. These are the family members of all these people that you killed. I told them about you. And I told them that they would, they would each have an opportunity to exact their revenge. As the father looked at the people, he suddenly notices that they're pulling out guns, knives, baseball bats, pitchforks, kitchen appliances, cheese graters. I'm sorry, Dad, the daughter says, but I can't have the sins of the father visited upon me because I'm nothing like you. A man says that he lives in that private community, that gated community called Ilanavai. And one very, very late night, he was driving up the old uh, Poly Drive. And he said, just as he was getting to Ilanavai, right on the side of the road, because if you've been up there, there's nowhere to walk on the side of the road. He almost ran over this lady. And he said, believe it or not, it was not an old Hawaiian woman. It was an old Haole lady. And she was dressed in these, these pants and these funny looking shoes and this floral long sleeve shirt and had her hair curled tight and this, this fishnet thing that they wear at McDonald's on over it and just walking like this. And I didn't see her until the last minute and I almost ran her over. And so I got out of my car and I said, what the hell are you doing? You're gonna get hit. Don't walk on the side of the road. You don't even have a flashlight. The old woman apologized profusely and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, well." Where are you going? Do you need a ride? And she says, no way. I just live up this way. I'll be fine. He says, listen, let me, let me give you a ride. It's, it's dark. If an, another car comes up here, they're just going to run you over. And so the woman agrees and says, okay. Turns out she lives in that little cul-de-sac, the old Morgan estate. And he drives in, takes the cul-de-sac, turns around like this. And she says, okay, this is fine. And he says, all right. He says, listen, let me let you out. And he comes around the front of the car and opens the door and the woman is gone. She's not in the car. As he looks around the property like this, more toward the top where the grass is, she's standing over there. And she waves like this and says, remember, it was supposed to be you, but it's not. Right at that point, the man says he hears a terrific crash. He runs down the road, that sharp hairpin turn where the slow down light is, right at Ilanavai. 
a head-on crash. Two cars. I was supposed to be in, had it not been for that woman, whoever she was. Intermediate school, got an English teacher. Her name was Mrs. Chun, Patricia Chun, or Miss, I forget which one. The kids gave her a hard time, but she always waffled on about being foreign as Chinatown and how beautiful she was. And she was a pageant girl. And oftentimes she would bring those pageant pictures to, to the class to show everybody that she was not lying. And she was, she was, she was beautiful and she was a Miss Chinatown and other Miss somethings. And so she lived the pageant life back in the day. But she was long past the age of retirement. She'd been around too long. And she always had that hangdog look like just life had gotten her down, never seemed happy. I ever heard it one day when I was in the health room. Um, I was having problems breathing. And it was taking a while for the health nurse to come to the room because she was in the next room talking to Miss Chun. And Miss Chun had a particular way of talking that you, you could not mistake that it was not her. But as I was listening, she was talking about back in the day when she first became a pageant girl. Her family was poor. The father was out of work. And so the parents made her enter the pageants for scholarships, for money, recognition, social status. And she was at a dance at McKinley High School. And she said this boy in school, this Japanese boy, she called him rugged, but he was so handsome, but just rugged, always hung out with the wrong crowd. He met her at the dance and they got together afterwards. He was gonna take her to see the submarine races as they used to say back then. But as they left the school, they started to drive toward Waikiki and she says to the guy, I don't remember there being submarine races over here. And he said, no worry. They ended up at the, uh, the old Palikulani, ended up staying the night in the bungalow. And she said, we cannot stay over here. This is not for folks like us. But the guy said, hey, don't worry, don't worry. I have connections, I know people. So they stay overnight in the bungalow. They have a great night. And I hear Mrs. Chun tell the health nurse that it was her first time. And it was beautiful. When she woke up the next morning, she was deliriously happy, not worried right away as to how she would explain to her parents about her tardiness. And then she said, the guy woke up and told her, okay, sweetie, we gotta go. We gotta get out of here. Well, what you mean? I, I thought we had the bungalow for like the, the whole day or something. Uh, I kind of lied about that. I actually uh, parked cars over here. So I convinced somebody to let me down the bungalow overnight. So we gotta go. And they went and they left. Ms. Chun said, that rugged guy, she had a thing for him, but her parents found out who he was and had him arrested. And she hadn't seen him since. And she said in her old age, she thinks about him all the time, all the time. The short story is, and I found out years later that as Miss Chun was breathing her last, she kept talking to someone like he was right there with her cooing, whispering sweet nothings, giggling and laughing like she was a little girl, a little teenage girl. And as the light was dimming from her eyes and the life was going from her body, the last word she said was, I love you. And everyone in the room swears that they heard a young man's voice saying, 
I love you too. I'll be waiting. As the Hawaii Kai area was becoming uh, urbanized with financially affluent people, one of the last houses in Kulio was a Hawaiian family. And they'd heard about a kahuna who lived in the area. They wasn't sure. They weren't sure what kind of kahuna he was exactly. All they knew about were a kahuna who did bad things, and so they invited him to lunch. And when he came to lunch and sat at the table, the father and the son talked to him while the mother was preparing lunch for them. The father asked him, so we just wanted to find out what kind of kahuna are you? Are you the, the healing kind, you know, the medicine kind, or get the kind that know the stars, or, you know, the, the clouds, the ocean? Oh, what kind of kahuna? The old Hawaiian man said, what kind of kahuna do you think? Did you bring me here to your house to insult? Father said, no, 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 no insult. We just, just want to know what kind. The wife shows up at the table and starts to put the lunch into the plate of each person, the son, the husband, the kahuna. So the husband looks up at his wife and says, "Hon, thanks. He notices that the skin starts to sag down and that the eyes go up like this and blotches appear on the wife's face and clumps of hair start to fall out. Her jaw distends down and begins to drool, blood trickling down from her nose. The husband goes back like this and says, oh my God, hon, what's the matter with you? And then in a snap, the wife is fine. Back to her old son. And the kahuna looks at the, uh, the man and says, now you know what kind. That was 98. This is 99. woman who works for the state said she had something interesting happen. She applied for the job, she got the position, and when she went to uh, the office, she was told that the office number was 106, and that's where she went. And she walked into the office for her first day of work and noticed that everybody sitting in that room were just strange, like no expression. They seemed like they were bearing a heavy burden just sitting at their desks, doing their work, not really looking up at anyone, not making too much noise. And so she got up and she asked someone sitting near her, do you know where the bathroom is? And she said, the person sitting there didn't look up, but just went like this. She walked out to the lobby and found the bathroom, did her business. And when she was coming back, there was the custodian mopping the floor in front of the office door. The woman said, oh, excuse me, after that, go get in the office. He said, what office? Oh, this one behind you, 106. Custodian said, huh? You gotta go in there. Yeah, 106. The custodian said, oh, 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 ay, yeah. He turns around, reaches up to the pound sign and the number 106 and takes the six and turns it over. And says, oh, nobody went fix this thing yet. This is 109. Nobody goes in there. The place is haunted. It ghosts. Huh? I was just in there. There was people in there. You were in there? Really? And he steps back and opens the door. The office is empty. Desks pushed up against the back of the wall. Chairs piled on top of it. But on one lone chair in the middle of that office, that empty office, that haunted office is that woman's purse. 106, that way. This is 109. The 
It's unpunchable in case you're wondering. Last one. Story number 100. We started at four. It's now 1022. Oh my God. So if you've all got your candles, um, light those candles now as we tell the last story. by the last light of the candle. Try, see what happens. Sometimes I come across very bizarre stories that I can't believe when they're told to me. But then I look at the facial expression of the people telling the story and I notice their body language and it's irrefutable. It did happen. The new couple getting to know each other, driving on the freeway past the airport or overcome by passion. They can't keep their hands off each other, but they have to be careful Otherwise, they're going to get into an accident. They go down the ramp to Dillingham. They take the left up to Middle Street. In that Kali neighborhood, the man remembers an empty abandoned house. They find it. Quickly, they park and turn off the lights and no one notices right away. It's an old style Japanese house, shoji doors, the pruned grass now overgrown, the rock garden now nothing but dirt. They find their way into the empty house and quickly their passions overtake them. He pulls his pants down turns her around, pulls down her underwear. He's already taken her from behind and the passion is just overwhelming. But they don't want it to finish early. They're trying to take their time. In the heat of the moment, breathing heavily, perspiring, groping for one another, in the dark corner of the living room, the empty living room, festooned with dirt. They notice an old Japanese woman standing there, dressed in her kimono, smiling. And they can see right through her. Her teeth are blackened. They put their clothes on as quickly as possible. And just before they run out of the house, screaming bloody murder, they hear the old woman say, <laughs> slowly inching her way toward them as they run. When the couple tell me the story, I didn't know whether I should laugh or be afraid. I told them, Mitaidasan means I want to watch.
And there you have it. 100 ghost stories with a few friends who popped in to share their own personal ghost stories. I'm wondering now if I should take a sip of that whiskey, the old Pully Road whiskey, just a sip in honor of my late mentor, Glenn Grant. <clears throat> We're not promoting alcoholism. Um, of course, don't drink and drive. This is old Pully Road whiskey. So bear with me. Um, by the way, oh, can you open this? By the way, did anything happen when you blew out your last candle? Anyone? Uh, let me know. Award for the strongest bladder. You know it, Dee. <laughs> you know it. So if you guys got your flask, uh, whatever, your tea, what's that other thing that people drink? Coconut water. Uh, get ready as uh, we toast to my late mentor, Glenn Grant. Ooh. So bear with me, you guys, and uh, join me in this toast uh, to Glenn Grant. This is the uh, 17th anniversary of his passing. He is the godfather of ghost stories, uh, ghost tours. Uh, none of this would be if it had not been for him. So thanks to um, Spencer Moon, one of the founding members of the Grant Society, along with Brinson Matarang, uh, myself and my wife, Tanya, to Lloyd Arbach, uh, professor of parapsychology, who else am I forgetting? Chris Grant. Oh my God, Chris. Hey man, you got a bottle? Put it up. Let's let's do this. Uh, the nephew of, of Glenn Grant, who's become a, a really good friend, um, and to the Grant family, uh, Julie, uh, Judy, uh, Philip Grant, Kelly, Ellie, and um, uh, the sister. Man, I'm bad. <laughs> Laura, I'm sorry. So anyway, um, yes. And Lane, Lane Wilkin. So let's have one for Glenn Grant. Here we go. <clears throat> yes. So if you're going to have a secret man meeting, uh, the way to end it is with one of these. There we go. Whoa. Ooh. All right. Ah. I think I need a cheeseburger. But listen, uh, thank, thanks you guys for uh, hanging out this long. I appreciate it so much. We really do. And we love you. We love you all so much. Uh, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. We'll see you again uh, Wednesday and then Friday. Uh, the ghost tours are starting up again on, on Monday. And so that's Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday. And it's limited to 10 people. Uh, we still have to do the six foot distance, feet distance and face masks. But um, so it's a soft start, but we're, we're back on it again. Um, listen, if I, I don't respond to all of your comments because there's been so much We've been here since four o'clock. Um, I'll leave you a heart and that will let you know that, that I saw you, I appreciate your comment. And um, I don't know what else to say. I don't think I'm gonna get emotional until this thing is over, but thank you so much. Come here, babe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this wouldn't be possible without my honey. So thank you, I love you, good kiss. All right, cheeseburger, here I come. Leave me and me. Yeah.